take your seats. We are starting in one minute. Please take your seats. Thank you. this off. Good morning, everyone, whoever is here in this very nice auditorium. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to whoever is watching of this summer's program, the Team Project Presentations. So for the ones joining us remotely, here we are hosting and also had their chance to visit many local institutions as part of their departments or as part of their team project sessions. However, this particular phase or component of the program, as we call it, the team project phase, is quite different from all the aspects of the program where our participants are giving, given a topic that they need to explore and then further study from an interdisciplinary and international perspective. For this year's program, the ISU Academic Council has identified four topics to be explored. Two coming from the proposals of the local institutions here in Portugal. They were using these space assets for non-space applications, international cooperation on the use of the Chinese space station, space ocean climate interactions, and microgravity business, space R&D. So what we did at the beginning of the summer, we have divided our cohort into four groups, equal in size, 23 participants each, and also diverse in terms of background, in terms of gender, and in terms of nationalities. We have also made sure that each group has members skilled in graphical design, editorial skills, and presentation skills. So for the first five weeks of their program, each team has studies, studied their topic in detail and come up with a report, which we call the Preliminary Research and Gap Analysis Report, which identifies by the team the aspects that are well covered in the literature, so do not need a necessity to explore further by the team, and more critically, the aspects that the team identified to focus on in their final report. In due course, we have allowed them to interact with many subject matter experts in the domain of their presentations and uh, projects, 
And also, the teams had professional visits, again, to further facilitate their research and analysis. So this brings us to the final four weeks of the program, where then each of the team has started writing their final report and executive summaries of their projects. The final report being a 130-page report, a very detailed one, which has been submitted to the ISU faculty two days ago and currently under assessment. And the executive summary, which indeed you can see in my hand, a 16-page document per team, which basically visually explores and summarizes the findings and recommendations of the teams. So, one thing I would like to mention before we proceed is the team project phase is an unprecedented challenge, but also an amazing learning opportunity for the teams because they are working with such diverse and international teams, which probably they have never worked before in their lives. There comes the language barriers in place. There comes the different cultural norms. There comes the struggles. There comes different levels of experience in terms of management. So, in addition, the teams are also defined, uh, tasked actually to define their internal management structures. This is not something exposed by ISU. So in, as you can imagine, such an environment, it is their also responsibility to keep, keep the team split up and make sure each of the team members is contributing to different sections of their study. So therefore, for us, for ISU, the team project phase is not only about what they deliver at the end of the phase, but it's also about the experience. It's also about the challenges that they face, the interactions happened during the process, and the solutions found by the team itself at the end as an educational exercise. So after such a challenging context, I'm extremely proud that our 92 participants have done a tremendous job and produced four very high quality reports and executive summaries. Let me read the titles because they actually scope down their projects. So we have ORCAS, Oceans, Resources, and Climate Applications from Space. We have Procryos, Protein Crystallization for the benefit of people uh, down to Earth, Bridging the Gap, and Bixia, the International Cooperation on the use of the Chinese space station. So today, the last academic day of the Space Studies Program 2022, we will now leave the stage to each of the team as they walk us through a summary of their analysis, findings, and recommendations. Each of the teams will be given exactly 60 minutes of time to deliver their content, after which we will open the floor to questions by our jury members, some of you uh, who are currently with us in the auditorium and some of them currently joining us remotely. And the assessors will not only assess the content of the presentations, but also look into the presentation skills, how media is integrated into the presentation, and also the response of the team to the questions at the end. So I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you our jury members for today. So if I may start from online, we have Juan de Dalmau, uh, the former president of ISU and ISU faculty member. Juan, welcome. Also joining online, we have Professor Walter Peters, the former president of ISU. Uh, President Emeritus and ISU resident faculty. We will also be joined by Professor Taivu Tejumola, ISU resident faculty responsible for space engineering. We will also be joined by Dr. Su Yin Ten, ISU faculty and professor at the Waterloo University. We will also be joined by Scott Ritter, ISU adjunct faculty, joining us from DLR, the German uh, Space Agency. We also have Ms. Amelie Wilson, who will join us later in the day, the CEO of NanoRacks. 
We have uh, Jorge Pimenta, uh, the innovation director at IPN here in uh, Portugal. And we have Emir Siraj, the CEO of the Atlantic International Research Center, the AIR Center, who is also a proposer of one of our team projects today. And here with us in the auditorium, uh, we have uh, Mario Amaral uh, from the Ministry of Science, Technology and Higher Education of Portugal. We have uh, Andre Oliveira, the CTO of the Plus Atlantic Colab, who is also an ISU alumnus himself. We have Manuel Wilhelm uh, from Portugal Space Agency, responsible for space transport and exploration. And we have Viktor Pankov uh, from one of our sponsors, Space Solution Consultant from Amazon Web Services, Professional Services. Just uh, a few in a few minutes, uh, I also want to acknowledge from now that uh, the ISU president, uh, Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund, will join us. Uh, she is just running late in traffic. Uh, she is not an assessor for today, but uh, I'm sure she will also like to uh, challenge our participants with her, with her questions. In addition to our assessors, we also have some guests here in the auditorium uh, who will be observing the session. We have uh, Mr. Jose Mautino, the Chief Business and Networking Officer at AIR Center. We have Ms. Celesta Santos, and we have Mr. Marcia Marquez, the representative of the Secretary of the State of Sea of Portugal. And in addition, we have our SSP 23 representatives joining us from Brazil to enjoy today's presentations. So finally, before I hand over uh, to the teams, maybe a very last remark on what to expect of our teams and also the jury members. So, the first project on our list today is titled Down to Earth, Bridging the Gap, a project proposed by the local organizing committee of SSB 22 from Portugal and generously sponsored by Amazon Web Services. Mr. Gary Martin, the former vice president of the International Space University, has served as the chair of this project. And he was joined by Ms. Carolina Sa, uh, the Earth Observation Officer at the Portuguese Space Agency, and also Rafael Rutgen, uh, the founder of E2MC Ventures, as the two associate chairs of the project. So I would like to now hand over to Mike to them to briefly tell us their vision of this project and walk us through the journey that their team have gone through before they introduce team down to earth on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the presentations today. I'm Gary Martin and we, along with Carolina and Raphael, we're very happy to be here today. This is an exciting day for us. The team uh, has worked very hard to get to this point. Uh, we had 23 participants from 11 different countries uh, they have um, really put their hearts into it and come up with an, a lot of uh, great information that uh, I hope that all of you take away with you and then maybe even use the report as a source of information in the future. And so uh, with that, I'll have Carolina say something. Thank you, Gary. So I'm Carolina, as you heard. I'm from the Portuguese Space Agency and we were the ones proposing this topic. Space for non-space is quite broad scope, I know. Uh, and uh, coming up with new ideas to bring space closer to non-space sectors is quite, it's not easy. A lot of institutions and agencies have been working on this for a long time and uh, it's uh, still a long road to go. Um, and that's why we wanted to bring this topic to the table. Um, and um, really we believe that um, the space sector can only grow if we get closer to the non-space sectors. So bring it to a municipality worker, bring it to a scientist, bring it to all of us. So down to earth as you did, you did a great job. Thank you very much for your work and good luck with the presentation. Yeah, hi, and I'm Rafael, or according to my team, I'm Anna this morning, so <laughs> thank, you. thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, Cairo has said it all. I think this is a very important project. In my day job as a space venture capitalist, I really see the potential of space applications for non-space sectors. 
However, there's, there's a gap, right? Because people in space don't really know all of the non-space use cases, and people in non-space sectors don't know all of the things that space can do. So we need to bridge the gap, and I think this team has done a really good job in, in bridging the gap and making materials available that, as Gary said, may be of use later on after the project. So without further ado, team, stage is yours. Let's do this. Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you all to the 22nd Annual Municipal Conference um, in this short and to the point nine-week program. Uh, we will be looking at uh, ways to run your municipality and hopefully, in our particular case, ways that you can incorporate space as a part of uh, running your cities or towns. Uh, my name is Jan Janssen. I will be your host for today and um, I am uh, accompanied by my amazing team who have helped me out over the last nine weeks to get this done and I would like to thank them very much for all being here. Um, today's topic, as Raphael already mentioned, and I don't think I could have worded it any better, will be connecting the puzzle pieces, bridging the gap, which means we are going to be looking at the upstream space sector and how we can connect it with the downstream users. In order to do this, uh, today's panel will be hosted by Jaina Carter, who is an uh, expert in doing exactly this. She has co-authored three books on the subject and is also the CEO and founder of Down to Earth. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce Jaina Carter. Thank you, thank you. How are we doing, sound check? Good, excellent. Thank you, John, and thank you all for joining me. I'm glad to see that so many of you were curious uh, to learn how we can all leverage satellite data. Let's, let's move on to the right um, slide. Uh, how we can all improve the everyday lives of our municipalities uh, by using satellite data. For many of you, satellites probably aren't the first thing that come to mind when entering a discussion on technology trends like we are doing here today. So we're gonna start this presentation by trying to bridge that gap and help you all better understand with a panel discussion on the future of satellite data use. And of course, we will have a brief introduction of what satellites are, how you can use them, and so on. But first, we took to the street of Lisbon to see what people knew about satellites. I have to show my the, the normal. I think so. <laughs> Something we will launch to to Earth orbit. I would like some ideas, but no, not a lot. Uh, I think I know, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Satellite? No, sir. Uh, I think so. Yes, uh, it goes in space around the planet. So it provides with uh, photography, communications, and many other things, I presume. I think it works with internet and localization that focus the satellite, but I mean, I'm using it, but I don't know like, how it works or... GPS, for example. Uh, for example, when we use the Google Maps and so on. But yes, sure. The, the, in the cell phone, we have uh, navigation uh, chips that use uh, that all of us use during the day to day, uh, and uh, I guess also for communication, television, internet, and etc. Uh, yes, for communication and networks, internet. Yeah. We have uh, many applications in our smartphones. We use uh, maps and and other uh, systems of orientations that, uh, and, uh, uh, that use satellites as a tool. As you can see, the majority of people know only about the satellite solutions that impact their lives, like GPS and communication, but not all the applications for industries on Earth. Hopefully, by the end of this hour, it will become clear to you why this topic is useful to everyone. 
especially those of you in the room attending the 22nd Municipalities Conference, Connecting the Puzzle Pieces. Now, I want to start with an engagement activity, an opportunity to brainstorm about the role that satellites play in our day-to-day -day life. So, for this activity, I invite you to pull out your smartphones, and, um, because you're going to need them. And we're going to pull the audience to get a better sense of where you are all at when it comes to satellite and satellite use. Next slide, please. All right, when you first walked into this room, uh, there was a sign outside uh, pointing you to the email, the, to the link above for Paul EV. Please go to it, and we will start our Down to Earth survey. So the first question for you all, are you ready? Woo! Okay, I love the enthusiasm of this room. So the first question for all of you is, where are you from? Show of hands, how many of you were able to answer this question? All right, great, the, the majority. So uh, interesting. I wonder if the same people that raise their hands are all from Europe. Uh, as we can see, that's a majority. But I'm glad to see that we have Oceania, we have South America and Africa represented here. Are you guys ready for the next question? All right. So next question, what is your job role? Hopefully you all had an opportunity to answer this question and um, see that, that you're lost and think they're at the wrong conference. Well, hopefully by the end of this hour, you will no longer feel lost because you would have found all of the uses for satellite data that are applicable to you. So next question, can you rank the top satellite uses by market size? Hopefully everybody had a chance. So that's actually correct. Communications, navigation, and earth observation. Those are the right uh, ranking in um, market usage. The fourth question is, are you using any satellite applications? All right, I'm so happy to see that you're all aware that you're using satellite applications. The fifth question for you all is, what problem are, the problem that you're trying to solve is related to what market? So interesting to see ocean as our top concern, uh, followed closely by climate, environment, and weather. Yes, that satellite use um, has benefited these areas of research. 
And final question for you all. Do you think that space data is easily accessible? I see the majority answered no, and uh, hopefully Down to Earth can provide some solutions for that. So to summarize, um, space data is not easily accessible. The problem that we're trying to solve relates to oceans and climate. Uh, majority of you are from Europe, and hopefully by the end of this hour, you will no longer be lost. So now I would like to invite some volunteers of the stage to introduce themselves and talk about their personal relationships with satellites. This is all to get to know you a little bit better. Any volunteers? You guys three over there looking very eager to participate. Thank you very much for volunteering to join me on stage. Uh, please introduce yourselves and tell me a little bit more about your satellite knowledge and use. Hola okay. everyone, I'm uh, Sofia Franklin and I'm a mother to two. I'm the CMO of uh, Solar Fuego. And in Solar Fuego, we manufacture, develop, and install uh, solar panels for the public and for the private sectors. And for your question, uh, we use satellite imaging data in order to scan rooftops and to check the sound efficiency. So if either of you need a solar panel, just come to speak with me. <laughs> Hello, I'm Nadia Chambers. I'm currently a student and I'm working at the government, that is the federal government for environmental agency. And because of this, I know that the government, especially the federal government, makes use of satellite images to make informed decisions on land use, infrastructure, and national security among the others. Uh, hello, this is uh, Sebastian Garcia. I'm operations manager of Atlantic uh, Logistics. And uh, we are using uh, satellite communications in order to manage our vessels in mainly in the Atlantic Ocean, but as well all around the world. And it is easy for us to manage uh, crises and problems with the vessels that 20 years ago we were able just doing by uh, telefax and so on, and it was pretty difficult to be beside of the printer <laughs> every, every time. So nowadays we can operate in real time. Thank you to satellites. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me on stage. I see that you guys are quite familiar with what satellite data can do for you. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about you, we can dive into a discussion on the space industry with an emphasis on satellites and their uses. When people think of space, they think of the tremendous accomplishments in the 60s and 70s. The Apollo program sending humans to the moon, the Voyager missions exploring the ends of the solar system. People often don't think of space being essential to enabling the modern world, the modern connected world. How space impacts everyday lives in a thousand different days, or as even great business opportunities. So we will start off with a definition. What is a satellite? They're man-made objects. They're machines which go around the Earth. But why? 
Why do we have nearly 5,000 active machines orbiting the Earth? Why do we spend billions of dollars building these incredibly complex and hardy machines? Building rockets to send them into space and for their operation and management. Why is the revenue of hundreds of billions generated by these machines in the economy creating jobs and businesses? What did these machines do that it's so valuable? These machines aren't staring into space. They're staring back towards Earth, serving humanity. And the answer to all of these questions is simple, information. These machines in orbit provide the information services which make our modern connected world possible. These satellites form perform three key functions. First, navigation. Hordes of machines in orbit transmit signals to the Earth that devices in our phones, planes, vehicle, boats, and laptops can use to tell exactly where they are on Earth and help you navigate to your destination. They provide important pieces of information, where you are and where is everything else. Communications functions are performed by legions of satellites encircling the globe, facilitating communications from one part of the Earth to the other at breakneck speed, connecting our world. Lastly, Earth observation. Good decision making relies on good data. Over a thousand satellites observe Earth, providing information on the climate, our oceans, agriculture, and for disaster areas, among others which businesses and glo governments globally use to make decisions to produce more food, help with climate change, to save our lives in disaster areas. This is all relevant because there are a lot of opportunities in this growing market. You just have to know where to look. As we saw, satellite applications can be broadly divided into three categories, communications, navigation, and Earth observation. Satellite communications have been around since the 60s, and satellite-based navigation has been around since the 80s. Both highly competitive and saturated markets. Earth observation, on the other hand, has only been around since the mid-90s and has only taken off since 2010. That's only 12 years ago. The technology is rapidly advancing, but there's still a large gap in this market. Earth observation satellites produce hundreds of terabytes per day. If you're wondering how large a terabyte is, let me give you a visual. If a terabyte were to be printed double-sided on an A4 paper and stacked up, the pile would be 500 kilometers high. Earth observation satellites produce hundreds of terabytes a day. What people in business and government need is solutions intelligence, responses to the question of what should I do? Converting this incredible amount of data into usable, valuable intelligence is currently technically challenging and financially expensive. Earth observation has a big data problem, and there is the opportunity. So, in summary, if we zoom out and recap, we have satellites producing very large quantities of diverse data every day. But the people on Earth, the decision makers, only want solution, small bits of guidance to tell them what to do. So this thought actually transitions me nicely to my next topic. I would like to introduce a dear college of mine to the stage, Jill Subs will share some exciting things that our team in Down to Earth has been working on lately. Please help me welcome her to the stage. It doesn't work. Right? Thank you, thank you so much everyone and thank you Jaina for this insightful presentation and introduction. This is the kind of people that I love to work with at Down to Earth. Anyway, 
I'm here today to present to you the amazing work of our R&D team, the Space Data Inventory. So, yes, come on guys, yeah. As I see, and as Jane has stated before, we have more than 5,000 active satellites. We're talking EO, navigation, GNSS, oh, that's the same thing actually, and SATCOM. Um, multiple satellites equal <coughs> big data, actual terabytes of data. We're talking for EO, for example, hyperspectral, multispectral, LIDAR, radar, sounders, radiometers, you name it, we have it. Big data? Cool. But how do you access it? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? You have national space agencies where you have NASA, ISRO, JAXA, CARI. And on the other hand, you have commercial partners, which I'm not going to advertise for on this stage for free. And on the other hand, you have the users. Well, they have no clue. Do you know where to find the Landsat 8 uh, archives? No, that's what I guess. So you don't know how to access the data, where to access it, and how to use it. No worries. We have the solution for you. How do you connect the puzzle pieces? How do you bridge space and non-space? How do you connect the data and the users? How do you connect with your clients? Well, that's we at Down to Earth want to do for you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, so our MVP was uh, tailor-made for our favorite client, Space Race, which will be introduced later. And we tried with more than 1,000 entries into the inventory to cover what already exists and what has been done in the past, what is present, and what is, launch what is done to be launched soon. All of that to make sure that you don't reinvent the wheel and you actually come up with new ideas for your technologies. And for that, we have, for example, for EO, lots of uh, cha game-changing technologies such as hyperspectral and LiDAR, which will be the new technologies in the end that will probably make the market changes. So, what are we bringing to the table? Well, current um, searching inventory, current inventories, sorry, do not uh, bring what we can bring you and what we can offer you, a brand new interface that can support your ideas and your businesses. And for that, still you don't know what the space data inventory is? Well, that's simple. It's a centralized, searchable, user-friendly, functional, accurate, and concise inventory that you can access for free. Well, the demo, I would say. And if you would like, for example, to talk about it, you can always find me at the coffee break. I would make a pleasure to show you and show you how we can help you, your company, and the world, because that's what we do. We connect the puzzle pieces, am I right? All right, see you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Thank you. These, this is the type of amazing individuals we have here at Down to Earth, and that I'm so glad to work with every day. I'm thrilled to be here uh, today to present the result of the um, incredible work that we do. So now uh, I'm going to show you some video clips that we recorded of different individuals taking about some job-specific applications of space data. Nope. Hi, my name is João Pedro, and I'm the owner and operator of Eve's Farm. This is a farm located in Art Ribatejo, where we are producing corn on a 500 hectares land. This is a family business, and I am the third generation to manage it. In recent years, we have faced severe droughts due to climate change. After addressing this problem, we found out that satellite applications can help us with this situation. We have started to use satellite applications that allow us to monitor the humidity in our soil. 
is a very simple and easy to use application where each week we receive a weekly report telling us where in our land and how much water we need to deliver here and there. This is a very useful solution to tackle these extreme weather events. We are increasing our yields and at the same time we are saving some water. We are really happy with this solution. Thank you. You guys are from the International Space University? Like the satellites in, in, the, in space? Yeah. Hi, I'm Paolo. I'm an Uber driver here in uh, Oeiras. How, how long have you been? I uh, worked for the past uh, seven years in Uber. Uh, I can choose my clients, I decide my own schedule. The map tells me where to go, pick up the customers, bring them to where they want to go, and everybody's happy. After COVID, it became more popular? Well, I would say actually during COVID, it became uh, quite, quite popular. You know, people needed to get out of the house because they weren't going to work anymore. So I know it works on my phone. Uh, my iPhone gives me directions and such. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work so well, sometimes it works well. GPS and so or something? I don't know what the interaction is between my phone and, the, and whatever's in the sky. I just know that my phone tells me where to go. Hi, I'm Kishore Pedro. I'm the construction manager of Pedro Nunes Power Plant. This power plant we are constructing along with the critical infrastructure for the benefit of the people residing surroundings. So you can see our power plant, how big it is. It's almost like a 1.5 square kilometers. We are monitoring our construction progress and safety hazards using drones. Drones are, drones are operated by our people and they are taking pictures. Those are very small. We, we, we want to monitor wider pictures. We are looking for uh, other solutions. We heard about satellites. Satellites are taking images of Earth continuously. So we are looking forward for a better and simpler solution where you can integrate the satellite data and the drone data combinedly so, so we can monitor the, our construction progress in an easy way and a better way using that. Next. Hope you enjoy that video. And uh, from it, we can see that there are clear benefits to industries using earth observation data from irrigation optimization in agriculture to route optimization for personal transportation. But the last video points out that not all industries use or have easy access to satellite data. And there are many set barriers to such a uh, task. It is a mission of the Two Gather Company to help overcoming these barriers. With us today, we have the pleasure of having the founder of Two Gather, the visionary Mr. Ilan. Mr. Renal will briefly present us their product and how they're helping industries bridging the gap between satellite data and their customer businesses. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today here with you. Um, I'm very happy to tell you more about uh, our great company. Click, please. Okay, so as you can see, regarding to many data inputs, either from space or from celestial uh, data inputs, as for drones, there are many characteristics. Uh, in example, uh, space uh, data um, can, be co can cover very large areas and can repeatedly uh, take image day after day of the same spot or the same point, but have some certain limitation, of course. In the other hand, let's uh, talk about the uh, drone data. It has much better uh, spatial resolution. The resolution is just better. It can have a real time, like video. Sorry. 
um, video uh, abilities, uh, but on the other hand, uh, the field of view is very narrow and uh, it's not 24 7 in air. You need to know when to launch uh, the drone. Uh, so, click please. And so, of course, let's try, and that's what we're doing. Let's combine and take only the advantages of uh, each uh, domain. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to look about the ecosystem of, of all the chain of the data. So we start from the bottom, the space data suppliers, many of them, of course, we just talked about it. Uh, the, the thing is, they have a lot of data, but usually they block other competitors or companies for having the data, so they, it's like a silo. They work with their own data, and for that, the data or the solution is not uh, optimized, okay? Next, we go up uh, one stair, not yet, come back, please. Uh, uh, once, thank you. Um, we're going to look about the drones. A drone company have one goal, to sell as many drones as they can. <laughs> and for that, uh, the end user usually will pay a lot of money, either for operating the drone or either to uh, receive the data from the drones. And uh, that's for sure not optimized for the customer. If I look at the customer, not yet, please. <laughs> I will tell you when. Uh, we, if we look uh, on the end user, uh, the end users are, are many, they are endless. But uh, the thing is, they don't know what kind of uh, data existed from space, what, where, or when. And uh, that's, uh, that was, I was very happy to hear my previous uh, lecture talking about this data inventory. I think it's a great idea. For sure, you will succeed. Uh, now we are looking at the not yet, please. <laughs> Go back one, please. Thank you. Now I'm looking about the application layer. There are many, many applications, software. There are a variety of names. The thing is, each application is suited, is like tailor-made for one end user. The thing is, every application needs to develop from scratch. It takes a lot of time, and for that, it takes a lot of money. And again, the end user pays a lot of money, and. Um, it's, they're not very happy to have the solution after a long time. So what is our concept? Click, please. <laughs> In our uh, company, uh, together, we made uh, one platform. All the data is get into that platform, OK? And uh, from all the uh, different layers all together, and we give the user uh, one solution tailor-made for him with a remarkably simple um, uh, interface, OK? And, um, and, and the end user have this telemed solution in the end. So everyone uh, pretty happy. Uh, click, please. Um, just, sorry, go back. My mistake. Go back one, please. No. Yes. Back, back. One more. Thank you. Um, and um, for that, uh, the, the end user is happy to have a very fast uh, solution. And one more uh, information input I would like to ask. There is a very, uh, let's say, famous uh, market projection of the Earth observation to reach $1 trillion goal by 2040. Our company um, is a major catalyst for that uh, projection to become a reality. So uh, the market also uh, believe in us. Click, please. Uh, now, if we look at the different uh, companies, there are many companies, as I say, uh, working in this field. Some of them only supply space product or drone product. Some of them, as you can see, they, they deal with data, but they only um, deliver the data to the cloud. They're not giving the data to the end user. And so we aim ourselves um, at, at, to, to emerge all the um, layers, all the data, all the procedure all together with not so, so much of a comp competitiveness, Beside maybe tomorrow.io, which doing pretty much the same, but they deal only with weather. And as I say, we deal with all type of end user uh, and data. And uh, of course, we are um, collaborating with many of these companies to have the best solution uh, for the end user. So now after uh, I describe my company, I would like to leave you with a short uh, video trailer made for TV. Uh, that was a TV team uh, escorting us for a few months. And uh, I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Yes, 40 plus one. Yes, I'm fully aware it costs $100 million. Yes, so one orbital ticket for me and the rest is suborbital tickets for all my employees. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Bye bye. Ah, what can I tell you? It's good to be on the green. 
after the successful IPO of Together Company. Nobody, including me, believed that space could be profitable, but eventually it worked, mainly because of luck and my charm together. Hello, welcome to the interview at Together. Uh, here we are looking for the best candidates because we are dealing with the hardest domains of uh, space and drones and we combine them into the unified platform that will uh, bring us a lot of money. And uh, uh, what can you tell us about your experience as a field? Well, thank you for inviting me to this interview. I've heard a lot about your company and I would really love to contribute. Um, and I believe that my skills could help me to do that. Uh, I have experience with system integration. I also work with Almanac for GPS satellite and I'm also a licensed pilot. Oh. That uh, indeed uh, sounds compatible with what we're looking for. So can you tell us uh, now what, in your view, are the, the best advantages of the satellites and the drones, one related to another? I believe that drones can actually uh, benefit us in providing real-time monitoring. Uh, and satellites, on the, on the other hand, uh, they can capture more uh, broader or wider uh, scope of land, uh, which is great. Um, and I think the drones can be actually used to complement satellites in time and in location. Oh, that's uh, a great fit indeed. So we have uh, your hired and we have a great demo in the next week and we think you will be great to lead it. Thank you. I'm so happy. Thank you. I'd love to. Hi, Aidan. Hi, Aidan. We here. cannot work on all the projects all the time. We need to focus. Andre, it's essential for a business. We cannot uh, become big if we not start from the end user software and we cannot become large if we're not working the same time on the infrastructure. You got to believe me on that. But we agreed that we need a very clear go to market. We will run out of easy money. Go to market, go to market. What about the geostationary satellite? We need also this data. You always think that I'm so high, but uh, we need the uh, hires to do that. A lot of new hires. Don't you just tell me you recruit a new worker can make a work of five people all together? So thank you very much for the overview of the company that you gave me. So as I explained before, so we are working on mining and so my company is really looking to invest in the metals that are critical for the energy transition, minerals such as lithium and cobalt that uh, are in huge demand. So for this we have been contacting uh, drone companies but their operations are really time consuming and costly to cover uh, large uh, lands. So this is a bit of the struggle that we have had in the field. Right, um, interesting. Um, actually, this is something we can um, help you with because um, we have a solution specifically for you. Uh, so our platform combines both satellite-based data and drone-based data. Um, and for your specific case, what we would do uh, is use satellite-based data to identify it out of the large scope of land that we have, to identify those specific areas where it would make sense to use drones. Um, so that actually makes it much more efficient and cost efficient as well. Um, so our solution will offer you specific uh, insights tailored to your business. Oh, very interesting. Are we sure we are ready for the IPO? How do you think the market will react to our business proposition? Guys, relax. We're going to nail it. We are ready. We are the first space business that reached out from the closed space club. We are the inspiration and many others will follow. We are creating so many opportunities and jobs and we continue to do that into the future. We are literally taking space business down to earth. I certainly look forward to watching the full-length film. <laughs> so now we're going to finish this presentation with a short panel discussion. I'm sure you're all waiting for it. I invited each of my panelists because I felt that they would have something special to add to this discussion. I will be joined on stage by the following individuals. Ms. Foxy Wilson, Executive Director of the Mandalorian Space Agency. Ms. Laser Lazarovich, founder and CEO at Space Race, a nonprofit startup. 
and the Grand Vizier to the Duke of Naples, Laszlo Panaflax, Professor of Space Policy at the International Space University. Please help me welcome them to the stage. Thank you again for joining me. Um, let's talk, let's start up with talking about space data applications for non-space sectors, since this is what we've been talking about uh, on this session. How would you describe the current situation in the market? And I'll start with Foxy. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. It really is truly an honor. You know, the use of space or satellite data in space applications continues to thrive. <laughs> In the globalization, or the commercialization of our space agency has never looked so promising. In fact, in the past year alone, global activities made possible by space applications has generated billions of dollars. And technology is advancing, and this is definitely an exciting time. I totally agree with Mrs. Foxy. Uh, this is very, very exciting time for each and everyone who wants to participate and learn how to use space data. We have new source of fundings, uh, venture capitalists, uh, new space and non-space companies that are interested and want to invest in us. This is exciting time as well, and I'm looking forward to see you all participate and take a, take a part of my website. Mm. Well. Oh, of course. Uh, first of all, let me echo the sentiments of my other two colleagues on the panel. I'm very honored to be here. As you know, the, uh, my noble patron, the Duke of Naples, is actually a great proponent for the use of space solutions in the Principality of Naples. So I'm very happy to be representing that here. Uh, I think we've heard from the, uh, from the space agency perspective and from the business perspective. From a more international perspective, Something that would be important to, be con uh, to consider would be the sustainability development goals. So these were developed by the United Nations in 2015, and the focus of these is to make sure that by 2030, globally, that everyone has a sufficient quality of life in terms of food sustainability, environment, water, and access to the global information market. Now, the funny thing is that even though space actually has an international community in the United Nations, as you know, UN Copious, that space didn't cross wire with the development of the SDGs. And I think this is very much because of a view that space is a luxury product for developed nations rather than an essential solution for developing nations. And we only need to mention a few examples to show that this isn't the case. Uh, for example, let's take Colombia that uses Earth observation applications to identify illegal mining across their country. Now, this simply would not be possible with in situ manpower. Uh, another example that, that can come up would be uh, the new application of SmallSart, which seeks to use Earth observation data to identify illegal fishing in the area of the Maldives and illegal ocean passage. Now, if we were to break it down to its fundamental level, what are developing nations lacking in at the moment? Resources. What does Earth observation do? It allows you to more efficiently use and target your resources. It is an essential solution. However, in this case, it's a matter of political will and financing. Space applications are expensive to develop, and this is true with all of the SDGs, is that if we want to implement these globally, it's a matter of developing nations putting their money where their mouth is. Thank you all. It, it sounds like there is a promise from what you guys have talked, uh, a great future in um, space-based solutions. So what are the challenges and gaps in connecting space to non-space sectors? Sure, so I see three key challenges here, all different in vain, but I think worth noting. 
Um, the first one is a lot of our general market players don't understand the usefulness of space data or the fact that it is freely and publicly available to all. Um, you know, I mentioned that technology is advancing, but there are still some key technology advancements ongoing, um, and we need these to come to fruition. For example, high resolution imagery, low latency communications. And finally, um, something that is actively been going on is the fact that our general non-space industry is relatively dependent on decisions made by government institutions or private entities, and they really have no control over their decision making. And so the promotion of methods to ensure sustained accessibility to the space data for these general markets would really be beneficial. Uh, can I elaborate on something? I think that uh, data is really freely accessible. And when I look at the crowd and your answers in the PolyV, you use satellite data. We all know here it exists. We all know users, and I hope you learn new users today from the, all the presentation that was. So why all of us, the majority of us, thought this is very inaccessible tool if we all use it? What I am thinking as a data engineer, when I was trying to look up a use of satellite data, just for my own personal interest, uh, I couldn't find a very good resource of information how to do it. Really, how to do it. Like small kids that want to try to build something new. I wanted a five-step guide that will allow me how to do it. And you know what? I did not find it. Why? I think it's, this is a complex question, but what we are lacking, it's a one place that you have all the information, all the, the instructions, how to access and use the data from enthusiast people who love this field as much as you do. So this is the main gap I was uh, able to identify, and I hope you're sharing the same feeling with me. So Professor Penaflies, Foxy, and Laser talked about markets and technology mm -hmm. issues. Should we consider any other perspectives? Mm. Yes, uh, I think on the international stage, there are two key perspectives. So the first is dual use. And for those in the audience who aren't aware what this term means, it means that space applications that can be used for commercial purposes can also be used for military and defense purposes. Uh, now, to clarify, this is neither a good nor a bad thing, but it is ethically complex and is worthy of discussion and settlement. Uh, the second part is privacy. So we, to be clear, this is not just a space problem. We have seen with Google, with Facebook, with various other applications, that a lot of data on individuals is being gathered and can be accessed. And there is already regulation to deal with this, such as GDPR. However, this kind of regulation hasn't yet extended to space data. So I think for both of these issues, uh, a, an international solution would be to get together discuss international policy and decide it, and then implement it into national regulation. Thank you. So this actually brings me to my next question. How can we address these, uh, these issues regarding international policies and regulatory oversight? Yeah, I can take this one. So I think it's really important for those of us that are already actively engaged in the space community to take steps forward to you know, opening it up and breaking down those walls that have been put up historically. Um, we need to continue to promote commercialization. And there are many things that we can do, um, you know, financial incentives, partnerships, sponsorships. The list goes on and on. At the Mandalorian Space Agency, we're actually taking part in several of these activities, but there's always more that we can do. Um, you know, it's really important for us to shift and start listening to our non-space sectors and really take a market-driven approach. I totally agree, but I want to expand a little bit. Look, as, as I said before, we have all these data sources. Everyone used them, but everyone struggled to use them. And for creating a well-developed field, 
that everyone can use and everyone will prosper, like machine learning, we need a community. If, uh, if I might, I got, a, I got a slide for that. Thanks. My company, Spaceface, is a non-profit company that's building a community of, spa of data from space users for everyone for free, for you to share what you know, because I know you know, every one of you have your own use case that you already do and already know stuff. Put it in a website, share it with other people, work, work together on a new solutions, this, all of this with user guides that people enthusiastic like us will share with you, will help you to get into this new field and get everyone very engaged in it. The last one, need to, the last thing I want to know, to say to you, it's everything I said here need to connect to the market. How do we engage a market to go into a field they never heard of? Well, we give them the opportunity to, come to bring a, a problem and people enthusiastic like you and me try to solve it. We will make competitions that people, that everyone who wants to will, can apply and get the best result. The best result will be published to everyone to see and learn. The winning party will get money and the company will get a solution. And this is what Space Race is all about. It's about sharing, it's about understanding, it's about a community together to create this new field. Thank mm. you. I was going to say, Miss Laser, I hope you don't mind, uh, you're not embarrassed by my singing your praises. Thanks. But uh, I was actually really uh, enthusiastic when I ran across your organization and excited to see you here today. Uh, because this is something that we've been discussing a lot, and it was actually an initiative we were looking to start in uh, Naples. But given that you're already doing it, we would, of course, like to extend you an invite to set up uh, in our principality. But uh, for, just to expand for the audience as well the significance of this. Now, this is not a new model. It's already worked in another field. So we can take as an example Kaggle and other organizations in the field of AI and machine learning. So if we think back to 2010, it might be difficult to imagine, but AI and machine learning were still quite niche activities and not broadly adopted by industry. And what changed that? It was activities like this, uh, as I said, the Kaggle business model. They built an online community where there was forums and where people could post their tools and build applications together. And then with this community that they built, they then connected it with industry. Industry could post competitions onto this forum saying, we have this really difficult challenge. Here's the instructions for it. Everybody post the best solutions. So the companies got to leverage at minimal cost a gigantic community making solutions for them, and the people that were making solutions got to build their, build their career reputation and potentially get jobs out of it or boost their startups. And this really had a huge impact in the wider industrial adoption of AI and machine capabilities. And I think that this can do, the, uh, can do it for space applications. Thank you very much. This is very exciting to hear. I might say another thing. We don't want just to show you the data applications. We want to inform you about the uses of all satellites by using down to earth inventory uh, that we integrated in the website in order to you to fully understand what we are capable of as a community and then participate. And I'm very excited. And let me say from a personal note, I really believe this website is necessary and I wish that every one of you here in this room who knows stuff, wants to engage with me and contribute, come talk to me. I think we are on to a new and very exciting thing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So if nobody had a chance to look at that QR code that, that she was showing and now is curious, our IT team, could you go back one slide to make it available for for those that are still interested in it. And now before we close, I think we have time for a few questions. 
oh no, I'm getting um, the no signal. So anyways, thank you uh, by giving them a, a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. So this wraps up our panel discussion uh, for today. If anybody in the audience has any one. question for them, I invite you to catch them later at one of the uh, Down to Earth sponsored networking um, breaks. So before we finish the session, I want to offer some closing remarks. At first, space can seem remote. And I hope that this presentation has shown how space providers on the ground essential services, solutions, business opportunities, and employment for your municipality. Space navigation, communications, and remote sensing already plays a huge part in our lives at the individual, business, organizational, and government levels. It's being used for the climate, agriculture, aquaculture, disaster management and mitigation, and city planning, among others. Yet, despite everything space already does for our society, for this municipality and its citizens, there's still huge opportunities that can be exploited to create new businesses and jobs, and offer solutions to improve efficiency in various sectors of the economy and the government. However, there are still gaps. Our panel demonstrated that activities by partners in business, government space agencies, and through international space policy engagement are necessary to push for better solutions. A huge outstanding gap exists in big data for satellite remote sensing. Satellites produce hundreds of terabytes of data per day on the Earth, which can be used globally and locally by this municipality to inform decisions. Yet, at present, converting terabytes of data into the intelligence needed by governments and businesses to make decisions is technically challenging and expensive. Space Race and Together have capitalized on solving this problem. The business cases by Space Race and Together demonstrated the large business and employment opportunities that exist for this municipality. The immense value that can be generated in by making space solutions available for industry, agriculture, and governments. Lastly, thank you for attending our presentation by Down to Earth. Our aim at the Down to Earth Foundation is to connect users in the economy and the government with upstream space solutions. To help with this, we have developed the downstream catalog, which will be accessible soon on Space Race's website, who we at Down to Earth have partnered with on this endeavor. Finally, I and all of our presenters at Down to Earth, Space Race, and Together organizations feel honored to have the opportunity to present to a room of such prestigious and accomplished guests. Thank you very much. And with that, we have come to the end of our first event of this nine-week program. Um, can I get one more round of applause for all of my panel members, Ms. Jane Carter, <laughs> Ms. Chilbez, <laughs> and Mr. Ilan for presenting. And uh, this concludes our presentation, so now I would like to invite the entire Down to Earth team to join me. And it is time for the Q&A.
So what a wonderful presentation. Another round of applause for TP Space for Non Space Down to Earth. I'm pretty sure you all have a lot of questions, so let's start. Any questions? Hugo, Pascal. <laughs> Any questions from uh, our guests on Zoom? You want to do a question? Absolutely, please. quite tiny here, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. It was an exciting presentation. Uh, my name is Clésio. I'm currently the director of National Institute for Space Research in Brazil. And uh, we have been doing our research there. And most of the, some of those topics that I saw here are related to what we have also identified as key, key questions that could be adopted. So I have, uh, I don't know how many questions can I have. I have three, but I'll, I'll try to summarize in two maybe. Uh, one of is related to technology. Uh, and the other one is related to the uh, data dissemination. First, let's start with uh, the downstream. Data dissemination is, uh, when you compare to previous, let's say, internet availability, data searching methods, we, from the 80s and 70s, we saw several learning, um, searching machines uh, prior to Google. Maybe the new generation knows only Google because Google is now the leading searching engine in the world. But there are a lot before that. So how are you addressing that? You are made, okay, let's make hubs for data, data here, data there, people connecting communities, with uh, data providers. And that was essentially was the internet in the very beginning. Websites, information and service in the internet, and then users trying to use that. So the business model is quite the same. So how do you compare that? They're gonna be a leading provider or a leading searching, a leading connecting people, or they're gonna be plenty of connecting engines. That's the first question. And the second one, I will let them answer that. Regarding the technology, I'm a satellite guy. I'm, my institute is building satellite, building upstreams and downstreams. We build applications. You, <coughs> you certainly saw Impius uh, uh, numbers on the monitoring, the Amazon, now the other biomas. We are monitoring the whole biomas of Brazil now. We are expanding our monitoring. And we provide data, but we also build satellites. And then we see the technology getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. We saw during the uh, last Olympics, I mean, uh, China fly 1,000 drones and make figures in the space. So we see high resolution with different curvature different crews, different kind of observation of the same object. So for the most of the users, with our single users, small buildings, small, even a, a huge bridge, even a huge building with a quite a few number of drones, which are much cheaper than launching a satellite and keeping it running for four years. It's available now, and getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So the question is, the satellites are made for the community or will be made for the government only? Because the community may take advantage of the drones. So these are the two main questions I'd like to see if you can have provide some answer for that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions. So if I may summarize the first question, I believe it was whether you see the future of the market to become a um, of the data providers as a one big data provider or many small data providers. Um, I think, Idan, you might be able to. Shenhoff, OK. I will answer the first one. Um, look, I'm not, I don't know how the future will go. If we can see the internet, there is a very big search provider. And right now we have 
two major companies that I can think of right now that getting into the exact field you're saying is Amazon and Google. And uh, up until now, we didn't have it. And this is, for me, as a space person, first of all, it's very exciting. Uh, but I don't know how it's going to end up. I mean, what I can know, it's, for me, my business. It's not about searching the, the, uh, the images themselves. It's not about providing the data. It's about telling the users, the programmers, the people who want to access it, how to do it how to do the Python script they wanted, how to work on the QGIS they wanted, to share this information, share this knowledge in between people. We create community. We create communication between people. It's not about accessing the data itself, it's about sharing what you know. And this is the difference between me and the big providers, which I obviously cannot compete with. Yeah, and if I may just add something on what Shen have said, this is exactly what we aimed to do with the space data inventory. I presented it as a business case, but it's actually a project that we aim at with uh, Raphael, Carolina, and Gary to make um, an open source starting point to gather every data providers and their information into one platform, which basically you have the information, but you don't have the data. That's it. Uh, great question and good luck next year, SSP in Brazil. Uh, I try to put my two cents on the two questions. So for the first one, my answer will be dual use. Uh, because during our research, I'm new to space, I'm not coming from space, I'm coming from drones actually in, in my hometown, let's say. Um, what I learned is that most of the application are uh, coming from, let's say, ESA or NASA budget, most of them for research, very small budget to a many different companies. So the solutions are very narrow and, and, and too narrow. And I think we are pretty much, as you described, in the phase of two, uh, many small, but eventually the market will involve to like one big. This is what I think and this is what I hope. And, uh, and the way to do it is by dual use. To get dual use means to get a budget from defense or, or government's um, budget bigger and to work together with the startup or the companies and those um, application will do two things, like one civilian use and one defense use with bigger budget. It, of course, it uh, involves ethical things as well, but I think that's the solution. Um, for the second question regarding drone, why not just to use drones because they are so simple, uh, DJI, uh, etc. I think the, the, the answer is the software again. Uh, space is not only upstream, it's not only hardware and machine, the answer is down in the software. So the end user should not even know or care where the data coming from. It can come from space either by, from drone, but the software will give him the answer and the software shouldn't be uh, expensive. You can do, use the model of SaaS software as a service, just pay your $10 a, a month get your solution, you don't care where it's come. And then when you combine the advantage of each different domain, you're happy as a customer. Uh, because of course drone have the advantages, but space, uh, as I said, wider can be repeatedly, it's always there as for geosatellites uh, observing uh, uh, weather, it's always there, so advantage. Uh, sorry, I can come in on the business perspective. So you made a comparison with search engines and about first versus second mover advantage. Uh, so first of all, I, I think the comparison with search engines isn't quite complete because it's not just a matter of searching for data. That's the very top of the process. Where the big overhead costs come in is manufacturing terabytes of data into something that is actually useful for downstream client. Like there are some downstream clients that like to work with the data themselves, but that is a much smaller market than the market potential. So I think the key part of it, which is what I think was the final stage of Two Gathers business plan, was to create a platform as a service. So similar to how in the internet you have various layers of abstraction, so that you know back before the internet, selling to a global market would be incredibly expensive. Whereas now Greg can get an off-the-site website and integrate it with international finance to sell his, like, I don't know, like, you know, Etsy thing or whatever. 
But uh, th that's essentially what we're trying to do. If you can connect with AWS, if you can c connect with like your web platform and build a platform that other people can build their apps on and gather a portion of their revenue, a margin as your fee, then you can actually entrench yourself quite well. Thank you, guys. Um, I was just informed that we have a question from Juan de Dalmao. Juan, please unmute yourself and ask you, are you, your question. Thank you. Hello. Can someone make a sign? Yes, we hear you clearly. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. First of all, congratulations to the team that I can see on stage here for a very professionally delivered and very lively presentation. You have really kept the audience interested and uh, you have provided useful information. Uh, you made a great choice of speakers and uh, the roles you have played. Uh, my question has to do with the business plans of the two proposed uh, startups. And it is connected to uh, communicating with your uh, customers. As we have learned during this SSP, uh, communication is, is a two-way business. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I have the impression that uh, what we are proposing is um, the following story. We, the space people, want to bring our data to non-space users, and we, space people, are telling you where and how to use our data. Uh, but have we thought about converting the data really into information? And so my question is, how do the down-to-earth economic sectors bring their needs, their challenges, uh, their questions up to the space people. So have you discussed how your businesses will listen to the users? And if so, could you point us to the section in the team project final report where you are covering this? Um, that's my question and again, uh, really congratulations for an incredibly professional and very hard work. And having been through many team projects myself, I can see what you've done. Congratulations. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> so if I, if, oh, oh, that's loud. <laughs> so if I may reiterate the question one more time, you're essentially asking, um, we're providing a solution, but how will we make sure that the downstream users know this, this solution exists? Or how will we advertise it to them? Uh, I'm asking, how are you collecting the needs from the users, bottom up, rather than telling them what is good for them? Okay. Robert, you might have an idea. Uh, yeah, sure, I can take that one. I mean, f first of all, I'd, I'd like to address this larger issue that comes up with uh, non-space not knowing about space applications. So I think this is more of a symptom than it is a cause. I mean, every other industries have marketing and sales, and we've got big companies like Planet and Maxar that spend on marketing and sales. So for us, it's uh, each of the companies, so Together and Space Race, has a route to market. So I can say Together has a three-stage route to market, each of which is based on bottom-up analysis. So the f and to have intermediate revenue generation to keep it coming. So the first stage is being a consultancy type business. And in this you would identify potential markets, uh, one of which is potentially defense, and you would work with them to really understand your, their user needs. And you would work to build partnerships with space data and with drones. And then this bootstraps you to the next stage, which is you're using all of this customer information that you've built, the technical information of working with the data and producing intelligence, and your partnerships with, com with companies to move to the next stage, which is software as a service. Can you build a general software that can take as input 
multiple drone and Earth observation data inputs and provide flexible outputs that correspond with your bottom-up research of what the customer needs. And then from here, the expansion is to the final stage, which is platform as a service. Can you open up the tools from this SaaS software to create a platform on which other users can place their own applications that they've built that they can sell to clients and you'll get a margin from that. So it's very much built on bottom up. And then for Space Race, in terms of building a community, one of the stipulations when you're building applications in it is that you need to have other elements than the technical. You need to have some kind of business write-up as to what market it's connecting with. And then the final stage of this is, as we say, the competitions. Similar to Kaggle, we'll invite corporate sponsors to post their problems to the community. And this will direct the formation of startups, it'll focus people's careers, and it will very much be on a bottom-up basis that comes from your downstream clients. Has that fully answered your question? Thank you very much. Yes, thanks. Obrigado. Thank you very much. We have a question here on site. Hello. Hello. OK. Uh, my name is Victor. Um, I'm here actually representing uh, Amazon. Um, and my question is really, what's going to be the iPhone moment for all of this? What's going to be the moment when like, the penny drops to the mass population that it's a really good idea to use space data? Mm. Because at Amazon, we do all this storage. We like collect petabytes every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we work with the, um, the EO companies, and we really try to understand who can we partner with to bring this to the people. Like, how do we escape the space bubble, essentially? So you're essentially asking for what or at which moment in time do you think it will become a hit? Yeah, yeah. Like, what's going to be the killer application here? Like, uh, is it is it going to be? Uh, oh, you can look at your car anywhere from space, or you can do that, right? But like, what what's going to be the thing that drives the most people to use this? And it could be business, could be individuals as well. Okay, thank you for the question. I uh, have some nodding on the left here. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Actually, I'm curious myself. I don't know. My company wants to provide the platform and the community to found out. So I'm hoping that when we share the information, when we will have these solutions that everyone can learn from them and participate and create for free and open solutions for a lot of other people, we will find out this killer app. Because I think right now it's a matter of I believe in space and I know what space can do. But I mean, outside of my community, a lot of people are not fully aware. and. For a killer app, we need enthusiastic people that sit in a basement and doing the work. So this is mine. Thank you for your question. I would um, maybe give a m broader answer to that is um, the main gap between space and non-space right now, I would say, is the communication. And it actually is um, a symptom of the miscommunication the grand public has with science in general. To that, I don't think there is a specific application or a specific person we expect to solve this problem. But with emerging issues that we see from climate change, from disaster management in general, we need to advertise, not specifically in a profit way, but also in a more general way to show that Space is not this useless hole of money that we will just throw everything in. We need to debunk some of the main, I would say, individuals that embody space right now because showing space as a sector that is only accessible for the rich is probably the main gap right now that is uh, showing, like for example, when I talk to my friends and say, oh, I work on the moon, I work on Mercury, they say, oh my, fa oh my God, this is so amazing, how do you do it? Uh, and they, they imagine me as an astronaut in, in being, and I'm like, no, this is not what I do. And I'm not going to be like the next Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. 
we need to stop embodying individuals and start thinking as a community to, I would say, bring space to non-space so that we, as a, as a scientific community, can help our people and just be more aware of how helpful we can be. Three more addings, short ones. One, you related to iPhone. So Steve Jobs created a lot of stuff, but most of the invention wasn't Steve Jobs. Someone had the real invention before, but he knew how the user will use it and how to combine the stuff. So the combination of and make it simple to use, this is one thing because it's maybe not a popular thing, but space also have limitation. It's not so easy to get a space image to understand what's happening there. So I think the user interface and make it easier and easier as you use the Uber and other stuff, it's very easy to use. You use the GPS, you don't know even what is in the data itself. And the second, I think we need a very big commercial company to breach first and to start use aerosol observation as a primary way of data. And after the first one will breach, the other will follow. Uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll come in from the, just kind of summing up what the previous have said is that one of the main gaps uh, that we've identified throughout this is, produce, is manufacturing terabytes of information into something that da the downstream cares about and can use profitably so you can get enough of a margin from them. Now, currently the market is divided into vertically integrated sections. You've got Planet, you've got Maxar, and they're all hoarding their entire supply chain. But what's missing for wider use is to reduce the overheads of making a space for non-space application. It's currently very expensive and it prices most applications out of the market in terms of cost benefit. So I think the, bids, the big step would be if somebody can make a platform or just any actions that will reduce the cost of this overhead. So I think that's what the two businesses are doing. So Space Race is doing that from a gathering information all into one place. And this isn't just where the data is, but all of the machine learning and AI tools and how to use and apply them for space data for business. Uh, and also building a community around that that you can hire from. Uh, and to gather is essentially that's the final stage of their business to create a platform as a service where somebody can come in with some understanding of machine learning and AI and be connected with partners, uh, drones and earth observation and a, a whole portfolio of tools that they can use. So it's their, it's their option to do their own market research and build something they can add profit to. So it's mostly lowering those overhead costs. What's up here? I have. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to add a personal note to your question. So I think that the new f future won't come from the big players. It will come for the small players. And also I think that investing in education also of children and making them inspired. I was in a few conferences of uh, children and activities, and I really saw like huge ideas that comes from nowhere. So that's why I think that investing in this program and in the young people, this is the next step. And yes, so it will come from there. And if I may add a personal note, um, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. There's a lot of ways to approach it. Um, as we mentioned in our presentation before, we divvied up the space sector essentially into three parts. You have the satellite communications, you have the global navigations, and then you have the Earth observation. For global navigation, arguably, I think the iPhone moment has already happened. Um, most of us probably used it to come here. It's like Google Maps or Apple Maps. It doesn't really matter which one you use, but it seems to be something that is used by a very, very large part of the world already. For um, communications, we are potentially right now at the brink of this point where this becomes a mass market uh, object through either Starlink or OneWeb or whatever you subscribe to. Um, it might happen, it might not. We're currently at that point. And for Earth observation, because uh, one of the things that we also highlighted at the beginning of the pre presentation, of the three markets, it's the newest one. And the technology is still rapidly advancing. So in that sense, I would say, 
give it another 10 years and then maybe if, if, it, if the technology advances enough, then yeah, looking at your car while you're on a holiday to see if it's not stolen might become a thing. So in that sense, I, I think we still have a little bit to go for Earth observation, but for the other two, I think we've, we've, we have, we've hit the moment. Thank you for the question. Walter Peters, uh, you have a question? You are muted just in case. Walter, you're muted. Walter, you are muted. Yes, very sorry for that. I was in listening mode. Is it okay now? Yes, better. Okay, so I want, would like to join my uh, my colleague Juan. And uh, yes, I enjoyed this presentation. It was fluent. It was uh, lively. Uh, never boring. I must also stress that I enjoyed yesterday uh, reading your report, which is very well written. Uh, my compliments for that. But during the, res the presentation and uh, reading the report, I remained sitting with one question, which I hope you can you can uh, uh, explain at the moment. I heard the word being said, which uh, uh, non-profit startup. A non-profit startup is virtually a, con uh, a contradiction in terminus. A startup is something that wants to make profits. So, and I, I, I found this, is, uh, this oscillation in your report always between non-profit business and I'm not clear anymore. So are you talking about two different approaches, one non-profit, one business? Are you talking about an incremental approach whereby you first start with a non-profit and transfer that into a profitable a business thing? And as a side question, how do you think you're going to finance your non-profit if you start with that or even if you do it independently? Looks a difficult thing to, to uh, for me at least, to finance. So what, what, what is your, what is your uh, real, real conclusion out of your report? Start with both in parallel let one grow to the other. And my problem is, how do you finance your non-profit? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so it's actually a very interesting point because I believe when we came up with the business cases, we were already thinking about the synergy aspects that they could potentially have in the future. So I think I'm going to give it to Shanha first. I didn't want to talk about the synergy. I can do it. But I will want to address the non-profit uh, uh, startup. Look, um, I have a good job in my, in my country, and I love my job. And uh, it was my personal choice to say, well, I love this field. I love this field so much. I don't want to make revenues now, and I don't feel like I need it. I want to contribute my community. I want to take all the profits that I will do from the competitions and invest it back to write information and to, to create this community. It was my personal choice. And I think uh, it's okay either way. I mean, if, if anyone uh, wants to make a profit, they'll be very welcome. This is just was my personal choice, so. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so first of all, I'm happy to talk about how we interpreted the task. So we had to come up with two business propositions. And the way we, well, we had a several scoring metrics. But the way we defined it was that you had to enhance revenue, enhance the size of the space for non-space market. And that can either be done within your organization by getting large profits, or if you're acting as a non-profit, that you're acting as an enabler to allow other organizations to have highly enhanced revenues. Uh, so that was the basis of having a business, which is to gather, and a non-profit, which is Space Race. So that's why we were talking about business and not business. We have one business, one non-profit. Coming to the question of how the non-profit is financed, so there's two stages. The first stage is when it's building the community. So as we said, the whole business model relies on building a space applications community, as Kaggle did. And this is for... Um, yeah, so this is for, uh, the, yeah, this is going to be funded ideally through government grants and it's going to be small scale at first. It's only going to require about five employees and we're thinking for a period about five years you can use an incubator. Then for the sustainability element of the nonprofit, 
like Kaggle, it's going to be funded from the competitions. So once you have your community, you monetize it. So we have private, uh, private companies sponsor competitions on the site. Uh, they'll post a problem saying, can the community solve this? And we'll take a fee from their posting the competitions. Uh, does that solve your question? It is a very good answer. It is uh, uh, answering the question. Uh, I, I sometimes wonder if you also thought about companies like Amazon being interested in creating a market and therefore supporting the nonprofit rather than the agencies. So this was actually a part of both. But uh, Shen Hav really wants to talk about this one, so I'll pass it to Shen Hav. If they want, I will really, really, really uh, be happy. I mean, yes. <laughs> Whoever wants to contribute, yes, let's do it. I, I can add the details. Uh, yeah, so we did uh, kindly get details from uh, Raphael about the potential partnerships that AWS can do with businesses. So for Space Race, we were planning on a part of the functions would be for prospective startups to pass their profiles to us, which we could then pass on to AWS to potentially get s some, of the, uh, some of the benefits, because especially they'd be focused in the big data area, which is very relevant to AWS. Uh, there is actually a marketplace. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing we're doing. Yeah, so spot on. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have okay, another. Uh, that was a very concise and very constructive answer. Thank you very much for that. That enlightens me a lot. Thank you, Walter. We have a question from Jorge Pimenta. Um, how can education play a role in bridging this gap? Any ideas to disseminate skills, know how, and create new solutions to Earth applications use cases? So, how can education play a role in all of this? How can education play a role in bridging this gap? Okay. So I will take this question because I'm actually going to do a really short uh, answer. As a PhD student, I registered to go into basic schools, primary schools, and high schools to talk about what a PhD student is and what I'm doing in space. And I think that it starts not only by professionals going into schools and um, introducing themselves, but also by the professors themselves and the curriculum to talk more about space, as in doing, since basic school, basic definitions of the terms. What is a satellite? How do we function with internet on Earth? Because, for example, the generation, generation, generation Z is already uh, connected every time and Maybe they don't know how or why, but for that we can use the curriculum in basic school to help them. And after that, just interactions with professionals as much as possible so that you can know how to become a scientist, a satellite manufacturer, a test engineer, whatever you want. Because if you don't know that there are the possibilities, then you won't be able to access them. Does that answer? I, well, I can ask does that answer the question, but uh, it wasn't all my uh, question. Okay. Is so that it? just uh, a comment and to, to, to finalize, sorry. Uh, you. As you know, this was one of the team projects uh, suggested by the local organizing committee uh, to address a national issue or a point that we wanted to connect space with non-space. Uh, I see that you are 22, so we could go at least 22 different ways because it's a very broad uh, subject. Uh, so we want to thank you for all your effort. I, we know that this was uh, very, very tough, but it's also in the, when you have difficulties that we grow the most. And uh, we want to thank you and also to all the chairs uh, for all the work. It was uh, very well done and we want to thank you very, very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our first uh, presentation for the day. Uh, so once again, I would like all the, uh, congratulate all the team. And once again, please give them a big, big applause for the team to work nine weeks on this project and their chairs. Great job. So, we will have a half an hour break now, and at 10.40 Portugal time, we will meet again for our second presentation of today, which will be Team Bixia will be on stage, and they will be talking about international cooperation on the use of the Chinese space station. So, 
Stay online. See you in 30 minutes.
We need all of these pictures. One, two, one. Yeah, it works, I think. Okay, but did you get it from him because he changed the batteries? I got it from you. Um, Hello? Hello, hello? Let's try it. Mm, Testing? Okay, I can hear me. Testing, yeah. I think it's working, yeah. Okay. Leonard, we only have 30 seconds and then we are going live. So everybody has to get ready. Pete, do we have a go for the sound?
No, no, it's not your part. Yeah, but we need we to have time. We are go for sound. Do we have a go for light? We are go for lights. Okay. Then our item, news item, will start in five, four, three, two. Are you ready? Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful morning because we have a fantastic special show to for you today. Uh, please give a warm welcome to our two guest hosts, Josefina and Claudia. I'm going to say to the audience, hey, people, are you ready for this amazing Guardian show? Wait, do we have a go for sound? Do we have to go for the lights? Do we have to go for the stream?
hear me? Okay. Claudia. to go to a first date with you and see a rocket launch, it's amazing.
All right, please take your seats. We are kicking off in a couple of seconds. No. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for the second presentation of the day. So now we are moving into space, indeed, into orbit. So our next team today presenting is Team Bixia. And their topic is the international cooperation on the use of the Chinese space station. So to introduce uh, this team project, I would like to call on stage one of the co-chairs of the project, Professor Sung Gongling, who is uh, a member of the ISU resident faculty, and also another member of the team, the other co-chair of the project, is uh, joining us virtually online from China, Professor uh, Dr. Yang Yang, who is the director of international cooperation in the China Academy of Sciences. So, Gongling. Uh, please introduce the team and your vision and what happened in the last nine weeks. Okay, thank you good for your kind introduction. My name is Gongin San and uh, I'm the faculty member of ISU and uh, faculty leading for the um, business and management. And before I joined ISU, I also very uh, honored
honored to have a chance to work in, in the China Home and Space Flight Program. And, uh, and I don't want to talk anything about the content because I want to keep one minute more and the presentation in mystery. And I just uh, take this opportunity to make an introduction about uh, the current situation for the Chinese space station. And uh, it's in the last phase. And uh, it's, uh, was it before, by the end of this year, we are going to finish the final uh, implementation of the state station. And uh, five, uh, three flights left. And the final module is uh, shipped to the uh, launch center in south of China. And uh, it's ready for launch afterwards. And they are going to launch another cargo ship and for the uh, mainly for the for the payload supply and also the logistics supply for the coming um, teams and uh, for the operation. I think it's the right time and for this team project and for the uh, international cooperation on the use of the Chinese space station. And because of the, the the space station will be put into use and, uh, and by the beginning of next year. And the team working very hard in the past uh, three weeks. And uh, in you will see the results uh, shortly. And, uh, and also, we are very lucky and have um, 23 participants from more than 17 countries. Hopefully, they can bring the idea the methodology back to their home. And in the future, we can see more ISU phase in our in Chinese space uh, 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 station. and. Uh, I now I give the I, I was uh, in, the, in the stage similar like this one 24 years before. I know the feeling and for our team and now I give the stage back to them. A food for a day on Earth costs 10 euros. To send the same amount to space, it costs 10,000 euros. So instead of delivering the food from Earth, we want to grow it in space. And the best way to do this is by reusing and recycling every bit of organic waste. We use the recycled material as a biostimulant, but it acts on the plant as a fertilizer. This is how we can create a self-sustaining ecosystem and grow the food in space. Our solution is a system that is using supercritical CO2 to boil, pressurize and extract nutrients from algae directly in space and use that for the next generations of plants. To we have professionals from different countries, different backgrounds grouped together with a mutual dream to extend the life in space. We have read, researched and consulted with experts from all over the world in order to find an efficient method of recycling every single drop of organic matter in space. We aim to fly this scientific experiment aboard of the Chinese space station as part of a scientific international cooperation. We want all the world to know about it, so we have created an outreach program for everyone. We are standing on the precipice, looking into the infinite opportunities of becoming a space-faring species. The coming decade will mark the end of an era as the International Space Station prepares to be decommissioned. But we now have a template for sustained, continued, on-orbit human operations from decades of conducting science experiments in microgravity. This knowledge will usher in a new wave of innovation, exploration, 
and economic growth. That is the power of science. The visibility of this on-orbit research has seduced a generation into pursuing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics with passion, with vigor. That is the power of communication, of outreach. The allure of space exploration continues to draw in more and more people from around the world, and it is increasingly international and intercultural. More than 30 science experiments are going to fly on the Chinese space station by the end of the year after successful assembly of the station in orbit. The world now has a new place to continue exploring ideas, asking questions and experimenting in a way that not too long ago was considered impossible for far too many reasons. The Chinese Space Station Team Project has proposed a research project that serves as a backdrop to the framework for future international cooperation with organizations around the world. We have chosen to focus on the importance of both science and the communication of science. There are challenges to humanity living in space. So one of the focus areas of our project work has been supercritical carbon dioxide and how it may be applied to self-sustaining ecosystems, unlocking long-term, off-world, human, sustained human spaceflight. An exciting future. There are global challenges to understanding the importance of science research in space. Discovery alone is not enough. We must bring others with us along on this journey. If not their bodies, then bring with us their hearts, their minds. We must inspire creativity. We must inspire curiosity, because curiosity leads to excitement, which unlocks engagement. And engagement leads to investment, intellectual investment and financial. If we want to reach for the future that we aspire to, we must fuel the hearts and minds of the next generation. The Chinese Space Station Team Project aspires to a self-sustaining ecosystem and unlocking long-term human spaceflight. We have reached into Chinese mythology for inspiration on naming our team project. Goddess of the morning clouds, sovereign of the clouds of dawn, Bisha, Chinese goddess of Mount Tai, of destiny, of birth. <coughs> Bisha is the chosen name of the Chinese space station team project. She was born daughter of commoners, but rose to oversee destiny, birth, and even the rise of dawn. The Chinese Space Station Team Project is sponsored by the Technology and Engineering Center for Space Utilization of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Mythology holds an important place in Chinese history and culture. We wanted to recognize that importance by using our project to bring to the foreground Bisha, the Chinese goddess of destiny, of birth as we believe she represents the essence of our project, self-sustaining ecosystems and long-term sustained human spaceflight. The Chinese Space Station Team Project is brought to you today in presentation form by a fictional television network called BTP. We've chosen this particular format as it represents media a core element of our outreach initiatives. In Act One, you will see a news broadcast that is intended to capture our research initiatives. 
In Act 2, it will cover our outreach initiatives, and it will be represented by showing you a TV show being filmed in front of a live studio audience. That's you. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> the science is absolutely critically important. It's super critical. But the outreach is just as critical. And so in trying to address the challenges around communicating with a global audience, using media, we've chosen to use news and entertainment, not only hoping that it's an entertainment for all of you here today, but as an example of what could be used in outreach for science research. It is time for us to reach out to the hearts and minds of the next generation. Science is all around us. It's pervasive. All it needs is a medium. What is that medium for you? What is that medium for the person next to you? Or for others around the world? After all, science knows no bounds other than the infinite opportunities of space. So BTP is going to air in 30 seconds. Paige, do we have a go for lights? We have a go for lights. Do we have a go for the sound? We have a go for sound. Sound check, one, two, three, am I good? Okay, we go to air in five, four, three, two. Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of BTP News. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Leonard. You've heard me talk at length about space stations over the last few months. Tonight is gonna be another one of those. I've spoken about the International Space Station a product of decades of hard research, work, and commitment from organizations and countries around the world. Over the coming decade, we will see it decommission. I've spoken about the upcoming commercial space stations looking to come online over the coming period. But tonight's feature is the Chinese space station, or the Tiangong space station, literally meaning palace in the skies. But what, one, what would one do in palace in the skies? Tonight, we'll find out as we interview Madin, Mission Manager for Bisha, and also Mayresh, Lead Engineer. Thank you for joining on the show this evening. Thank you, Leonard. It's been a while. Thank you, Leonard. Wonderful to have you back. Now, it's been a little bit since we were last here together. Thank you for coming back on the show again. It's great to hear that you've been confirmed now as flying on the Chinese Space Station in two months' time. Very excited for you. But this is the Chinese Space Station that has been confirmed for now. Madin, I know that you are from the Maldives. Are you also from China? Is this a Chinese-only mission that will be flying to the space station? That's a very good question, Leonard. Um, no, I'm not Chinese, and I'm not from China. Uh, but this is indeed an international project. So although it's being held in the Chinese space station, the project is really in order to promote international cooperation on the space station. Um, and to that extent, this project is based on the legal framework that's provided by the UN on the use of the Chinese space station, so UNUSA and the Chinese space station. Um, and, and really, the purpose of this project is to provide a scientific mission that can also act as a backbone for future cooperation on the Chinese space station. Okay, fantastic. So it's wonderful to hear that you're using an existing international framework as the anchor point for cooperating on the Chinese space station. I remember hearing about this uh, not too long ago, actually. Uh, a feed popped up on my Instagram it was actually from a brand new influencer who only opened up an Instagram account one week ago. And it pointed me to a website, and it covered the self-sustaining ecosystem. That was the biggest takeaway from me on the website. What is that? That sounds like a giant terrarium that people live in. Well, that's a very good analogy, um, Leonard. But however, it's not entirely a terrarium. Um, what self-sustaining ecosystems mean in, in our context um, is essentially the need for an ecosystem that can sustain humans in planets like Mars, for example, uh, or even bases on the moon. Uh, and, and this is a very important topic that is not addressed as often 
as we speak about extending humans far beyond our planet. Um, and one of the challenges you have when you send humans to the far reaches of the solar system even, is that you have to send them food. And um, you can't possibly plan on shipping containers of food from the Earth to Mars when it takes six months to a year to get there. And so self-sustaining ecosystems essentially is the use of waste produced from one part of the system that can then feed another part of the system and grow the food that humans need to survive. I see. So taking along with humans the environment that, a portion of the environment that we live in here on Earth in order to sustain for extended periods in space. So does that mean this is your mission? It sounds like self-sustaining ecosystems would be an enabler or a requirement for future missions. But is it your actual mission this time to create a self-sustaining ecosystem? Well, no. In this case, um, we're actually taking the first step towards this. Um, so in order to actually help grow efficient self-sustaining ecosystems, so in the case of a space station, you call them controlled ecological life support systems, which is a technical term for exactly what we just discussed. Um, one of the challenges in, in the space station or space environment is that you don't have a fast enough or an efficient enough way of transferring nutrients from bio waste into the nutrients you need to grow. Um, so traditionally speaking, how, the, how nature works is by organic decay from bacteria and other microbes. But on a space station, you can imagine you, you, it doesn't happen fast enough to provide the necessary oxygen or the food that we need. Uh, and so Bishia is really about focusing on that one aspect, nutrient transfer cycles in a self-sustaining ecosystem. And we have a really exciting um, experiment that we're going to fly there. And, and really, the goal is to use something really cool in order to see whether it can extract these nutrients faster from bio waste and then deliver it to the plants that we need to grow for humans. Fantastic. Now, I noticed you mentioned the, the, the research there that you're doing at a technical level. We have Ratem, one of our field reporters, who will be in the laboratory with some of your engineers interviewing them shortly. But before we dive into the technical aspects, you said there was a challenge with being efficient with extraction and delivering of nutrients. Is it more challenging in space? Is it easier in space? Uh, or is it unknown? How are you doing that more efficiently? Well, that's a great question, Leonard. And that's actually one of the objectives of our experiment. So we're trying to use supercritical fluids. You must have heard from our Instagram feed, for example. Um, and supercritical fluids are a very exciting area of um, um, physical sciences, uh, physics sciences. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to see if in microgravity these supercritical fluids behave in a, in a different way, specifically supercritical carbon dioxide, which is what we're using. And, and really the goal is to observe how they extract in microgravity. We know that they are really good at extracting in, on Earth, and we want to extend that to microgravity in the Chinese space station. And really observe how do they do that, and if they do it better, then that's really exciting. Fantastic. I was actually quite impressed that I got this on my Instagram feed as just an everyday person. Can you talk to me more about the outreach program that you have for the project? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the result of the outreach program is the fact that you saw this. Um, so I think, I think it's working really well. Um, and outreach is a very key component to our mission. Um, as you can imagine, we're talking about supercritical fluids and controlled ecological life support systems. And these are really technical jargon that the everyday person may not fully comprehend. And um, since we're trying to promote the international cooperation on the Chinese space station, and since self-sustaining ecosystems are a problem that all nations must gather together to actually solve, um, we thought it was very important that we must communicate this effectively to even a child who's in school. And to that extent, we've created this really amazing outreach program that has a website that includes a live stream of the, of the plant growth chamber will be uh, up in space. And also, we have this exciting gardening show that's going to really illustrate the, um, the, the, the concepts that I'm here discussing in technical jargon. Um, so I think, I think you'll be seeing it sometime um, on your Instagram feed again. But it is very exciting, and it is a key component of our mission. Well, there you have it. If you're wanting to achieve international cooperation, you need to reach the widest audience possible. And you'll need to use the most accessible language available to connect with that audience. Ratem, I'll hand it over to you in the field. Thank you, Leona. We are here with our expert, Mr. Padmahaban and Mr. Florin. I wanted to ask you guys, why did we use supercritical fluid to our payload, Tiny Earth? Thank you, welcome for the interview. We have selected the supercritical CO2 for our payload because supercritical CO2 is an excellent solvent which can dissolve biomass which is generated on the space station and it can produce nutrients from the biomass. Second thing is that it is non-toxic and non-flammable. Third thing is that it's the most important thing, 
it is having a lower critical pressure and temperature at which CO2 can be converted into supercritical. Based on these reasons only, we have selected supercritical CO2 for our payment. This is a perfect answer, Mr. Padmahaban. Thank you very much. Mr. Florin, what are the experiments planned in the Tiny Earth payload? So the Tiny Earth payload is designed to demonstrate the sustainable life support system in space. And what is very interesting about this payload is that it's not just one system, but actually it's formed by three components, each of them in charge for one specific and independent experiment. First, we have a high pressure, high temperature cell where the supercritical CO2 will be produced. Second, we move to the extraction chamber where together with the supercritical CO2, we will be adding the algaes and we'll extract the nutrients. And lastly, we have a plant grow chamber where we will try to grow rice and use our nutrients to stimulate the growth of this rice in space. Thank you very much. <laughs> Why did we shake hands? I don't know. Why not? The life support system looks really amazing. Can you share with us a little bit more about the design? Yeah. The following design consideration we have taken for designing the payload. Basically, they are mass, power, and interface requirements of the space station. Corinne, can you please elaborate further? Yes. Uh, besides the considerations coming from the space station, we have also take into account the conditions of microgravity and our experiments so we had to take into account um, the need to have very very precise control of the temperature and, uh, and pressure so we were looking at the two-stage thermostats thank you very much guys thank you thank you for having us on Rotem, thank you for reporting to us from the field so I heard Tiny Earth mentioned. Can you tell me what that is? What is, what is it that the payload is? Um, thank you, Leonard. Uh, yes, Tiny Earth is the name of the payload, um, but we have Myresh here, who's the head of our engineering um, part of the mission, and I think he's the best person to explain to us what is Tiny Earth. Thanks, Madin, Leonard. Uh, before I explain Tiny Earth payload, can I get some supercritical fluid? It is right over there. Yeah. Thank you. Big gulp. Yeah, thank you. So as the name suggests, Tiny Earth, isn't it a cool name? It's a very cool logo over here. Yeah. So this Tiny Earth payload, it, it is basically a payload to be given on a space station and interfacing with the space station rack. It is having two different systems. First system is a nutrient extraction chamber, and another is a plant growth unit. Whatever you see over here is a nutrient extraction chamber. It consists of two subsystems. First system is for manufacturing of supercritical CO2, uh, which is produced by using pump and a heat exchanger unit. Upon production of supercritical CO2, it will be sent to the algae chamber, where a 100 gram or so algae will be available and which will be dissolved, as uh, our previous video has uh, told. Supercritical CO2 dissolves all the organic matter very efficiently. So upon complete solubility, it will be passed further to the extraction chamber, and there comes the extractor where you can extract all the bio nutrients uh, which will be fed to the plant growth chamber and hence we will be growing the plants by using that nutrients so that is all about the payload okay i think that made sense i'm a simple man but i think i understood you'll take carbon dioxide increase the temperature increase the pressure produce supercritical carbon dioxide use that then to dissolve algae that can then have nutrients extracted from it and then given to plants uh, that, seems like I, that seems like it's understandable, except for the supercritical part. When I hear supercritical, I think of my strict high school teachers, and it makes me feel a little anxious. Can you talk to me about what supercritical fluids are? Yeah, welcome to the area of supercritical fluid. It's definitely a very, very fascinating research. And most of the audience may be knowing there are three phases of matter on Earth, solid, liquid, and gas. Basically, all these phases are due to the intermolecular attraction between them. When it comes to solid, they have definite size, shape. When it is liquid, when you are pouring in a container, it is having a definite volume, but it takes the shape of the container. And when it is gas, it takes the shape as well as size of the container. But then, let us do one thought experiment. Let us pour some water in a container, a small container, and put on a burner. Let us heat, it, heat that. 
what will happen water will be slowly getting converted to the vapor so there will be two phases water and vapor let us close try to close that container so what will happen is pressure and temperature will go on increasing and there will be a condition where there won't be any distinction between liquid and uh, liquid and gaseous phase so it will be a single interesting phase called supercritical phase and when we are talking about our experiment when we are talking about supercritical co2 the conditions are something like 70 bar that is 70 times of the earth's atmosphere and 32 degrees centigrade pretty like our body temperature so 70 bar and 32 degrees centigrade is what we are having in our experiment okay that makes sense also supercritical fluids can behave as both a liquid and a gas simultaneously and they can do a number of things like say dissolve algae and other biomatter uh, but what else can they do? Why is this something that we should care about? Help our viewers understand. Yeah, so they have many, many applications on day-to-day -day Earth life. As we said earlier, they have a very potential application for taking humanity to the long-term space flights. That is called CELSS. Other than that, we can use them for precision, uh, like improved farming. We, we can extract the nutrients out of the algae and um, we can improve the fertilizers. We can yield the, we can improve the yield of the agriculture. We can also use them in a waste water treatments. So that is one of the nice application from supercritical water or CO2. Also, it can be used in pharmaceutical industries and we can have very uh, cheaper, cheaper medicines. It can also be used for power plants where you can use these denser supercritical fluids compared to the gases. And we can have a very small turbines and we ca it will result in a very, uh, very lower capital cost. And just an interesting point, Planets very near to Earth, like Venus, have a supercritical environment. Fantastic. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear of all the different uses that supercritical fluids can have. Maybe not a readily understood term, but applications across healthcare, medicine, pharmacology, energy generation, power generation, and even manufacturing. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on the show this afternoon, Madin and Mayuresh. Thank you. Fantastic overview of the Bisha mission that we've just had from Madin, the mission manager, and also Mayoresh, the lead engineer. Up next, we have a special interview for you. It's with Felipe Senra, an astronaut who is going to be flying with the mission payload on the upcoming launch in two months' time to the Chinese space station. He's had a marvelous career so far, and this is his first space, first space flight. Would you all please welcome Felipe. Thank you for joining us in the studio. Thank you, Leonard. I feel honored to be invited. So can you walk us through the link here, please, around the mission, around space flight, around the Chinese space station, and what it is trying to achieve? So the link between the, the experiment, uh, the two parts of the experiment, is basically me. So I'm the human interface. Um, I will be collecting the, 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 the product from the first part of the experiment, which are nutrient, nutrients extracted from supercritical CO2, and I'll be... Uh, applying it to the, the plants that we are growing at the CSS. Okay, fantastic. So you're going to be growing plants as part of this experiment based on the nutrients that you'll be getting from the algae or the biomass that you'll be absorbing. What plants in particular are you growing? So uh, we've chosen uh, rice plants and bean plants. Uh, those, uh, that choice was made uh, based on uh, that those two types of plants were alre already grown in space and also they are good food sources, like uh, rice is a good f source of carbohydrates and beans a uh, good source of protein. Fantastic, so rice and beans are the two plants you'll be growing with the nutrients from the experiment. And which do you prefer, rice or beans? As much as I like rice, um, if I want to maintain my muscle in space, I have to go with protein. Go for protein, I see. If there's a choice, I'd love to have both of them, but sometimes we can only have one side. The two of them, are you comparing them to each other or are you going to be comparing them to another baseline? So interesting question. Um, um, we are going to uh, not compete between the two, pl the two types of plants. We are going to compete um, uh, between three samples of the same plants. So we have the first one, which is the one with, uh, we are going to use with uh, nutrients extracted from supercritical CO2, our experiment. And then we are going to compare them against um, one with using normal fertilizer grown on Earth and one with no fertilizer at all. And we're going to see how they grow and compare them. It's basically going to be like a, a space race, but with plants in a space. A space race with plants in space. Quite memorable. 
And so we were hearing talk about these uh, ecological life support systems. Uh, can you talk us through those? Is this one one that requires you, a human, to intervene? Or what does one look like if it's fully, fully controlled? So basically, uh, this is Bisha One mission. So it's not a, a fully closed ecosystem, uh, as, of course, I'm the interface. So it's uh, an open system. But our uh, most more ambitious goal is to uh, basically fully validate a fully closed ecosystem. And that way, we can aid humans in, in long-term human space flight. That makes sense. Of course, we need to try it first at a smaller scale to demonstrate the technology before we do it at scale in a fully controlled environment. And of course, it's a great excuse for an astronaut to fly with a payload as well. Felipe, this is your first mission to space. How has the journey been for you so far? And have there been any critical or defining moments, moments for you on your journey? Oh, so uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's been a long journey, a lot of hard work. Uh, training is very interesting, very fun. Um, but also thanks to uh, a lot of international intercultural and interdisciplinary, uh, <laughs> interdisciplinary uh, environment. So this environment is, uh, goes very hand to hand with a, a program that I did uh, a while ago, uh, which is called the SSP. And this is where I found all of the connections I needed and opened a lot of doors to me. And without it, I wouldn't be here. You've opened a fantastic door for yourself, becoming an astronaut and flying to space. And I'm sure many, many more will continue to be open for you in the future. You have such a wonderful experience and background, Felipe. Thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you for exploring us to the tiny Earth. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Tiny Earth will be flying <laughs> to the Chinese space station in two short months with Felipe on board as the payload specialist. And there you have it. The International Uni Space University Space Studies Program can make dreams come true. Gabor, over to you for a weather report. Thank you, Leonard. This summer is slowly coming to its end, but as we all know, it is always sunny above the clouds. In fact, it is so sunny that in the upcoming weeks, we are going to experience coronal mass ejection that sends electrically charged particles straight from the sun towards the earth at a vicious speed of 1,500 kilometers per second. There is no need for panic. Our expert, James Green, confirmed us that this event cannot reach the critical level. So don't turn off your televisions just yet. Uh, it seems today we were gonna cover some traffic news as well. Our models show that the satellite of the Maldives Space Research Organization, called SmallSat, is on a collision course with the space debris. So, reach out to the operators of SmallSat as soon as you can, so we can avoid this tragic incident. I think that's it for today. Thank you for watching us, and remember, there is no bad space weather, only bad spacecraft coding. Now back to the studio. Gabor, thank you for that weather report. Good to see that there will be lots of sunshine outside. Find yourself a blanket and enjoy a picnic, but watch out for those CMEs and flares. Thank you all for joining this evening's broadcast. You've heard about the Chinese space station and the mission Bisha that will be flying in two short months' time. Keep an eye out for additional updates in our future broadcasts. But for the moment, thank you and good night. I'm very excited for this rocket launch. I told you when we met in the dating app that it's going to be very exciting. <laughs> you have the wine? Yes, but it's, I'm so excited so I forgot to bring cups. Oh no. But Rotem, Rotem is about to start.
Hey, Josefina. Hey, Claudia. Oh, I saw something amazing for our next episode of the gardening TV show. I was with Rotem and we are, were watching TV and we saw a new items about growing plants in space. What? I didn't know that was a thing. Let's work on it. Yeah. So, hello beautiful people. Are you ready? So we have an amazing gardening show for you, but we have to do some, some, sp some spinal checks. So can I ask Paige if she can check the lights? We are go for lights. And how is the sound? We are go for sound. And the live stream, how is that going? The live stream is also a go. And the audience, are you ready? I cannot hear you. Are you ready? So we will be to on the air in 15 seconds. So five, four, three, two. Hello, everyone. Please give a very warm welcome to our special guest host today, Claudia and Josefina. Welcome, welcome, welcome! Hello, Petunias. Welcome to a very special episode of The Gardening Show. Today we're going to talk about a very cool paler called a tiny earth. And today we have two special guests. We have Felipe, an astronaut of the Chinese space station. We made a video yesterday, a video clip with him. And we also have Thibaut, the head of communication for the Bishia mission. But let's start with our astronaut. Let's roll the clip. Yes, I can oh. hear you. Good morning, how are you? Uh, good morning, um, I just woke up because my, my time zone is very different here in, this, in the CSS. Uh, so yes, uh, I just woke up from a nap, ready to work. Oh, perfect. You are in a gardening show. Are you happy? Yes, I really look forward to uh, showing you uh, what, uh, what we are doing here at uh, Chinese space station. Perfect. Can you explain us a bit the experiment and how is your role? What is your role on the Chinese space station? So I, I flew on the Bishia one mission uh, together with the, the tiny Earth experiment, which I will uh, let me just get it right here. Okay, so here it is. Uh, this is only one part of the experiment, which uh, for you guys at, in the gardening show will be the most interesting part. Uh, but it's a two-part experiment, and the first part is uh, where basically I get the nutrients for these plants, and uh, so I take the nutrients which are extracted from the first part uh, using supercritical fluids, which is a very interesting um, compound, and we use it with algae, and we extract the, the, the nutrients, and I, I collect the nutrients and I put them in these tree, uh, these uh, plants, rice and beans, which I, I love, and uh, and I I see them grow in this uh, beautiful garden of Eden in space. Awesome, awesome, awesome! And do you like plants, right? Um, I have to say that when I flew, I was I was more uh, I liked more the engineering part of the of the experiment, but now since I've been with these beautiful plants for uh, over a month, I, I kind of tend to, uh, I'm very fond of them now that I, I have a, a, lo a, a lot of alone time with them. So I spend a lot of time with these babies. <laughs> oh, Felipe, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. Oh, it's uh, always my pleasure to uh, be able to share uh, content with this, uh, with this experiment and because it's not uh, every day that you get to um, share uh, what you do and especially about these kind of experiments which are very interesting and especially into a gardening show which has a lot of uh, a very different audience and a lot of people are not aware that we can still grow stuff in space. Thank you, thank you. Goodbye, Felipe. Goodbye and now I'll, I'll, go, back to, uh, I'll go back to bed. I'll 
send this uh, experiment back into space, not space, but <sighs> micro G. And uh, yes, I'm going back to my nap. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> wow, that was so cool. Uh, I would love to learn more. But we can learn something more because we have a second special guest. Thibaut, please give a big applause. Hello, everyone. Hi, Thibaut. Welcome, welcome. Hello. Nice to see you. Hey, Tutu oh, Bene. Oh, Thibaut. How are you? I am very good. Very happy to be here, engaged with a new audience. See you. It's very, a very good day, but I'm a bit tired. Um, just now I had a big flight. Oh, how come? Where were you? I was in Costa Rica. That's where I'm from. No way. Yes, way. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. I love your country. What were you doing in Costa Rica? So basically with our outreach program, we are trying to um, be inclusive with countries that doesn't have so much um, um, space activities. So I just spent two weeks in Costa Rica, a bit uh, on the beach, but also most importantly working. And I really enjoyed my time there. Amazing. But please um, tell us about yourself. What, what what you do? Yes. Um, so my name is Thibaut. I'm French. Uh, I'm a software engineer by formation. But now I focus on this wonderful mission, Bixia. I'm the head of communication and outreach. So we developed a super big program to, to be able to engage with everyone. We focus on general public, so people that are not um, related to science, that don't really have interest in science. Um, but here we have some um, description of our super cool uh, outreach program. So the first super cool thing is the Tiny Earth Live. Um, I don't know if you saw about our payload, but we have integrated the camera. So it's very a link between engineering and outreach. We integrated the camera in the payload so we can broadcast the live stream of the plants growing. Everyone can see this every day, but it's not um, everything we do. We also have the biggest part of our outreach is the collaboration. Um, we are collaborating with the best TV show possible, the gardening TV shows. Woo! And um, thank, thank you. you for having me here. Um, but this is for general public. Then for the people who are interested in science, we have collaboration with In A Nutshell. It's, um, it's a YouTube channel that do science video with animations for everyone. And then for the children's, we have the life of a plant. It's um, very dedicated to children's with not so much science, just to, to awake the curiosity. Um, Okay, so this is all for the general public, but we also we're also able to reach out to the science people. And for this, we have a website with technology video, infographics, um, and explanations. We have all our payload dedicated there. So this is our website. We have the QR code if you want to to check it. Uh, our landing page is amazing. Big up to the design team; they are just here. Um, so on the website, we first have this. We first have this super cool landing page. Um, in the landing page, the first thing you can see is our um, fantastic mission patch. And then there is also um, a part about the experiments. But it's not so big because we're not trying to focus on experiments. We try to focus on explaining how big our program is because it's not only science. It's also cooperation with the Chinese space station and international cooperation. So there is this small part about the, the experiments, but you can learn more in uh, in a dedicated page on the website if you're into science. Uh, then we have something about education, uh, cooperation, and uh, this is the page on the, the section on the landing page dedicated to education. We can reach to graduate level children. I will show you everything right after. There is a button to, to be able to reach this page as well. Um, so you have programs with kids and Exactly. Students exactly. also. Right after the Chinese space program, I will show you the cooperation part. Okay. Um, we thought it was super important as well to explain to people why are we collaborating with, cooperating with the Chinese space station. So we tried to make some history of the Chinese space program. Um, the ISS will pass away soon, so the only access to microgravity is going to be the Chinese space station. So it's very important that everyone knows about it. Um, then you can reach out to this page uh, on the website as well. It's way bigger. Uh, my favorite part of the outreach is the impact section because it's very a way to show to people there is an impact from space to Earth because the people who are not into science, they don't really understand why are we doing this. So we use the, the sustainable development goals from UNUSA who are, and we identified these four goals, uh, the partnership for the gold. So 
It's interesting that it's a science experiment, but the, most imp the, the biggest goal is the partnerships. We can develop international cooperation, which is not so much developed at the moment with the, the China Space Agency. So we're very happy to merge everyone together through partnerships. We also have the quality education. I will show you right after. Um, basically, all of our gardening show, uh, animated videos on everything. Um, and in the science side, there is the industry, innovation, and infrastructure. We have, so basically, with the supercritical fluids, there's a lot of application in pharmaceutical industry, chemical industry, and these industries can benefit a lot from our experiments, so there's going to be a lot of impacts in there. And for the zero hunger part, it's more in the, the way we grow plants. We are trying to find a new way to grow plants with a new um, nutrients, and it could benefit on Earth, I think, a lot of uh, people. It's like a first step to, to manage zero hunger. Um, I think that's it for I the I really impact. like this part of the program about yeah. impacts, yeah. Which one is your favorite? I think maybe zero hunger. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, a, it's important to take the first step through this kind of big initiative, I think. Very impactful. Yes, yes. Um, don't forget, you can reach out to our website with the QR code. And um, OK, we also have a shop. If you like my shirts, you can get it there. Oh, I love this awesome shirt. Now. I love yeah. this shirt. Big up again to the design, design team. So for the cooperation part, uh, first we mention our education. Once again, we reach out to everyone, students, graduate level, and also uh, the non-STEM public. So here I am in the gardening TV show. We, this is like the cooperation part because we cooperate with uh, entities that already have an audience. Big up to you. And uh, it's really a way to introduce science to a place that there's not so much science in general. Mm -hmm. So Gardening TV Show was a good fit for us. And educational videos, they help to speak to everyone who is a bit more interested in, in science. So we have a partnership with In A Nutshell. They have a super big um, YouTube channel. And, and you have also partnership with Instagram, Facebook, uh, Exactly, TikTok, we have a big yeah. presence on the social media. Okay. Um, I heard last time on the TV that someone uh, so um, this advertisement on Instagram, so I was very happy because our program is working well. And yeah, I mentioned our super cool t-shirt. If you want to have one, feel free to reach, it, uh, to reach out on our website. But this is not the only thing we have, I think. Uh, we also have these wonderful stickers. Oh. And everyone in the audience can have one right after here. So feel free to take one. This one's for you. Thank Big you. up to Costa Rica. And um, the community page is the last important thing. We are trying with the outreach to engage everyone for our program, so we can do this by using polls. And I think I heard about something you did related to this, no? Yeah, yeah. Um, your target audience is the general public, exactly. so uh, we made some interviews in IST and to know what are people's feedback about the wow. program and to know what they want to grow in space. Fantastic, can we so watch this? Yeah, yeah, let, yeah let's watch clips. this. Let's go. <laughs> Before choosing what plant is the best one to send into space, we want to know the public opinion about it. Let's go. Which plant do you want to send into space? Uh, I don't know, cactus maybe. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Tomato for the pizza in space sounds like a great idea. Um, 
It's already soon the lunchtime. I'm super hungry thinking about the pizza. But I think if I had something to send to space would be pineapple to create a real pizza. What do you think about it? Thibaut! <laughs> Thibaut, I am Italian, please. We all make mistakes. I'm Italian. Oh my god. Oh no. Pineapple. No, oh. but well done for this interview. It's, <laughs> oh it's very, very yeah. interesting. And everyone, if you want to engage more with this, we have this website. There is a poll. And you can decide on votes for which plants you which plant is going to be sent in the Bixia 2 mission? Because this one is already is only the first. There's going to be a lot more in our roadmap. But that's it wow. from our outreach. Wow, I can't wait to see what our fans submit. Well, thank you so much, Thibault, for coming here. And remember, if you want to learn more about the Tiny Earth payload, go to the Tiny Earth website, where you can also find a Tiny Earth kit, just like astronaut Philippe's. So you can buy your very own. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Thank you for this special episode, Thibault. It's a thank pleasure. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. And remember to, to water, water your plants. flowers. Good plants. <laughs>
And then we needed to ensure we could communicate that to a broader audience. Outreach without core content isn't outreach. And core content, science discovery, science experimentation, without communication is just as useful as having never been discovered. For us, the two needed to go hand in hand. It was a challenge, but we're incredibly proud of where we landed and how we ended. We are excited about a future where human presence is pushed and projected deeper into space, where that presence is anchored in international cooperation, something that we all believe we experienced in our own ways in our tiny Earth, in our team project. And a presence that's done in a way that inspires and benefits all humankind. So, from the Chinese Space Station team project, thank you. All right, thank you everyone um, in the audience and also online for watching our presentation. Um, now we'll move on to the Q&A part. Uh, so yeah, I would like to invite everyone to ask their questions if they have any. Okay. Um, okay, I think we have some online questions. Uh, yes, we do. We have an online question. Um, how do you connect with the 17 UN exper experiments being prepared for the Tiangong station currently? Um, thank you for that question from online. Um, so perhaps not everyone is familiar, but there was a um, past uh, joint call for proposals done by the UN um, along with the, the Chinese space station. And from there, um, there were actually nine projects selected, I believe. Um, so one main connection we have with them is um, we did follow the guidelines uh, that they also had to follow for this joint call, which was done um, back in 2018. I believe, um, and in this they uh, identified some specific topics uh, that are to be addressed so that are in line with the roadmap of the Chinese space station, so that's definitely a big part of what we took into account when uh, selecting our experiment. Thanks. Uh, okay, any other online questions? Okay, um, I think we have a question on Zoom from Walter Peters. Thank you very much. Uh, and by the way, my congratulations to the team. That was a very nice, fluent presentation, which was easy to follow, self-standing, uh, with, with a good of uh, a good sense of uh, transfer. So that, that was great as a presentation. The one thing I'm missing, if you want to sell this project, is uh, spin-offs. What, what are the spin-offs of your experiment for terrestrial for, for the world for the earth? Uh, what, how can humanity benefit from the result, your scientific results or from your experiments? Can you explain that a little bit? Um, yes, thank you for the question and also for the compliment. Um, so, yeah, I'd invite uh, Mayuresh to talk about that. Actually, we did a, a bit talk on that during the discussion, but again, I'll give some elaborate answer. So there are many spin-offs on the Earth when we see supercritical fluid. And as we know that it is very popular, in uh, it, is, it is very efficient in dissolving all the organic matters. So it can be very well used for wastewater treatment. So we know in, on, in the world, there are a lot of 
pollutions, water pollutions happening. And there are many researches going on towards uh, using supercritical CO2 or supercritical water to dissolve this uh, bio uh, mass wastes and do extraction on a separate extractor and uh, uh, make it more pure. So that is with respect to the water pollution. Again, there is second thing is uh, supercritical CO2 based power plants. So when, when it comes to the power plants, basically supercritical fluid is a denser fluid compared to the gases. Uh, it is uh, having low, lower density with respect to the fluids, uh, liquids of course, but when it comes to the gases, it is having higher density than that. And that makes turbines, pumps, and whole power plant very, very efficient. So these are two applications. Other than that, pharmaceutical, if you see, it is very efficient for extracting the nutrients and making better and cheap medicines. When it comes to uh, the single crystal growths, there, are, there is an area, for example, the uh, super alloys. That is one of the new field. And for super alloys, you need grain boundaryless metals. So there also supercritical CO2 or supercritical fluid can be very well used. So these are some of the potential areas. Thank you very much. That was a very concise and correct answer. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I see another online question from Juan de Domao. Thank you. And uh, I would like to uh, join my colleague uh, Walter Peters on congratulating the team for a, a very well delivered uh, presentation today. I was reading your final report and I liked the section where you describe all the international agreements that China has signed regarding the use of the China Space Station and you develop uh, the biggest ones that are with ESA and uh, with the United Nations, with UNOSA. My question to you is uh, twofold. Um, number one, can you elaborate on who do you see as the main players who will uh, develop and operate your uh, experiment internationally? And number two, um, you have lived in the past nine weeks with a team uh, working on microgravity experiments, TP microgravity. Have you discussed with them whether they would like to fly on the China Space Station? And if yes, what was the conclusion of your discussions? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, for the first one, that was on the international cooperation. Um, and you uh, are asking about the main players that we see involved. So you mentioned that you've read our report. We also have a great stakeholder analysis that was done um, in the introduction or that you can find in the introduction of our report. Um, and there we've also identified internal and external stakeholders. Um, and in a nutshell, I would say the internal stakeholders are the major players that we see involved um, in the project and the actual running of it. Um, and the external stakeholders are kind of like customers and people that will benefit from this project and are involved in some way as well. Um, for the second part of the question, I would like to invite Madden to answer that. Um, yes, uh, so I, some of us actually had a few discussions with TP Microgravity, um, not particularly in the context of whether they want to fly the payload in the Chinese space station because that discussion required a lot more work. Uh, but one of the things that we, we did discuss on in, is how the Tiny Earth experiment can benefit the experiment that the TP microgravity was doing. So we see that our experiments are actually synergistic. The findings that we are going to um, observe from our experiment can actually benefit uh, what they're going to do. But because their, uh, their presentation is the last one today, I don't want to spoil what they're trying to do. Um, but um, to answer your question, yes, we did discuss with them. Um, but simply in the, in the interest of the um, feasibility and practicality, we kept our discussions purely in the scientific aspects. Thank you, Menon. Thank you very much. Um, OK, I think we have a question in the audience. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was <clears throat> indeed really good. 
And uh, I have, uh, again, sorry for that, but two parts of questions. First of one is interoperability. Uh, we know that, talking about the experiment now, uh, we know the International Space Station or the Chinese Space Station, it's a teeny tiny space. So we have to take advantage of every single experiment. And uh, we know, for instance, from the past, uh, space, space exploration, uh, fuel cells have been used with water, and then the water was mixed with some nutrients to feed the astronauts. What is the interoperability that you see with your uh, residues of your experiment? Because you're making something, you're mo modifying something. What are the kind of interoperability that you expect from your experiment? And the second one will be scalability. So I'm, again, I'm pushing beyond the space station. What about uh, colonizing Mars or so? Well, certainly, humankind is trying to push this way. So do you think of this kind of experiment is scalable? Can we increase? Can we make it? Uh, commercial in the future way, especially coming from a country where we feed the world. <laughs> it's important to us know if we are going to have competitors in Mars. Um, all right, thank you for the question. Um, so the first part was on the interoperability um, between different elements in the um, uh, space station, and then the second part was on the scalability, also not considering just the space station, but uh, perhaps beyond that, uh, on subsequent missions on other planets. Um, so uh, to keep it short, I would say that for interoperability, that's definitely a big part of the CELSS concept that we've outlined, and that's the main idea behind it, to involve other parts of the space station, so waste and water management and things like that. Um, and for the scalability as well, uh, we've outlined our own roadmap um, in which we grow actually from the tiny Earth payload um, onto first from open loop to closed loop and then actually a full scale CLSS on the space station starting for one crew member and then um, up to seven crew members. So that's kind of on the scale of the space station itself, how we're planning on um, scaling it up. And from there we could see how we enlarge that for yeah even larger settlements. Um, I don't know if uh, any of our technical team wants to add anything. All right. Um, okay, any more questions? All right. Thank you. Um, I'm Manuel Wilhelm from the Portuguese Space Agency, and um, also from my side, thank you uh, so much for your talk. It was really well done. Um, my question and um, is on more on the technical side. And when you described your experiment and you showed the process, you m described it so well, it almost seemed easy, right? So um, I, I suppose it's not that easy as you made it seem. So maybe you can comment uh, a little bit on what do you think is the greatest uh, challenge from a technical point of view to actually make it work? And is there any risk that your experiment might fail? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I think uh, Mayoresh can grab this one. It is really nice question. And uh, for that, when we, are, when we have designed the payload, we have also done the uh, engineering side risk analysis, uh, as you rightly mentioned. And there were many factors considered. First of all, while designing the payload, we have taken into account the uh, interfaces and all those constraints, power requirements. With that, it was uh, the payload design was done. And when the actual payload uh, design process we started, uh, we, uh, th there were certain failure modes, like whether really can we make supercritical CO2 on microgravity environment? Because we found very uh, few research papers on it. People have tried with supercritical water, but with respect to CO2, yes, that is one of the risk factor. But towards that, we had some mitigation plans. Like uh, when we talk about supercritical CO2, there are certain things like uh, uh, measuring. Th there is an interesting point, point called critical point. 
over over where you have to play with so we have to play with the viscosity densities and uh, under microgravity and uh, there, there are uh, uh, there, there is a research required on that point and yes our big shaft one mission there are three objectives in which one of the objective is making supercritical fluid fluid co2 itself and studying the co2 environment how the how it behaves in microgravity environment so that is one part of it second part was like when you use this supercritical co2 and you put it into algae chamber and then what next so there comes a sensitivity analysis so there are sensitivity parameters like with respect to what kind of pressures and temperatures even though supercritical co2 gets produced at 70 bar 30 degree centigrade but it can if if you go more and more on pressure and temperature side still you can have supercritical phase and uh, you can have better nutrients at certain pressures and temperature range so yes we we have to do sensitivity analysis on that side so that also is a part of the biksha one mission so having done biksha one mission and having uh, constra uh, having fixed down the parameters so we can go to the biksha two where we will be having closed loop without philippe the astronaut interference in between so it will be a closed loop terrarium where we will be taking co2 from the plants and we will be taking back to the supercritical uh, we will be generating back and it will be a close running plant and when we go further it will be a as uh, Gillian has mentioned earlier it will be a complete closed loop CLSS environment so we have considered all those uh, risk analysis during the design uh, to add to that during uh, our payload design we had we faced uh, a, a kind of a challenge which was uh, the interface between the the two payloads uh, basically the way we extract the we collect the nutrients so that the astronaut can transfer it to the plants it's like how are we going to because we don't have microgravity the nutrients don't like fall from the the payload onto a container so we need to find like a a way from suction or pressure something like that to collect them and transfer transfer them to the nutrients to the plants yeah, uh, the question is uh, risk, how we are going to mitigate the risk. Uh, coming to the point risk, uh, uh, thing is that the technology, or uh, using CO2 for extracting bionutrients from algae is already been established on Earth. So, uh, so it is uh, proven on Earth, the only risk what we have, that is space is a lot of unknown unknowns. So basically, we think microgravity uh, uh, may have some influence on our uh, extraction process or attaining the supercritical phase of CO2. So, uh, so we want to experiment or we want to uh, demonstrate the technology. So what we have done is that we are planning to do sensitivity analysis. We will try different parameters and try which is the most optimum one and we will mitigate our risk. Anyway, it is always better to take a risk. Not taking risk is the bigger risk. So we will go for that risk. Thank you. Thank you, hope that answers the question. Um, all right, do we have any more questions? Uh, maybe online? I can't see, so. Okay, not online. Um, okay, we have one on Zoom. Is that a clap or a hand that's up? <laughs> um, Walter Peters, do you have a question? Oh well, yes, if I have the opportunity, I'm just curious. Uh, I saw the different versions of your report and very interesting to see the changes. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like the first cost estimate that you made for the experiment was based upon doing it in China. The second cost estimate was based upon doing it somewhere else because there were quite some differences. Um, what is the basis now of your cost estimate? Where are you going to do the experiment or produce the experiment? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, I'm not entirely aware of the cost estimate from the first version, but for the final version, um, we've taken different inputs. Um, for example, from salaries, I believe we consider um, engineers from Germany. Um, for marketing, we've also consulted with specific experts from around the world, so we've tailored it a bit to each of the needs of the different parts of the mission. Um, for yeah, parts and components, we've also done a bit of a market analysis to see what um, yeah, these different costs would be that are yeah, available everywhere. And um, yeah, once again, it is a, 
quite internationally cooperative mission, not only in the nature of um, yeah, cooperating with the Chinese space station, but also the members of the team and the partners that we plan to work with, um, both for science and outreach. So it's a bit of a mix of um, many different places. No, the, the cost estimate in the final version is, uh, is, is clear, is good. Uh, nothing to say about it. I was a little bit surprised about the jump between what I saw in previous versions, which was, to say the least, very low. Um, yeah, uh, once again, I am not fully familiar with the first version, but um, also something that we've learned about international cooperation, especially under the frameworks that we've taken as examples, so the one from ESA and the UN, um, there's not necessarily a direct transfer of funds between different parties, um, so that's what's agreed upon in the cooperation. Uh, so the part that you mentioned about executing or perhaps producing everything in China, that was not really um, yeah, uh, our intention, I would say. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Was our report that clear that there's no more questions? <laughs> Thank you. All right, so thank you very much once again, Team Bixia or Riksha, International Corporation on the Use of Chinese Space Station. I would like to also take this opportunity to thank once again our sponsor for this team project, the Chinese uh, National Space Administration. So thank you very much for sponsoring this project. So we are halfway of our day today. Uh, we have we had two presentations and we have two more presentations to go. So now we will take a one hour break and in one hour we will be back here and online obviously and team um, Orcas will be with us next, uh, talking about space, climate, ocean interactions. In one hour, see you again soon. Take care.
look at it. I'll Perfect. just put this. <coughs> Hello. Okay, please take your seats. We are kicking off in 30 seconds. Please take your seats. Welcome back to the afternoon session of the Team Project Presentations. So we are now continuing with our third Team Project of the day. Who were looking into space, climate, ocean interactions and as they call themselves Team Orcas. So this team has been led by also three experts. So the chair of the team project himself is indeed an ISU alumnus from SSB program, SSB 2010, Jan Walter Schroeder. So he's the managing director of Europe of the Sistener Industries and also the CEO of Sensoa GmbH. Uh, so we also had two associate chairs who were helping uh, Jan Walter on this project. So Joao Jesus, uh, a local uh, from Portugal, and he is the project developer of the Atlantic uh, uh, Center, Research Center, Air Center, uh, also in Portugal, and uh, Koichi Arakana, who is joining us from JAXA, from Japan, for this project as well. So uh, the team informed me that uh, they will invite the chairs later uh, onto the stage, so I'm not inviting them. I just uh, wish you have fun with this third team project. Give them a big applause. Together with my co-chairs Joao and Kyocho, who is joining us online, and also our TA um, uh, Adolfo, we had the pleasure to work with 23 very incredible individuals for the last nine weeks. What a journey. It wouldn't be possible with the help of ISU staff. I'm very thankful for all the support we had. Also, uh, people who support us externally, um, namely Stephanie, June, and um, also... What's that? What? Eve, yes, as well, for the final presentation. But also the external uh, reviewers and examiners who took their time to give us very valuable feedback. So we're very thankful for that. Obrigado. Um, the, uh, the TP Ocean had the very interesting objectives to research space, climate, ocean interactions. So oceans are the birthplace of our species and very important to our survival. And uh, that's exactly what they did. They were looking into um, a international satellite constellation and how it could support an ecosystem that supports or that is um, around the oceans, especially the Atlantic Ocean. So a great work that was done because they have produced a brilliant final report and an executive summary and the presentation that you will see in a bit. And the, uh, the stakeholder for this, um, for their project were um, associations or institutions that would care about the oceans and would look into research but also usage of the oceans. And we have one here on stage representing the Air Center. I give the mic to Joao. Yeah. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as Walter mentioned, I'm Joao and I'm from the Atlantic International Research Center, the Air Center. 
and being with this amazing group of 23 people for the past nine weeks, having seen their work, we're already very impressed and hopefully and surely all their work will be put to very much good use and even a better one after people actually come back from holidays. But and, uh, we will also work with the report, the executive summary to engage with policymakers to bring their conclusions, their recommendations to the best fruition possible. We are now going to give the floor to the team orcas for their for them to show us their amazing voyage. Uh, so keep it, bring it together and give your support to Team Orcas. All right, thank you, Walter and Joao, and welcome everybody to the TP Ocean final presentation, or should I better say the TP Ocean final stage play. Before we start with the main part of this stage play, uh, I want to take a minute to familiarize you with what is going to happen on this stage in the next 60 minutes. My lovely colleague Sejal and I have had the honor to be uh, the final presentation leaders and we started with uh, developing the concept no more than one week ago. But I want to emphasize that we haven't been alone during that process. Um, this TP has been a team project indeed from the very beginning. We took all our key decisions together as a group. We wrote the script together as a group. We rehearsed together as a group, and now everybody will be together here in this room. One of the first decisions we took was the main concept, and uh, Sejal is gonna introduce that to you now. Thank you, Michelle. So here we have one cohesive storyline which is separated into two timelines. One of timeline will play in the 16th century, which is known as the Age of Discoveries, and the other will play in 21st century, which is also known as the Age of Modern Knowledge. We, as a team, present here the contrasting scenarios in order to show the potential progress in the technologies of oceans, resources, and climate interaction. Here we have five chapters in our final report. They are ocean and atmospheric mapping, coastal monitoring and disaster management, governance, commercialization and outreach model, coastal resource management and data handling. Okay, and one thing I want to make clear is that this is only an entertaining appetizer to our work. If this play triggers your interest, then I highly encourage you to read our final report and also check out the executive summary because I think they're really good. And one last disclaimer, if you're easily triggered by animals in distress, you may want to look away for some seconds in the upcoming video. And now, enjoy the show. Thank you. are important to me for much of the same reason space is important to me. Uh, it's vast unexplored depth scientifically, the technological things we can pull out of it, and how important it is to us as a species. Uh, I could tell you I, hope I want to work in the oceans for the same reasons I want to work in space, because I love it. But really it's because it's about our legacy, it's about what we leave behind. And in that sense, space and ocean are really vital to who we are. I feel strongly about the ocean because I am from a coastal uh, region and I know how communities can rely heavily on uh, the ocean to sustain life. I care about the ocean simply because of all the life of the moment. The ocean matters to me because it's the origin of life.
planet. Shock. In 1972, the crew of Apollo 17 described a blue marble. In 1990, the Voyager 1 probe saw a pale blue dot. Today, every day, satellite observations remind us that over 70% of our planet's surface is covered in oceans. These saltwater bodies are the largest concentration of biodiversity on our planet. It's the largest habitat, and it serves a critical role in regulating our global climate. Now, humans have always been drawn to the oceans. We are fascinated, we are mesmerized by what lies just beyond that horizon. 40% of us live near the coastline. And across history, access to the oceans uh, has... What lies beyond that ocean panorama offers hope, a source of wonder, an immense resource opportunity. Now, we sit on the most western country on the continent, a place that has woven a particularly deep connection to the ocean. This place is home to one of the many great explorers in history. It is exploration that has placed the oceans at the hearts of societies and their development. It has served as a source of inspiration and ambition. Now this still holds true today, in the age of modern knowledge, oh, there I am, uh, <laughs> And I mean, the world economy, it just highly depends on the oceans. Um, over 90% of global trade passes, passes through sea routes, um, and millions of jobs are intertwined with this unique ecosystem. From food security, climate change, energy demands, natural resources, the oceans lie at the intersection of some of humanity's greatest challenges and opportunities. So, today, we are gathered to discuss this topic. Um, we have the government of Portalia, his mania, uh, the CEO of Airspace. Hello, and, everybody. And uh, the uh, representative from the Atlantic Inter uh, International Research Center. Today, we have come together to discuss our common interest, the protection of the oceans and the coastal life. Yes, and as a country bordering the Atlantic Ocean, this discussion is of deep importance for our government. And in addition, a huge part of our global economy is dependent on the ocean. Absolutely. And on top of these economic considerations, the oceans are also the biggest carbon sink. They are the life support system of our planet. The question that we have to face now is, how do we tackle the challenges of the ocean and the coastal life? Well, as you know, as the Air Center, our prime mandate is to develop research and innovation, as well as scientific and policy cooperation among the countries within the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we need to explore, actually, effective technology to timely monitor our oceans and atmosphere in a cooperative manner. Well, in my opinion, space-based Earth observation capabilities are a convincing and very relevant option here. And actually, this is what we do at EarthSpace. In my company, we develop space infrastructure to find solutions to these kind of problems. And I think, especially here, the satellite technology would be very relevant because it would ensure an appropriate coverage. Yes, and in, in Hismania, we have space expertise and experience. And launch, launching an Earth observation satellite is definitely an option for consideration. Yes. Yeah. We also have substantial um, space expertise. The only issue that I see with launching our own satellite is that we might be limited when it comes to coverage and also sensor technology. Well, an holistic approach in this sense can um, most definitely offer advantages in terms of access to technology, data, coverage, and most definitely economies of scale. Yes, and an idea here would be to launch a satellite constellation. Um, I think to have multiple satellites in different Earth orbits would uh, allow us to, have, uh, to cover the whole Atlantic Ocean and the coastal regions around it. The countries around this table tonight uh, have a history of exploration. Uh, 500 years ago, the time of great explorers, the ships mapped the globe. They used novel technologies. They looked to the stars for guidance. Now this story is repeating itself today. Our spaceships 
look down on our little blue ball <coughs> floating through space, past the atmospheric horizon, to regulate and monitor our climate, to understand our sustainability and how space can help us here on Earth. If we bundle up our competences and if we build a bigger constellation together, we can be cost efficient. By working uh, with our national industries and commercial operators, such as Earth Space, we will be ready to tackle the challenge. And their center can help on this. Building on our network, we can initiate a discussion between the various stakeholders across the Atlantic Ocean to basically gather user needs and requirements for such a constellation. In addition, I heard that this summer a bunch of uh, space experts will gather here for a summer program uh, organized by the International Space University. I think we can propose them to actually work on a project that can basically uh, encapsulate all the challenges related to the setting up of such a constellation. So let's start working on it. All right. This is the historic backdrop to the Atlantic Satellite Constellation, a project driven by a thirst for knowledge, good commerce, and the exploration of our oceans. But more than that, this project is united together in the fight against climate change, to protect our oceans, and to deliver value for the millions of people living around the Atlantic Basin. back a few centuries. Another group of hopeful people are busy planning a similarly great project they have gathered in their favorite pub to answer the call of the ocean. The group fidgets with excitement. They imagine the days and months ahead of their voyage where they will find food, comfort, and wealth. Tonight, this voyage comes closer to fruition. They are planning their journey. The mission will consist of setting sail west to the Spice Islands. A caravel, the Merio, will be their vessel. This magnificent ship will be full to the brim with antiques, perhaps 2,000 pastai de natas and hummus and IST carrots. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, the patron had a plan. They would trade these antiques for various delicious items of value. Pepper, nutmeg, cloves, cinnamon, fish and chips, baked beans, sorry, nine weeks. Um, <laughs> As the patron bids our explorers bon voyage, they decide to elect a captain. A seasoned volunteer, Peng Barbarossa, volunteers. The three sailors agree on their roles. A climate expert, someone who has seasoned understanding of weather conditions. Another would manage food, fresh water, super bock. And uh, as the music in the pub rises, they cheer, joined in wonderment for a brighter future for themselves and their loved ones. Disclaim a small salt, don't get any ideas, this is patented to hell, okay? <laughs> yeah? So in the 21st century, engineers and scientists got to work. They designed everything from the smallest bolt to the most complicated of cameras. The satellites will fly in a sun-synchronous orbit, so the Earth will always have the same sunlight for satellite imaging. Sensitive instruments will capture our world with both hyperspectral and multispectral cameras to better identify what grows and what lives on our planet. 
Engineers will add a GNNSR sensor to analyze signals sent out by our positioning systems. The satellites will also carry an automatic identification system for ship tracking, and high-end antennas will be installed for smooth and timely communication between the satellites and our ground stations. The engineers will build the structure from scratch. They will manufacture parts ranging from basic electronics to highly complicated propulsion systems for the rocket and to make sure the satellite can generate its own power using satellites, using solar panels, uh, and backup battery systems. Computers are installed for control, radiators to handle heat, and vibration systems to handle the launch. Things are handled with the utmost care. To make sure they work as expected, the systems undergo rigorous testing. When they function correctly, it is installed, and this entire process we refer to as development, assembly, integration, and testing. So, ready for launch? Here goes this marvel of technology. Thirty seconds and counting. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. We should have seen, we should have been on by the port days ago. We are late. I'm really afraid we might starve or drown. When do you think we will arrive? Captain, I really don't know what to tell you. My measurement shows everything is fine. We are in forwarding in right direction. However, I'll take some more measurements and find out whether we are in right direction or not. Pedro, <laughs> throw rope as far as possible and find out what progress we have. One, two, three, nine, nine. Slower the, than expected. Check the wind direction. Oh. Nor, nor to south. No, no, no. East to west. East to west. Oh, okay then. Let us send Melody. She will find some land for us. I think that shark got her. Uh, I know it doesn't work. I have something which will work. I think, I think we got our bearings now. Yeah, yeah. Are we heading to the right direction? 
Okay, uh, I will check with the sensors that we have in situ and also okay. on the satellites that are constantly monitoring the state of the oceans and atmosphere. Yes. So we have the scatterometer over here. It tells us uh, something about the ocean uh, surface wind, speed and direction. We have the altimeter. This is gonna tell us everything about the metrology. This looks good. Okay. We have the synthetic aperture rider. It is uh, about the ocean wave height, ocean surface wind, and also the ocean surface current. That also looks pretty okay. And what about the HF? Uh, the HF rudder. Uh, we're gonna tell us everything about the ocean wave height, and it also looks, looks good. I see updates from the in-situ sensors and from the satellite that at the moment the conditions are excellent and we can sail easily. In the coming days we will not have availability of the in-situ sensors, but we will be able to use the information coming from the satellites. I really trust the in-situ prediction. It's very accurate because it actually samples the water itself and knows how to monitor all the data as accurately as possible. So the problem is really that the next time we will get the information from the in-situ sensors it will only be in a week or so from now on. So we have to rely on the information itself from the satellite. You have nothing to fear. Using the recommendations of the team project Ocean Climate Space Interactions from SSP22 together with the information coming from the Atlantic Ocean Constellation Analysis and algorithms based on numerous databases from in situ sensors have been developed that allow the analysis of the information collected by remote sensing sensors in a much more accurate way. And now we can get accurate information in high frequency. What happened? We were so close to the port. Where did this come from? Captain, I'm not sure. The, the storm has come from behind. Our men up well high. But we don't know where we are heading right now. Do we have any way to warn the port? No, we don't have enough men. Even we could send back. They can't reach port on time. We can't wait for them. Do you think the port will be standing when we come back? Oh, nothing. We don't have anything. We are unprepared for this storm. Can we warn them, send pigeons, water dog, anything? No, nothing. We don't have anything to get okay. ready for. Okay, everything for itself right now. We are on our own, fellas. Perhaps storms of this kind gives unpleasantness. Farmers could not go out. Merchants could not dock in. And then we don't have anything to do. We will enjoy. Joel, as we always have. Wow, that doesn't look great. How recent is this data? Oh, uh, this, let me check. Uh, it's only a few hours old. It took some time to process, but then we're getting hourly updates from the Atlantic constellation. But it seems like the storm's heading out in our direction. And we also have an incoming algal bloom in the event, which is like pretty messed up situation, I think. Yeah. Which is why we move quickly. All right, people, let's go. Survey ships first, coastal community second. We have a plan. It's executed. Let me check in with the circuit chip. Survey was the one. Do you read me? This is Smart Studios. Loud and clear, Smart Studios. I see you talking about the storm. Affirmative. Are you looked in?
Yep, we're looped in with Atos and the Atlantic Constellation, so we're getting constant reports on weather and algal toxicity in the area, and we're looped in with the local port, just like the azimuth system back in the day. How's the smart city framework working? By this point, every citizen should have been prompted. May is setting up the disaster plan and sending out information, I think. The framework has already informed my crew of their evac routes once we dock. I got a custom message myself, and my family tells me they got all the information they need via the web platform. Flood map was sent out for them, and I have my GPS map back to shore, and my disembark process all set up. Standard procedure. And the other survey vessels? Same situation as us. Some of them are in the storm, but we're in constant comms. They're on their way out, and they're reporting no injuries or losses. They're probably not happy, but they're safe enough. Good words, Captain. I'll let no, no, no. Stay safe. Thanks, Smarts. Vessel one out. Hey, um, what's our in situ situation? Um, all our local sensors are fully functional, and they're autonomous enough to be working relatively independently, which is good right now. But we have a few vessels out that we could have, and their auto sampling and their data is being integrated with the Atlantic Constellation data automatically. So we should have a pretty idea about the ground truth. Also, uh, there's going to be flooding, so we might lose some sensors there. But then we've got some machine learning algorithms figuring out high-risk flood zones on the current data and the ocean floor mapping. So I think we should be able to predict what sensors will lose and what can we compensate. Can we trust the algorithms? We have a lot of fishermen who need to know when it's safe to get out there. Uh, I think we have been running validation and review campaigns every six months, right? So algorithms are valid as of less than three weeks ago. Whatever data is coming in, we are quite confident because they are pretty much accurate. And all the data is being fed back to the smart city framework there, to the local communities, and fisheries have been prepared as best as they can economically and they have representatives, points of contact we can reach out to and they're in loop for all the intents and purposes. Great, glad to hear. Yeah. Hey, Raul, what about international response? Uh, look, uh, I'm in contact with the technical reps for each nation now. Uh, they are all getting data from uh, the full Atlantic system as per our agreements. Um, you remember that we are all part of the international charter for major disasters, so it's working efficiently and smooth so far. Uh, their data sets are being, being integrated with ours and we are computing on the cloud so we can afford uh, to lose power uh, to a data center or two. We actually lost a few in situ platforms but the integrated system is picking up the slack. All in all, global response is quite smooth. And we're doing everything we need to. We should be able to ride out this storm and assess algal bloom response pretty much immediately afterwards. Ideally minimal casualties and minimal economic losses. You know, it's that time of year. Um, what if another storm comes in? Then we perform. Swiftly, precisely, and with all our technological tools and platforms, like we always have. I do not know what happened to the captain. He's not himself anymore since the storm. He takes decisions alone, he doesn't listen, and we're starving. I can't work like this. It's been so long since I've seen any real food that I imagine the fishes jumping there in the water in the distance. I can't see anything. It must be your mind getting to you. We need a new captain. One of us. It is 
very heartbreaking. We started very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, but now we are contemplating a mutiny. No, he's right. It's, it's time for a new captain. I propose a vote. Rock, paper, scissors for the roll. The vote has been called. Mutiny this. Look at me. I am the new, new captain. Captain, I'm sorry. We're starving. It ain't nothing personal. Get him. Oh, no, no. I told you I will slap your face with a fish. No. <laughs> Now we have a good captain now, let us hope we'll get a food. for a fair share of responsibilities and duties. As the athletic constellation involves many diverse players, a flexible governance model has been established to comply with the commercial priorities of the operators while also generating value for the wider public. This model entails a main decision-making body, the executive board. Lucy, as you are a member of the executive board, could you please elaborate more uh, on the role of this body? Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> May I just say you're very beautiful. Um, so concerning the executive board, it is the main decision body of the Atlantic Constellation. It is composed of the entities that have a substantial financial stake in the Constellation. And so as part of the executive board, we have several missions. We ensure the smooth running of operation of the Constellation. And uh, we take decisions on programmatic, uh, and financial uh, aspects for the constellation. We also established a voting system that is proportionate to the financial commitment of the members, and this ensures a clear and fair uh, decision-making process, and at least with that, we have no mutiny on our hands. Um, uh, Lucy, are you still there? Maybe we can go on to present the steering committee. Yes, absolutely, you are right. The steering committee is the other governing body. It is made up of two members per signatory party of the Atlantic Constellations Agreement. Michel is a member of the steering committee and can help us understand its role better. Michel, I give you the floor. Thank you, Lucy. So basically, the steering committee is following more of an advisory model. We provide high-level and long-term strategic orientation for the development of the constellation. And for example, we formulate uh, recommendations on using the data for a scientific, but also for so uh, social purposes. And we suggest potential future applications. We take decisions by consensus, and we try to be as inclusive as possible to foster future international cooperation around the constellation and encourage members to contribute to its development. Right. And all of this is linked by the Air Center, which also occupies a crucial role in the governance model of the constellation. Annalisa, as a representative of the Air Center, can you please elaborate on the role of the Air Center as secretariat of the constellation? Sure, Lucy. Thank you for the question. The Air Center is actually a more an administrative role regarding the constellation. So our mission there is to facilitate the work, discussion, and meetings of the other bodies. So we propose agenda item and we coordinate the information flow between all the different bodies in this model. We participate in the function of rapporteurs in the meetings of both the steering committee and the executive board, to which we directly report on the activities performed. 
And also the Secretariat is coordinating the downstream innovation platform, right? Absolutely, Lucy. The Downstream Innovation Platform, or the DAP as we like to call it, is basically a key part of our model. It is actually the most visible part towards external stakeholders meant to share knowledge, to boost innovation and to create business opportunities. But uh, let me go a little bit more into the detail of the DAP. So the DAP is basically composed of two main bodies, the one being the Innovation Hub Network and the other being the Users Forum. The Innovation Hub Network is uh, an incubator and accelerator network distributed uh, within every participatory country. This is a cooperative effort, which means that uh, the stakeholders on every country have the opportunity to set up their own network of uh, incubators and accelerators. Um, each hub be can benefit from the non-proprietary data of the Atlant Atlantic constellation and generate value supporting young promises businesses idea to grow commercial. We are proud to say that today we have a large network composed of uh, apps all across the Atlantic. The second body, which is also very relevant for us, is the Users Forum, which is a platform that gathers current and future users' needs, challenges and expectations. The feedback we collect through this channel feeds into the recommendation that we provide to both the steering committee and the uh, executive uh, board, and that can generate new application. It gathers a wide uh, community of academia, business, and also users coming from the social um, and uh, uh, economic sector. And uh, some example might be, for instance, the regional fishermen organizations that uh, provide us with uh, their own feedback. And uh, we are very proud to say that our last meeting gathered more than 100 participants, and we look forward for more. Okay. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, I'm so hungry. You promised the food. <laughs> Bread again? This really isn't a good start for you as captain. This bread again. <laughs> this look familiar. This, this isn't the breakfast. It's all I could negotiate. Lan, uh, uh. I'm seeing an island there. Maybe they have food that we could have. I'll check. <laughs> the, the land is too salty to grow anything. I did manage to get some oysters that the locals didn't want to eat. Captain, do you think these are safe? Oh, shut up. I'm so hungry. Uh, oh, 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 Captain, I think those oysters might have been toxic. There's probably a reason the locals didn't want them. Uh, we have no choice. With no food. We have to go back home. We can't keep going on like this.
food, but how do they make sure it is healthy and sustainable? I am from the Conservation Society. The new aquaculture farms threaten the coastline ecology, and fishers still enter protected areas. I'm a fisher, my parents were fishers, and their parents were fishers as well. I used to have plenty of space for my fishing, but now there's nothing for me between the aquaculture farms and the illegal fishers. Do these hippies want me bankrupt? I have started this aquaculture farm with my brother 20 years ago. I really want to help this community, but there seems to be no room for me. Harmful algae bloom have made it harder and harder for me to produce healthy muscles. Do they want to ruin my business? So many people, so many different needs. How do I manage all this? How do I make my voters happy? Our satellite data might be able to help. Uh, we've mapped the area and keep track of sea surface temperatures and ocean colors. Our instruments can contribute. We have kind of collected underwater data using ocean gliders and floats. If we combine all the data in a single model, we will truly understand what is happening in the sea near our coast. OK, and that will help me. How? Well, we can see uh, this bay over here has stable temperatures at low risk for harmful algae blooms now and in the future. Perfect for an aquaculture farm. And the product will be free of algae toxins, unstressed by temperature variations. This area also has valuable mangroves and biodiversity. I think we should protect this and forbid fishing. Hmm, the problem is we have a lot of fishers near the mangroves and in our community. And if I tell them uh, they cannot fish there anymore, they will be very unhappy. And the problem is also, offshore we have a lot of competition. Oh, in that case we can track fishing using our automatic identification system of the Atlantic Constellation. Also, we have AI models that can predict the behavior of the identified ships and can look out for illegal fisheries. Okay, yeah, that should maybe protect uh, the fishers and help them, but the, if we can get the data quickly enough. Uh, that should be possible with enough ground stations. We've got a few different partners who could probably help out with that. Well, speaking of the quick data, we have real-time data getting, and then that can be used to build a model of our oceans, say a virtual twin. This can be used by fishermen and aquaculture farmers as well. This can, be help, uh, this can help them deliver healthy fish and mussels. I do think we'll need to help them make decisions. Our models are complicated to use. The raw data alone isn't useful to them. They just want to know what to do and when to do it. Uh, we'll have to set up a system for forecasting to help them out. OK, I, I think we have figured it, out, figured it out now. But uh, can I use this data also for farmers on land? Or Yeah, we can yeah? integrate that, yes. We should probably research on soil salinity as well. I think it's going to be a huge problem later. Now my farm is much better located. The new forecasting services help me harvest at the right time and ensure a healthy product. The decisions by our regional governments have really made a difference. The water is cleaner and biodiversity protected. I'm happy we have a place. The new enforcement policy protects our fish and allows us to remain in business. I'm happy to get a fair and sustainable product and uh, it is good to see everyone coming together and taking care of our community. I, I can see the port. We're nearly there. We might just survive this yet. I had lads. <laughs> we are returning to our families empty-handed. I don't know what to tell my families. I won't. I don't know what to tell my kids. I don't know either. We left the world to explore them. For their good, we left. I think that our mission is a failure. We have to tell them the truth. Our mission is a failure, but the ocean is a harsh mistress. 
but she is also beautiful. And storms and starvation drove us into trouble. Uh, we left with more than we came back with. Uh, is there any point in continuing in this path? The ocean might have beaten us, but our curiosity, that will remain. The oceans might have defeated us, but the oceans also give us life. Uh, our local communities, uh, communities and the oceans are very entwined. We just have to learn more, more about the oceans. We're still looking at stars to guide us. Perhaps one day we can look down from skies and see this world and the oceans. Perhaps one day our children's children might be able to do that. They will tell our story. Will they tell our story? Will our, the next generations explore the oceans and her depths? I hope so. I truly hope so. We Alas, hope so. we have reached our port. Yes. Mayor. Dear Mayor, we return defeated, but we learned many stories that we would like to share. I'm happy you are all alive, but I am sad to see you have lost some crewmates and that you came back empty-handed for our village and families. However, we must celebrate your safe return, and I would be, it would be an honor to hear the lesson you learned from the sea. It was very hard. We were beaten by storms and malnutrition. If only we could predict the weather. Maybe the next generations will be able to do that. Navigation posed another challenge for us. We tried to navigate by the stars, but alas, with the storms, it was not possible. If we need some way to locate where we are on a map and know where to go to reach the nearest shore. Our oceans are amazingly beautiful. We need to learn to protect them and to learn about the life that they sustain. A view from the sky will help us to, uh, to live together with the oceans. I am humbled by your lesson and understand that we need to learn more about our oceans and how we can protect them. Perhaps as humanity ventures out into the stars, we can look back and gaze down at the ocean to explore, to learn, and to protect. Obrigado. everyone satellites are coming into visibility in t minus 2 minutes and each ground station takes 8 minutes to receive the data get ready yes and the payloads of the satellites are directed to give us initial images of the ocean surface and this is to verify if the satellite constellation is working well i think the images will be with us shortly let's go guys 5 4 3 2 1 we can see the first images of oceans coming into the frame. Our international mission has been successful. Yeah. Yay, let's go. <laughs> nice. Good job. <laughs> OK, fantastic. The first phase of our mission is accomplished. The future looks bright with so many new projects on the horizon. We hope to one day create a digital twin of our oceans. Our oceans are the lifeblood of our people and our planet. We must do everything to mitigate the impact of climate change. Wonderful. We are so happy that through our partner countries, we made so this possible. This is an exciting step into exploring our own oceans and using space for the betterment of humanity. 
Uh, let's start by looking at potential algal blooms. Please uh, configure and upload the application to the onboard computer, uh, search for algae, and download the process data to ground. Yes, sir. The upload is now in progress, and we will be receiving the data soon. Thank you, operator. The ability to change the uh, application being examined during this new reconfigurable processing technique is phenomenal. It means we can alter the properties we're looking for on demand with a rapid response time. Normally, this would take us weeks. So, we just received the data and we were able to validate by detecting a known algal bloom. The performance of the configurable onboard processing system is nominal. We are looking for more possible blooms now. Okay, here we have. We have spotted an algal bloom in the Atlantic Ocean. Operator 2, please contact the local government authorities right now and report them. Okay, hello. Good evening. You are speaking with Operation Center Atlantis. Yes, we have identified an algal bloom near your coast. Yes, it's a, uh, it's a big threat to your people and your ecosystem. You should um, take the authority, the authorities should it very, take, it, well, sorry, take it very seriously. Amazing job, everyone. With this, we are the new explorers of the oceans. Yes? A natural disaster. Well, our satellites can give you the data you need. I read you loud and clear. We are ready to help. Five hundred years later, our relationship with the oceans and the planet has changed dramatically. We understand our environment and how we, how we affect it far more than we ever have before. The ocean is not a place to be feared, but to be protected and respected. We've taken you on this journey to inspire you, but also to ask you, what can we do in the next 500 years? Where will us, mischievous spacefarers, take us in the next few years? Maybe not 500. Where will small sod take us? Our oceans are a fundamental part of who we are. And uh, now, more than ever, is a time to remember that. Thank you very much.
The seaweed is always greener on somebody else's lake. You dream about going up there, but that is a big mistake. Right, uh, just look at the world around you, right here on the ocean floor. Such wonderful things around you. What more is you looking for? Under the sea, under the sea. Darling, it's better down where it's wetter. Take it from me. Up on the shore, they work all day. In the sun, they slave away. While we devote and fill time to floating under the sea. Down here all the fish is happy, and so the waves they roll. The fish on the land ain't happy, they sad cause they in their bowl. But fish in the bowl is lucky, the fate is worse a fate. One day when the boss gets hungry, guess who's gonna be on the plate? Under the sea, under the sea. Nobody beats us, fry us and eat us in fricassee. We what the landfalls love to cook. Under the sea we off the hook. We got no trouble, life in the bubbles under the sea. Hello. Give it up for the space band. <laughs> I would like uh, to invite all orcas on stage. You've seen a lot of us. Uh, there's also technical staff here. David and Bas, for example. Um, I think Nuno is still back there. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all. That one's for the audience. <laughs> I am Nilsson Rapaz, I'm one of the program managers of this project together with Lucy. Uh, before we start with the Q&A session, I would really like to say well done to everyone. I'm really proud of this team. I'm really happy to see how they work together and what they have accomplished so far. So a big applause for yourself as well. <laughs> To start off our Q&A session, uh, first I would like to give the floor to our president, Pascal, if she has any questions. Well, I think uh, you have showed incredible talents in all fronts, and that you have also a musical group, I think this is quite fantastic with so many different instruments. I think it's uh, unbelievably uh, such a serious topic. Uh, and as you have seen in, in, uh, in particular over the summer, we have uh, seen the, 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 the rise of the oceans, uh, the melting of the, uh, the Arctic glaciers. It is such an imp uh, a, a really, really serious topic and you made a very uh, appealing, multidimensional and multidisciplinary show out of it, which shows the past and the present and the future. And I think um, 
uh, there was so much that I think everybody has to capture, <laughs> you know, uh, um, uh, how, how do you say, the, the, the essence of everything what you have presented, including over time, you know. <laughs> but of course, this was, uh, you had, of course, a, a musical uh, interlude, so to, uh, so to speak. So um, um, a really fantastic work, like, like all the groups uh, that comes from this kind of interdisciplinary background you all have, that you contribute in a different form, and that will help us uh, to solve or provide solution for global challenges in, in the future. I think um, what is important uh, and what you could eventually uh, uh, try to answer is, um, um, how at the same time uh, to um, engage society uh, as you are doing in a, in, a, in, a, in a really different way to make them understand what we are dealing with, that we are living on a planet with 70% uh, oceans, that there will be many difficult situations arising in the future, and um, that uh, society at large has really to understand and uh, to help to mitigate uh, um, uh, this problem, but um, also that you can convince uh, with important arguments, um, political um, um, uh, uh, governments and political organizations everywhere in the world, and that it will be different in nations which are very open for climate change compared to other nations which have coastal regions, for instance, in, in Africa. And I think this is something what I think you have to uh, to work uh, on how you actually convince with this uh, really uh, open uh, um, uh, approach, you know, to uh, also win society with uh, all, all the different aspects of this problem, uh, but also really to win uh, the political um, uh, organizations uh, and the organizations which help you uh, really in order to mitigate uh, uh, the, um, the challenges and that space plays a very, very important role uh, in, the in, in, in the future of oceans. So that, that was a little bit long, but um, it was just so much and congratulations. Uh, I think in the name of, uh, of everybody, uh, we had also, uh, how do you say, pirates of the Caribbean, you know, <laughs> included. And I think it's, it's, it's very important to make uh, uh, society aware of uh, what is the future and uh, how they can help actually to mitigate. Uh, we are living, we have only one planet right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for all those kind words. Yeah, no applause. <laughs>
And uh, that's the big question. Can uh, the private sector take care or take advantage of being enterprising in this area of monitoring, searching? And second, what about the plastic, uh, microplastic, not the big ones, but the microplastics in the oceans? Did you touch that in your TP? Yeah, so, so two questions again. <laughs> One, can we convince businesses to get involved in our oceans and this ocean research? And two, what about microplastics? Can I get any uh, hands? I can give an answer to the, the first one, I think. The, we have, of course, been working with the Air Center, uh, which is an institute, uh, not, not a company, and that made us realize that there's a lot of like uh, interfaces between business and institutes, uh, and it's a very complex one. Now, we definitely believe that there is a place for businesses in these structures. Uh, you can see it in our government structure, I think. Uh, but we also believe that what the institutes can bring can be very beneficial uh, for producers, like if you read our section on aquaculture, we really stress the importance. What we do, the services that we would deliver, needs to turn a profit. Only then we can do and convince businesses to join us in this venture to protect the oceans. Lucy, first I think there's something to add on this question and then we go to Karen for mi microplastics. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I'm only going to focus on the first part of the question. So for the, the involvement of private actors, we really thought about this also because the governance model that we present in our report is public-private uh, concept governance model. So the private um, uh, actors are, are totally accounted for. And also we thought about the downstream element of such a, a constellation. And here again, we thought about business opportunities and we um, were reflecting on incubators and accelerators uh, to make use of the data to be able to, um, to enhance uh, business opportunities. So on microplastics, from our research showed that it's not super possible right now to be able to detect the amount of microplastics in surface water like from remote sensing. But one of our main recommendations is that we partner and create and work with in situ measurement systems of all different kinds that can incorporate directly with the satellite data. And so that helps on two fronts. For one, we, we recommend looking at gravimetry data and other sort of um, ocean bottom pressure to better map ocean currents, which help us determine where plastics are going to accumulate and where they show up and come from. And then also, as of right now, I think I remember from the research that we actually need to take water samples for microplastics. So we have citizen science and some other platforms that we want to incorporate with the satellite constellation to be able to get more in situ data that we can combine with satellite data to give a better model of that. I hope that uh, answers uh, your question. Uh, we are going back to the online panel. Um, I'm not sure, is the sound fixed? Can someone try to say something? We don't hear anything yet. Uh, I hope there is a question in the chat for us. Hello. Oh, Amir, we do hear you. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Great. There is it's an echo. Now it's better. No, it's OK. So uh, it, it's not a question. It's, it's just a, a quick statement. So I'm here talking on behalf of the Air Center. So I'm the current uh, CEO of, of the organization. So I'd like to start to thanking uh, Portugal Space for making uh, ISU uh, uh, in Lisbon, in, 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 uh, in Ueiras, in, in this case, in the city of Ueiras, uh, and, and bringing uh, a lot of uh, interesting uh, experts from around the world and uh, fantastic fellows working on space issues and inviting the Air Center to be one of the entities uh, for a TP. Uh, then I would like to, to, to also uh, say uh, an uh, appreciation to ISU. I see here Juan Dalmau that we started discussing a, a few months ago before the, the ISU was, was a reality here, here, here in Portugal. And also I would like to thank Orca's team because uh, you did a fantastic job uh, here. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of challenges to, to implement the constellations. Lastly, I'd like to thank also João, uh, João Bentes. He has been here the liaison between the Air Center and the team. He did an amazing job. So congrats for that. 
I, I want to to uh, maybe just to uh, complement some of the words of of the, the the first statement that you managed to um, explain such a complex matter in a presentation that was compelling and also uh, funny uh, with with a lot of humor uh, humor for a very serious matter that we need to solve as as many many countries together we are focusing here in the Atlantic but as the director of Imp said. We have other oceans, but we have we have to start somewhere, and uh, we, the Atlantic uh, International Center is is already a consolidated network around the Atlantic, and uh, with uh, south uh, uh, of the Atlantic with with Brazil, and and of course with many countries in Africa. And you mentioned about mi microplastics, and we are very interested to maybe pursue this line of activity with IMP. This would be very interesting for us. Um, and uh, just coming back to the ORCA's teamwork, I think this once again proves that the Atlantic constellation is uh, definitely important to solve some of the challenges we have regarding climate change. Also, uh, we will have now around three years in the F to implement this constellation. You know, Portugal and Spain are the two countries that are now advancing with implementation of this project, but of course other countries, and I mentioned now Brazil, but there are others like Nigeria, South Africa, uh, and UK that showed interest to join because this should be a joint effort uh, with many of the opportunities that were, were mentioned during the presentation of Orcas. Um, lastly, I have to say that you mentioned about digital twin now in the end of the presentation. Definitely this is a goal of many of our organizations to have a digital twin of the ocean. But there will not be just one digital twin. We must have many digital twins. So it's something that we need to explore. And the engagement of the users and society is also a big challenge and something that we need to have creative solutions to, to solve the real problems. So this Thanks. is just what, what I wanted to mention. And congratulations to everyone, to all the organization, and um, looking forward for, for the next steps. Thank so, you thank so you. much, Emir. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly to, we have four questions now. Walter was up first, so uh, Walter, go right ahead. Well, out of courtesy, I think uh, Suyin was first, so ladies first. <laughs> Hello, can everyone hear me now? Okay, perfect. Uh, so hello, SSP. It's great to see you all again. Sorry about the audio issues. Um, as everyone knows, I think on site, uh, I'm C. and Tan from the University of Waterloo in Canada, IOC Global Faculty. Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate uh, TP Orcas on an incredible and very entertaining presentation. It's very impressive to see what you've accomplished within a very short time period. Um, also, I wanted to commend you on an excellent final report, and especially that you took time to uh, take into account to review your feedback, your attention to detail, and also a very comprehensive literature review. Uh, so you should be very proud of the final product. Um, having said that, I do have a question for you. Um, first of all, uh, you focused your TP on five themes uh, related to mapping, monitoring, resource management, disaster management, data handling, to name a few. And uh, your report has also shown us that each theme is quite complex. It has various challenges and requirements. I was wondering whether you can reflect on um, all of these priorities because it's impossible to address all of them at once. And so, for example, if the Air Center and Atlantic Constellation partners have limited resources and funding, um, are there some top recommendations that you would urge them to target in the immediate short term? And so, in other words, what is at the top of your wish list amongst all of your recommendations? And also clarify why. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we aimed to advise uh, decision makers and, and we've really done that. So as I understand your question, what are our top recommendations? I will give uh, the word to Aditya. Uh, I, I can only really provide a couple recommendations. I do want to have the other subgroups also mention some of theirs. Uh, you mentioned short term, and that's sort of why it perked up, because while there's much we can do with remote sensing in the future, and there are so many new technologies we can approach, like blue LIDAR, that can really give us a lot of advantages, one of the themes we saw in our research was integration. 
integration with in situ censures, integration across nation states, integrations across companies. Um, some of these models that they're starting to build, uh, we noted a system that went live a few years ago called the Azimuth system. Uh, some of these systems are providing inputs on disaster monitoring, on algal bloom monitoring, and one of the reasons they're working well is because you have survey ships, you have citizen science, you have remote sensing data, you have governmental data, you have planning organizations coming together and producing weekly reports. One of the things we noted, at least in our small subgroup on disaster management, is a recommendation is to pursue that path of integration. The Air Center is already set up in a way to promote integration across different organizations. We believe integrating across technological platforms will also allow for quicker data reports that are more robust and can be used by more people more effectively. So that's my main recommendation from a disaster perspective. Thank you for the question. Uh, actually, we, hand, we have uh, re done research on data handling part. In this, actually, we thought, uh, uh, because the main objective is to provide the data in uh, very less time. That is, you should have uh, the products in <coughs> users are in the hands of user within one hour. To meet that, we have given a uh, few recommendations on the processing level. Onboard processing we have uh, suggested, which is a, uh, and uh, onboard processing is being tried for some missions, but uh, uh, but we have given a, a se separate recommendation, like a strong recommendation to go for a reconfigurable hypervisor on board. So that uh, whatever applications you develop on ground, it can be just uploaded and then as and when is required, we can process on board and then downlink only that part. So that way we have two advantages. One is doing on board processing and giving and, and uh, maximizing the downlinks. Because uh, when you are doing the lot of processing, uh, data, I mean, a lot of uh, data we are acquiring, that data to downlink it takes more time and then processing also on ground takes more time. So to avoid that, we have to do processing on board and downlink the only processed data. So that is the idea. So that way we are given uh, two recommendations. One is related to onboard hypervisor. And the other one is uh, we are given, even you can uh, deploy applications in terms of Docker's environment so that they are very lightweight and then we can deploy it very easily. Just an uh, image can be uploaded that will be executed on board and then. So that way we have given two recommendations in terms of data handling. Uh, I hope that answer your question uh, a little bit, Sujin. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going past all the subgroups uh, and getting their top recommendation, but continue to the next uh, question. Uh, Walter, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, is the sound passing by well? Okay. Uh, in the beginning, there was a very good remark made. I don't remember by whom, I think by the other Walter, that... Uh, uh, for more details, look at the report. And I think you did that very well. You, you, you made a nice sketch and a number of sketches which gave the main messages, inviting the people or encouraging the people to look in the reports for the details. So that was a very, very clever move in my personal opinion. Uh, be because the sketches, they also illustrate something which is in the word TP, team working. To make a sketch like that with all the attributes asks a lot of effort of a whole team and that you managed well. You managed everything quite well. Uh, if I may make one p a little caveat, I do not think you will have a chance at the Eurovision Song Festival. But that's a very personal. Uh, that's a very personal opinion. Now, uh, somebody mentioned, and there was a question about uh, uh, microplastics. Uh, just as a side remark, and also a, uh, like a sort of cross thing, there was a very interesting uh, TP done by the MSS students about microplastics. And it, for those who are interested, in the TP, they were also looking, and this is a lead to my question, they were also looking at how much that was costing to society. And if I may be very, very honest, in your report and in your presentation, that is something to the general public which I'm missing. What is the damage due to all this? What is the cost? You were talking about cost efficiency. So before we can talk about cost efficiency, how much damage do we have with all the, the problems that you, you do on a yearly basis? There must be climate change reports on that. And do you have any idea with your measures? Uh, would you be able to save 10%, 20%, 40%? Thank you so much. Um, I think we make a chance for Eurovision, seeing the other participants on Eurovision, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, the question is, how much damage can you give? I think uh, we have uh, two people that want to answer. Okay, first, David. 
So just a mention on algal blooms. Um, we found a report saying it was about in the region of, I think, $1 billion a year for countries that are affected, if I'm assumed, I think I'm remembering that right. Um, and if you can predict it, then obviously you can reduce the scale of that significantly. And uh, Philippa. Yeah, so I wanted to mention something about outreach. So we have a full section dedicated uh, in data handling, not only to validate the data, but also we have suggested platforms, both in data handling and in disaster management, in which uh, we are supposed to have a platform that takes care of outreach. The way it does that is that basically you have simulations of both what's happening and the climate change that ha that's happening, but also disasters and all of that. So we have those recommendations uh, segmented into those two um, sub-chapters. So I recommend maybe to take a look at that also. Um, yeah, but thank yeah, that's basically it. Thank you, that's a very good answer. Just my recommendation, if you really want to have the support of the public opinion and of the policy makers, uh, I would build in some cost figures in uh, the presentation, that's all. So I I uh, leave it up to, to the next one. Thank you for the answers, bye. Uh, there, we have one additional answer here from Tom. Uh, so if I could give him the floor for one moment, uh, that will be the last word because I got a signal that our time sadly is up. Thank you. Um, just when we're talking about cost, I think there also has to be the other side of cost, which is data not properly used or taken advantage of. Now, there's no shortage of data from space. That's, that's, that's made evident by the amount of constellations in operation today. But what is really lacking is that interface. How is the data being integrated? Who are the users? How is it actually filtering down into the downstream? So what is the cost of not taking advantage? of the data, and I think that's a very interesting question. Um, it's something that the governance subgroup tried to address. Um, but yeah, it's how we best optimize the downstream and make sure that you're not just launching more satellites into space, but you're actually understanding how can you best use them and for whom. So I think that's something that's under discussed and hopefully we partially addressed it in our report. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, uh, Joan, Scott, I saw your questions, but we are out of time. Um, one big round of applause for our team. One moment. We have two more minutes. Uh, 13. I, I got the times wrong here. Uh, yeah? We'll, we'll take a next question. <laughs> I think uh, Juan or Scott was in line for a next question. Scott, please. Okay, um, I just want to congratulate everyone. That was a wonderful performance, uh, good teamwork, and um, uh, very well planned. So you accomplished your goal, as Walter said, to get us interested in the TP report. Um, so I have two questions, but I'll just say one in the interest of time. Um, Portugal has a very large ocean territory, as does Spain. Um, thanks in large part to their many islands, um, such as the Azores, where the Atlantic International Research Center is located. Um, and so since uh, Spain and Portugal are the leads on this uh, initiative, I wanted to ask if you had a sense in your research of whether the needs of the islands differed from the needs of the mainland for the proposed constellation. Thank you so much uh, for, for the compliments. And if I understand, like, are there different needs for the mainland and for the islands? I'm thinking who can best answer this because this is a very wide question. Uh, I see Aditya yearning to answer. You, go ahead. Hi, algal blooms again. Um, but uh, it's actually a great question because I'm sure there are many technological differences there. But one thing that we noted in our research is uh, it's easy to call all these blooms algal blooms, and there are certain dominant species that tend to be uh, major problems. If you look at what happened in Lake Erie a few years back, uh, or the red tides in other places. But at the off the top of my head is the fact that you know tracking is one thing to track an algal bloom to visibly see it from space, but modeling how it grows that can be species specific. 
Um, and if it's going to be species specific, I imagine the islands will have different needs than necessarily uh, Spain and Portugal's mainlands. Uh, that is not something I have the exact knowledge on which species would be dominant in any particular location. And you could do basic modeling that would do basic uh, Lagrangian transport to do how is this algal bloom going to expand. But I would personally be interested in seeing how all different species of al algae over the course of the Atlantic Oceans and the world's oceans, how do they grow differently? How can we integrate that in our models to make them even more precise? Because if we can get our models from weekly reports to perhaps daily, the, the economic savings from just fishermen knowing when they can go out again is huge. So that's my first thought for uh, islands, but it's a very small portion, I'm sure, of the full problem. Uh, Greg wants to add something? Yeah, this is just very quick relating to um, aquaculture, which I know is another area of interest for the Air Center. Um, not necessarily just for islands, but for different nations with different oceans. The species that you that you cultivate are going to be vastly different in different locations. And so the data that these places may need is going to vary. Um, you can't build one model that'll work for every single island, every single country. It really does have to be differentiated based on their needs, and that's something that's going to be a challenge to, to build into the modeling systems. If I can add one thing on aquacultures myself, um, one opportunity there is with aquaculture, if it's well developed, it's very important for small island regions. Small islands often have to import a lot of food, and with aquaculture you have your own domestic supply that you can build up. Um, we're going to go take one question online, and then I saw a question here in the audience. Or you want to add something? Okay, one more answer. <laughs> Just because we were focusing on coastal resource management with, with this question, uh, we're switched back to uh, coastal agriculture. That becomes even more important uh, for islands because, I mean, agriculture on an island is always coastal agriculture. So uh, salinity of soil, saltwater uh, intrusion, that all becomes much more important for island nations. So, um, yeah, that's only what I wanted to contribute. <laughs> Thank you. Juan, the floor is yours. Obrigado. I'm calling in from uh, Spain, which, uh, as has been mentioned, is one of the current uh, leading countries in the Atlantic uh, Constellation proposal. And um, I would like to just mention the name of uh, Emir Siraj's predecessor at the top of uh, the International Air Center, uh, because some of you might want to continue working on this uh, wonderful TP and be hired by one of the main partners. Uh, obviously, the Air Center cannot recruit, recruit you all uh, in one day. But if you want to work in Spain for this, please contact uh, Emir Siraj's predecessor and founding director of the Air Center. His name is Miguel Bello. That's uh, B like Barcelona, B-E-L-L-O. And uh, guess what? He is today what I would say, Mr. Space in Spain, because he has been recently appointed uh, to chair the national committee that will uh, advise the government on the new space agency and on the space policy overall. So here you have a great connection. And obviously, Emir, I believe you can give them an email or something. Are you allowed? Yes, thank you. Uh, my second point is very brief. I wanted to underline uh, what Walter has said. Uh, please go and read. Uh, the ISU team project uh, that was written by the recent master's students in 21 called Space and Oceans Tracking Plastic Pollution in the Arctic Ocean from Space. Uh, so the Arctic, I think, is not very far from, from the Atlantic. And congratulations for a really professional work. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll definitely get in contact. And we'll definitely read that report. Um, Question from the audience, yes. Uh, can I get a microphone? Uh, thank you all. This is uh, Manuel again from the Portuguese Space Agency. Um, I, of course, as everybody else, uh, was quite entertained by your presentation. I'm sure it was a lot of work, uh, especially like the uh, these covers in their boat and all the, the fish slapping, I didn't quite understand. but. Um, maybe somebody can explain that later. Um, um, 
Now, of course, my question is, um, having seen your sketches that you know link to the report, I've been told, um, I, I want to understand how does the work you've been done, and I'm sure there's a lot of work you've uh, done, uh, feed into now back to the air centers work that have been working on that for years, of course. And um, maybe you can you know, explain that a little, uh, how they can benefit from it, how Portugal and also especially um, Spain for the Atlantic uh, constellation can benefit from that. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we can get a cup of tea and we'll explain you this joke. <laughs> um, the question is like, how can the Air Center, how can Portugal benefit from our report? Uh, I'm looking around, this is a very general question, so I'm gonna answer it. So the aim of our report is really to give a wide but new view on what the Air Center is doing. Um, and therefore, we have taken these goals from the Air Center to look at. Now, some of these might already be covered. Uh, we already know uh, that the Air Center and other organizations are looking at virtual twins. We hope our recommendations can contribute in focusing their mission and making new decisions and making use of space in their mission and knowing where we see as a young group as a diverse group where the pain points are i hope that answers your question a bit what i've heard so far air center really eager to read the report i think it's just out um and then we will definitely be in contact with them on the, on our results um i got can I get governments? We can get uh, Filipa. So the main output of our report are recommendations. So for each of these chapters, we have more or less like from three to five main recommendations. The idea is that they take those recommendations, see if they actually fit with their business model and research model, and then apply them. So for instance, one of the recommendations was using machine learning algorithms, specific algorithms, and giving examples of those algorithms. One idea could be, that the Air Center incorporates those uh, algorithms in mainland, because that's easy to do, as in it doesn't matter if the satellites are up there, we can implement them down here. So the main idea is that we have this large set of recommendations and they will look at them and see the ones that fit their priorities best. Uh, yeah, I will be short also. I will try to answer a little bit. So indeed, what we've been doing is like really going into different silos of information, try to investigate also for every niche application what would be like uh, the most commercially viable, the one that has like more potential according to the user's needs that actually the, the Air Center have been mapping already and they provided to us. So we've been trying to really like um, assess according to the different uh, chapter that we put in our report and also according to the research that uh, we have been uh, doing what uh, could be done. For what concerned my subgroup, which was basically about the governance, we have been asking ourselves like how the Air Center can make this constellation work for such a different like range of partners and uh, uh, different in like a lot of, uh, in many, many ways. So not only because some of the entities are commercial entities and other are, for instance, governmental institution, but also uh, because they have different interests. So there is somebody that wants basically to gain money, somebody else that want to spur and boost research and innovation. So we tried to, for instance, uh, recommend like a system, as you might, uh, a word from the presentation that is uh, flexible, but at the same time brings together the different interests. Our recommendation goes in that direction, basically saying like, okay, we have been analyzing different system and we are telling you like what in our opinion works the best for this uh, situation. I'll try and be a bit more explicit. I think we're all sort of tempted to launch into like a full debrief of our sections. Um, so I think everyone's bit holding back a bit, but um, just to try and focus, the, for example, on the commercialization aspect, right? If you're looking at concrete impact for the constellation on uh, its users or stakeholders. Um, if we focus alone on, let's say, the innovation hub network proposal that we've put together, um, it's trying to address certain bottlenecks, one of which is the lack of a trans-regional uh, incubator and, and accelerator network. So if you look at the bottleneck to commercialization in Brazil, for example, they really struggle to connect their entrepreneurs to new resources, new, new sources of funding to make their ideas possible. In West Africa, they have a slightly different issue. They have the entrepreneurial spirit, they have the funding, but they lack the spaces to pursue these ideas, the incubators themselves. 
Now, the idea of making this a trans-regional network is you access all these problems in different parts of the Atlantic and then try and connect them to the entrepreneurs in Portugal, entrepreneurs in Spain, to try and facilitate some cooperation, some collaboration in a closed loop network that stimulates entrepreneurship and innovation across the Atlantic. So I think it's just about yeah, trying to leverage these international connections as best we can, and these are some of the concrete examples that might bring some benefit. Yeah, and um, we of course have a lot of concrete examples. One thing that I can also add, RTP is actually written very modular. It's, it's, uh, we have a clear structure for every chapter, and that's also how we try to contribute to the Air Center. You don't have to read the whole report. You can just read the recommendations per section. You can just look which SDGs are addressed. You can just look what literature was reviewed. So we have to try to make our report very accessible. Now I see G2 standing there. One more applause for this team. Thank you. <laughs>
das, 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 das. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Okay, good. He's out in this moment, okay? No problems. Okay. I check the battery on me. I do. Six. Six? Six, Six. is good, okay.
beginning. At least this entry is good because we can see the things.
Yeah. I am from scene Okay, two. please take your seats. We are starting in a few moments, please. All right, so let's proceed with the final presentation of today, the team project presentation of the Space Studies Program 2022. So now we are going back in space, as I said. So our fourth theme was indeed looking into protein crystallization in space. And they named themselves as Procryos. So this team had been also chaired by three very esteemed individuals. Uh, Veronica Largina was the chair of the team project. Veronica is the CEO of Nanorax Space Outpost Europe. And she was joined to lead the team by, uh, as the associate chairs, Justin Carl from NASA, uh, the subsystem manager for the commercial crew program, and uh, a local uh, from Portugal, John Alabert uh, from the Portuguese Space Agency the national delegate at ESA Human Spaceflight Microgravity and Exploration Program Board. And the prior Cryos team is ready to uh, kick off. I just want to hand over to the chairs to tell their vision and their nine-week journey of the team. Please give them a warm welcome. Hello, boa here. tarde. Vou falar português. Mas por quê? Porque eu gosto de país. Eu gosto de Portugal. Eu gosto do idioma, da cultura, da história, da pessoa. Porque tem estado um sítio excelente para ter um milagre. Um milagre excepcional. No início foi um conjunto de complicação, de chateio, de barulho, de complexidade que tomou a transformar-se num conjunto de criatividade com essa ideia de produzir cristalos de proteínas no espaço, na condição especial, espacial da microgravidade. Epa, olha a palavra, microgravidade. Parece um paradoxo. Uma micro, uma coisa pequena, a gravidade, uma coisa pesada, grande. Vamos a descobrir como os cristalos, fabulosos, pequenos, podem ser a solução da gravidade da doença da humanidade. Engraçado, não é? Hello, everyone. I'm going to switch to English now. Thank you, everyone, for being with us online and on live. And uh, look, the translation, what I said in Portuguese, is intentionally missing. Why? Because I want you, and I'm sure many of you, to experience the frustration to be excluded of something. You know, five, ten years ago, space was like this. Space was a privilege for few fortunate people. And nowadays, things are different. Looks, when you are excluded, you feel frustrated, unhappy, unsatisfied. This creates an unserved market demand. That's why the commercialization area today is the solution for unlocking space to everyone, in this particular case, to unlock microgravity at the benefit of humanity. Well. Uh, together with my chair, Justin and Joan, J and J, we put this challenge on the table. As a chair, we put on the table. It's more than normal. The challenge is to come with an idea that exploiting microgravity condition and addressing a big problem. And for this, we recruit a team of international, intercultural, interdisciplinary team members of the SSP 22 in Portugal. So, guys, let's hear how space-based microgravity at affordable, continuous, accessible, and exploitable condition is crucial to address serious problems on Earth. Particularly in this case, we will learn how we can definitely relieve the life of many patients affected by several diseases. Before to invite you to watch the work done, I leave uh, uh, the microphone, the floor, to Justin and Joan. Thank you. Hi, guys. 
So I think we know that commercial space is coming to a place where um, you know it's about to get huge. So with that new accessibility, we're going to be seeing a lot of important research making its way into the into the commercial manufacturing space. And really, what I want to do here is just express how proud I am of this team uh, because they have taken a really serious problem in an important domain and they have mapped out that bridge. So they've done it in the technical sense and they've got a business case to back it. So I just want to say you guys have done a great job. Thank you, Justin. And just to conclude, because I don't want to take time for the presentation, um, I want to say that uh, the idea of this topic at the end was we want to bring space closer to other sectors. We saw space for non-space topics, we saw the Atlantic, but we also want other sectors to use space in space. That was the purpose at the end, and that's what they deliver. I have to say personally that I'm very proud of the job they have done. I think it's outstanding, both the report, the executive summary, and hopefully the presentation. I wish you all the luck, and I hope that you enjoyed the show. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to our team project presentation, Microgravity Business Research and Development for the Benefit of People. Now, gravity is something that we all know well. In fact, it's probably one of the few globally shared human experiences. But without such a fundamental force, things act differently. Familiar becomes unfamiliar. Water floats, materials form differently, and even human physiology changes. But some of these changes can be beneficial to life on Earth, which leads to the question, how can we exploit this environment to benefit humankind? And can we make a business out of it? And that is exactly what this incredible team of 23 were tasked with answering. We looked all through the literature, we spoke with a lot of industry professionals, and we analyzed market trends to pinpoint an area of research that we believed would have the biggest impact on humankind. We nurtured that spark of an idea into a fire of a project, and today we introduce that fire to you. Procryos. Protein crystallization for the benefit of people, with our ambitious aim to build an orbital pharmaceuticals factory for the mass production of protein drugs to treat cancer and autoimmune diseases. We've decided to call our factory Procryos Panacea after the Greek goddess of universal health. Because that's exactly what we want to do, bring universal health by creating the drugs in space for ter terrestrial use and for later deep space exploration use. But I can hear what you're saying. Katie, what's a protein? What's a crystal? What's that got to do with microgravity? And how is that linked with cancer? So for the beginning of our presentation, we will explain exactly what those things are and how they all come together to help a patient. We will then go into the business potential and speak about the huge market that we're going to be tapping into. And after that, we finish with our piece de resistance, uh, the Procryos One demonstrator mission, which is the necessary first step in making our dream a reality. But before we get into all those details, let's start with a story, an all too common story of, that's found on Earth. A story of a patient waiting in hospital for a treatment. The long waiting times, the long treatment times, getting increasingly bored and frustrated. So what would you do if you were in a hospital room for a long amount of time? You might turn on the TV, might start flicking through some of the channels. So let's see what the TV has this afternoon for us.
coming in today. As you know, uh, today we're going to start your first course of treatment. Um, unfortunately, it is going to be quite painful. Uh, it will be a pretty, pretty uncomfortable and it will take quite a long time. Uh, and it's really the best we've got. Uh, how have you been since the last time we saw you? Honestly, Doc, not so great. These yeah. treatments are really painful and difficult. Plus, it's eating into all my free time to play paddle at 1am behind Smart Studios. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, man, but uh, it's really the best we've got, so you just got to suffer with it until these scientists get their act together and, and produce something new. So you're going to be a good boy and uh, sit still while I start stab you with this. Yeah? Here it comes. <laughs> All right, so you're going to be here a while? Are you all set? Yeah, I guess so. Ah, cool. Well, I mean, if you've not got a book, I guess you can, you can take, take that with you. Oh, thanks. Enjoy. Listen, guys, this treatment is really not too fun. I wouldn't recommend it to any of you. It's a very arduous and difficult process. Every time I come here, I need an IV injection. It's super painful. I have to be here for as long as six hours each time, and the cherry on top is that I have to come back every two to three weeks to repeat the same thing all over again. In the meantime, let's try to watch some TV. Maybe that'll get our minds off things.
Hello, class. So today we are going to learn about, guess what? Proteins. Oh, that sounds great. I brought my protein shake for my uh, gym training later in the evening. Oh, come on. Proteins are not just for your muscle building. We'll come to know what proteins are useful for after this lecture. Proteins, as you know, are found in the basic building blocks of our body, which are the cells. Proteins are made up of basic building blocks called amino acids, which are joined together by bonds called peptide bonds. And that gives them this primary structure. Now, coming to the, based on the sequence of the amino acids, the primary structure combines together to form what is called the secondary structure. Based on the organization of the secondary structures, we get what is called the tertiary structure or the domains. And these tertiary structures then combine together to form the quaternary structure, which gives the basic functionality for the proteins. So what are proteins used for? Yes, definitely to build up the muscles of Ambrish. That's definitely one of the uses, but that's not all. It is used for disease treatment. It is used for treating diseases like COVID-19 and even for treatment of diseases like different autoimmune diseases, as well as for major diseases like cancer. Yes? Uh, professor, do you mean that we can give the protein shake to the patient for curing the diseases? Oh, definitely not. Not as protein powders or shakes or pills. Even pills cannot be given to the patients as such. Protein treatments like the monoclonal antibody treatment, etc., can be only given as intravenous injections, which take about six to seven hours of patient time. That's unfortunately due to the technology that we have today. But these monoclonal antibodies, how do they help in cancer treatment? I said that they are very important. So how do they help in cancer treatment? They help in threefold ways. One is they attach to the cancerous cells and help our immune system to identify the cancerous or diseased cells. Second is these monoclonal antibodies help to take all the medications given from the point of injection to the cancerous cells. And third, they also help in preventing the multiplication of the cancerous cells. So one major advantage of the monoclonal antibody is that they do not affect any other cells other than the cancerous cells. So definitely, that's a very important aspect of these monoclonal antibodies, which are used for the cancer treatment. So class, I think this is enough for today. We'll meet in the next class for more details. Thank you, Professor. Eh, these channels are no good. Let's see what's on Netflix. I mean, a non-proprietary streaming service. <laughs>
whatever. So uh, crystals are single molecules being arranged in um, a very perfect shape. Sorry about that. Um, so salt, salt is a very good um, analogy of crystal. We all own salt at home, crystal uh, such as table salt, right? And so um, um, uh, salt is made of uh, very simple sodium and uh, sodium and chloride, and they're held together by uh, a very single uh, ionic bond. Uh, after following an evaporation stage, you get those uh, cubic crystal salt that we're all aware of, right? We all use them in the everyday basis. And, um, but on the other hand, um, proteins are composed of thousands of those single elements. And um, they are, they're bound together by several different forces. And those forces uh, make up this very complex structure. Um, so as you can see here on the left, it's, uh, it's the first stage of crystal. It's the nucleation stage, where single molecules come together and uh, form what we call um, an, the, the most energetically favorable position. Following this first stage, uh, we got the crystal growth, uh, which is where single molecules as well as cluster come together and form this uh, final crystal growth, uh, final crystal. And um, in microgravity, there's a lot of uh, conditions that affect this crystallization. Uh, and so first, we're going to talk about uh, microgravity. Sorry, and thank you very much. Uh, TV ain't what it used to be. Where am I telling novelas? Hello everyone, welcome to the show of Meet the Astronauts. Now with us we have two astronauts, uh, Mrs. Khanna from Australia and Mr. Ambarish from India. So both of them landed to Earth after completing an exciting year in space. So we are all interested to know what was their experience. So first Khanna, who really inspired you to become an astronaut? Well, firstly, thank you so much for, for the opportunity to be here today. Astronaut Ambrish and I are just absolutely honoured to be here and share our experiences with you. In terms of who inspired me, I mean, look, as an astronaut from Australia, obviously we don't have our own astronaut program. So for me, it was really looking to the international community uh, and tapping into our science and maths communities for inspiration. Uh, I remember as a child, I would always uh, be at school and they would roll out the televisions and we would watch all of the international launches. And for me, that was where the dream really started, where the vision really started. And I'm just very grateful to, to be here and then to call a lot of the people who were my inspiration then, now my colleagues and my friends. Oh, very interesting. And both of you spent uh, a lot of time in space. So when did you realize that you really reached in space? Yeah. What was your experience? Can you just share? Yeah. Of course, I mean, look, it's, it's quite hard. Um, Ambrish can yeah. also uh, attest to this. It's really hard to describe the, the feeling of being in space and the feeling of microgravity. I mean, for me, it was, I remember two distinct uh, experiences. The first was when we sort of left Earth's atmosphere. We had our hands on the, on the, um, the seats and then they just started lifting into the air and, and that was pretty surreal. And then uh, secondly, each of us um, in, in our crew, we'd taken a, a small symbol from Earth for the children. Uh, and, then, and for me, it was uh, this symbol here, this uh, small sort from the iconic and historic mission. And it just started <laughs> floating in the cabin around us. And, and that was the moment when we really realized that we'd reached it. We were in microgravity. Oh, it is very interesting to hear. So Ambrish, as a space enge engineer, can you clarify what is this microgravity, zero gravity, weightlessness, so many terms are there, engineering terms are there. So better you clarify what are these yeah, That is a very basic question and uh, interesting though. We have three terms, microgravity, zero gravity, and weightlessness. Although are, all, I have had three different terms, but all are interrelated. I will start with the zero gravity. As we reach to the space, 
we uh, we thought from the name zero gravity means there is a gravity is zero but it is not so gravity zero gravity means there is only force acting on you is gravity there is no opposite reactant force acting on you and on earth we have all finite weights why because we have opposite weight uh, opposing reactant force acting on by the earth and that's why we feel right, we have the weight as we reach to the space we there is no opposite reactant force acting on with that's why we feel we are weightless so this is the reason why astronaut on the space can easily move around uh, heavy objects with a single finger or with minimum energy the last term is the microgravity now as we go to the space station there are many different aerodynamic force acting on the space station that is because of the sun gravity or moon gravity or earth gravity because of that there is a finite acceleration which gives a term microgravity so you got uh, an opportunity to carry out lot of experiments in space space yeah. so what is really what these experiments what is the specialty of these experiments under microgravity condition which are not uh, really present in earth can you just clarify mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so each and every experiments were uh, definitely fascinating there are number of physical phenomena which diff we have differently altogether in microgravity if we compare with the gravity so we use those phenomena positively for uh, uh, doing the experiments for example if i say that boiling a water on the earth is totally different than boiling a water on microgravity so we use these phenomena for realizing a defect free materials a larger crystals which in uh, in uh, alter with help us to develop medicines or other uh, defect free materials okay so thank you so much for hana and ambrish for spending their valuable times with us and uh, your uh, show was very interesting to all of us so i wish both of you to have more opportunity to have better experiments in space thank you thank you thank you thank you, very thank much. you. Okay, now we take you through a role play when an old generation crystal made in Earth goes to visit a new generation crystal made in space. Okay, I think I have reached space all the way from Earth and I'm floating. Okay. And I now come to her home home sweet home looking for my crystal my crystal hi, hi how are you hi senor sankita my dear friend from earth finally you have arrived i was looking for you for a long time and i'm very happy i'm very glad that you arrived oh let me see why do you look so small and weak do i <laughs> oh that's because of the way we are made on earth we have got a demon called gravity who pushes and pulls us when we are being made with, with his convection body oh my god that's why we are small now i see here in microgravity we don't have convection uh, convection currents and we crystals go big and strong oh i'm so sad don't worry we are going down to earth to serve the humans better oh thank you Wow, very cool. I don't know about you guys, but my brain is fried. Let's just kick back and put on some reality TV, huh? Good afternoon, everybody. 
Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Space Shark Tank show. Thursday, 25th August 2022. I have with me my special two guests, shark investors willing to listen for the next disruptive ideas on the space industry. Remember, this show is about startups pitching live their ideas and receiving whether or not investment we will discover today. So, in today's edition is dedicated to microgravity business and more precisely to protein crystallization. And we will be hearing from three participants from the SSP22, from the International Space University, uh, which we are, who are de developing strategic solutions to change the pharmaceutical industry. Do you think they will get the sharks convinced to invest on them? We will see, but I want to welcome first candidate, Pier Angelo, Dr. Pier Angelo, come on stage. Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a short-sighted scientist, and I'd like to talk to you about an idea I had while I was doing my research at the university. Uh, in fact, I'd like to talk to you about a platform for protein crystallization, which could be designed to provide solution for a new generation of pharmaceutical and stakeholders. Uh, like health stakeholders for the benefit of humanity. What we need is some kind of bridge between science and engineering. And then we need to design like a, a, a new solution to integrate a system so we can demonstrate that we can in fact mass produce crystals in space. And I'm gonna give you some more details about that. So just, just one minute, so let me give you some. So it's crystal clear to produce three grams of protein crystals which is needed for a single patient. Uh, we just need to send in space 330 grams of liquid protein, and, and then, then we need to uh, send these things back on Earth. We need to process. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So wh wh what do you mean by just sending it back to Earth? <laughs> I mean, uh, so I feel I, I'm sure you have some, uh, some more information about it, like, or you have some costs about this idea. Yes, like, can you yes. develop, please? Yes, I do have them. Let me, let me just. Let me just find them. I, I'm oh. sure I have it. So I, I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm going to say sorry to the audience. That's a bit embarrassing. I, I'm, so this is to pitch, you know, real ideas, not not like you know, like with numbers. So well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thank you for the opportunity. I'm thank so sorry, but I please leave. Uh, thank please you. Leave thank the you. State, so. <laughs> next next participant, please. Hello Sharks, my name is Giorgio. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I'm here to ask for $20 million for 5% stake in my company that produces protein crystals in space for cancer treatment here on Earth, which is the best kind of treatment. Now Sharks, are you aware how much, how profitable the pharmaceutical company is? It's huge. Now imagine, imagine if we did it in space. Oh my God, that'll be just like a gold mine. Sharks. <laughs> last, within the last 20 years, the pharmaceutical company has quadrupled its amount to approximately $1.4 trillion. That's a trillion. And if we take just the oncology portion, which is our target market, that's $62 billion. We're all gonna be rich, rich. And then, just a final fact for you sharks, within 2030, there's approximately around 24 million cancer patients, will, and 40,000 of those patients will require protein crystal treatment. And currently right now, the pharmaceutical companies charge them $100,000, so imagine how much money we're gonna charge these pharmaceutical companies. We're all gonna be rich. So, who would like to actually take this endeavor with me and become a millionaire, or billionaire, or trillionaire? Now, now we are talking business. Now we are talking business here. So, and you seem pretty much confident. We like that. Can you please elaborate a little bit more on what's your next step? What's the plan? Well, it's, it's simple. Just give me the money. It's a trillion dollar, uh, it's a trillion dollar uh, market. Just give me the money. We produce crystals, and that's it. We become billionaires. Short, short term plan. Pragmatism here, please. I, I, I don't, I don't get it. It's a trillion dollar market. Just give me the money. What do you think, guys? What do you think? 
Come on, come on. Give me the money. But sharks, sharks, it's a, it's a gold mine. Come on. We are off this investment. Thank you very much come for on. coming. Next, please. Your loss, my sir. Hello, sharks. Because we all deserve a better quality of life. I'm Eva, and I'm the CEO of Procryus. And I'm here today to tell you about how our company will unleash the future potential of pharmaceutical manufacturing in space. Procryus is developing a viable pathway into space for pharmaceutical companies to revolutionize the way cancer medicine is administered to its patients. In current Earth-based technologies, we need to use an IV, which is an injection directly into a vein, a process that's complex, risky, and painful. It's a problem to healthcare because of the costs. It's also a problem to the patient because of the discomfort. This needs to change, and we can do it. Thanks to the improved quality of crystals grown in space, we can change the administration into quick and painless injection. And how are we going to do this? By 2024, with a seed round of investment, we will put together our demonstration mission and send it to LEO to validate our technology. Then, in 2026, after Series A investment, we will launch our commercial op operations and start bringing in regular revenue. By 2029, we will uh, scale up. We'll have our first 15 missions completed, 13,000 treatments sold, and that's when we reach break even. From that point on, we scale our operations, increase the revenue to reach our grand vision, the space orbital factory of pharmaceuticals. That's when we must produce pharmaceuticals and achieve complete market dominance. This was not possible in the past. But now, due to increased access and much cheaper access to space, this is now a reality. In fact, the previous speakers shared some of the real key figures for our business. And we believe that with the right vision, we can really make it a reality to serve the humanity here on Earth, in space, and beyond. And this is just the beginning of our journey. Thank you. And, and that sounds truly amazing. And, and we are wondering here, the Sharks, how feasible is for you this 2024 mission demonstrator? We do agree that it's an incredibly ambitious timeline. And that's why we will use the knowledge of our enabling partners. And that is the Portuguese Space Agency, who graciously agreed to help us launch and incubate our business the exploration company who will support us with mission planning and launching into LEO, and Nanorex Europe, who will help us with the hosting services. In fact, and this is absolutely true, those companies are about to finalize the letter of intent to really turn this into a reality here in Europe, it's in very soon reality. That's so, so, so exciting. And it's precisely, it's precisely what we were looking for. We are very excited for this. We're very excited about this moment. And we want to be your first investors. Congratulations. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this very historic occasion. Today, we are joined by 
Mr. Medine Massey, who is the president of the Maldives Space Research Organization and representative of the Maldivian government, together with Ms. Natalia Garina of the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. Today, we will be executing a ceremonial signing of the very first national space law of the Maldives. Over to you. We would like to congratulate you for joining the space community. Thank you, Ms. Corina, for this amazing opportunity. We are very grateful for this. And by signing this law, the Maldives will become a part of the space faring community. And we believe that this will benefit our community and all other nations around us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this, we will launch, this will help us launch our first satellite mission, SmallSort. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the world's first annual small talk. Uh, many of you may know me, uh, actually many of you do know me, uh, 45 years of legal experience has done that to a person. Um, so I will be talking about, well first of all, congratulations Maldives, it took you very long to get here, but you know, you did with some great legal advice. Um, and uh, you know what else is great? It's the 23, the 23 brilliant minds that I've come across when I came to Procryas. Procryas is the future. It is what we aspire to be. It is the brilliance, the brilliance that I myself have and I recognize in other people. And I will now tell you a little bit about what Procryas has had to dealt with, with my help. Um, so first of all, the Outer Space Treaty, we need to really think about how laws influence what we do in space. And the Outer Space Treaty is, you know, the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, you can read more about that in my, uh, in my book for $399.99. Um, and Procryas is going to have to deal with a, with a little bit of uh, space law, but most, more importantly, it's going to have to deal with national space law. Now, now national space law, as we all know, uh, because you all read my book, which you can buy for $399.99, um, you have to uh, kind of consider what the country is inferring, and with the United States being our launching state, it is going to be the United States. So what else do we have to consider? The drug regulations, of course. That is going to be the US drug regulations. Uh, they are a bit spicy, a bit, um, you know, a, a bit out of reach uh, for now, but we will have to manufacture and develop and do everything according to the US regulations. Uh, you can read more about that in my book for $399.99. Um, and last but not least, we are going to have to deal with some uh, licensing problems. Actually, we won't because I'm that good of a lawyer and the launcher will have to deal with that. Um, we will have to deal with some insurance, maybe for actually the Procryas, the mission, but the launcher will also have to deal with that. Thank you very much, me. And uh, what we do have to do is actually register Procryas as a trademark because we don't want those bad boys using what is ours. So patents as well, that is going to have to be on us. Uh, if they are able to afford my hourly rates, then uh, everything's gonna be fine. But yes, please buy my book, $399.99. You will find out everything you need to know there and smallsoap.com slash uh, space law. There you go. Thank you very much and enjoy your space law. This is not legal advice, but don't become a lawyer. Yuck, what a headache. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Pierangelo, she's Giada, and uh, we are two engineers from Procryos. One of Procryos' aims is to develop a spinning manufacturing technique for protein crystal growth, properly modified for a microgravity environment, with the ultimate goal to develop an orbital mass production pharmaceutical factory. As we can see on the slide, there are, uh, our roadmap is composed uh, by four phases. The first one is in 2022, so during this current year, in which will be developed uh, the startup. The second phase, the demonstrator uh, mission, the Procryos One, 
the third phase in uh, 2025 with the, the scalable production, and the last phase, the permanent orbital pharmaceutical factory. Um, the Procryos will handle the end-to-end -end, service to the delivery of uh, a volume of crystals produced in space and ready to be incorporated in medicine to produce drugs with enhanced properties. By analyzing the phase one, we will notice that we are implementing a biotech startup by creating an implementation scheme proposal. We are designing our demonstrator mission, namely Procryos One, providing information that can be used towards the preliminary design review. In the end, we have proposed the first experimental step and follow-on roadmap towards the mass production of protein-based pharmaceuticals on and in orbit space pharmaceuticals factory. So uh, now we can analyze the second phase. Yeah, we can go on with the slides. With another, thanks. Okay, so we can move on with phase two, which is the demonstration mission. This represents a proof of concept experiment, and for that, we will need a proper uh, magic box, which is our payload. Um, in, this, in this way, Procryos will validate the, te uh, the technology and business case for the mass production of protein crystals. This, uh, this payload will perform not just one, but two different continuous process in parallel. So in this way, we will prove that our experiment is not only modular, but also flexible and adaptable to different interface. Um, so during the flight, we will also gather data in order to monitor all the process and optimally run the experiment. And later, we will optimize this method for the next scale-up phase. At the end of the mission, we will uh, guarantee that the reentry won't affect the quality of the proteins. So in this way, we can move on to phase three. Phase three is when the real revenue comes, and this is where we prove that our technology is not only modular, but also scalable. So we will uh, ach achieve our goal of scale up. So we will uh, uh, achieve high production rate in order to, uh, to um, roll out commercial operations. So we will uh, have a proper uh, facility. We will build a, a laboratory in a facility in a, in a low Earth orbit. For that, we will need uh, larger hardware, in terms, uh, which means that uh, we will have uh, uh, more tanks, more uh, tubular reactors, uh, which will enable production of enough quant quantities of proteins, which will treat several diseases. We do not forget that the crystal will demand a storage in order to preserve the uh, improved qualities. An air orbit delivery system will guarantee the continuous supply of solvent and reactors uh, uh, in order to produce, produce enough quantities. The crystals then, uh, the final, final crystals, will be record, recovered from the storage uh, and they will be taken to Earth to, to be used for pharmaceutical companies. Then we will arrive to our final objective, which is phase four. And for that, we will have huge volumes of pharmaceuticals and bioprinting in action. And obviously for that, we will, we will need a huge magic box. We face the need to improve the delivery system and potentially expand toward outer orbits and to complement the core technologies which will enable new, new design goals. All of this uh, will enable us to generate more uh, revenue and create more, vanu, uh, more value for the benefit of the humankind. So we are reaching uh, to, uh, we, we want to reach uh, up to uh, 200 million humans worldwide. And also we want to expand uh, towards other applications, which can be also uh, advanced medical application, for example, tissue growth or uh, organoids growth. So we can already imagine how this factory will work. Let's see our production line. So we will have our workers, which will uh, pass through the magic box, and uh, we will have our uh, delivery system, uh, which will provide the final product to their final customer. Our final customers will be uh, the pharmaceutical companies. We will deliver drugs to the for uh, for create the, for the create the drugs to, to treat uh, advanced uh, advanced uh, <laughs> yeah and 
And so in this way, we will uh, achieve a high production rate and we will serve a lot of patients all over the world. <laughs> Who wants the huge magic box? <laughs> Veronica, Pascal, you want? This is a gift from us, from Procryos. I just heard there's some breaking news going on right now. Let's go check it out. Coming to you live from Cape Canaveral, Saints Four Station in Florida. Welcome to our live special coverage of the Procrise One demonstration mission, preparing for liftoff. The propellant is loaded and we are holding at T minus 10. While we wait, we will explain the details of the revolutionary technology of Procryos, which will be demonstrated today as it is launched into the low Earth orbit for the first time. Now, let's move to the studio where the experts of Procryos Center will walk us through the details of this demonstration mission. Danish, Louis, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are very excited that our Procryos 1 is going to be about to launch. You're excited, Louis? I'm very excited. I know there's an awful lot of very happy faces back in the, back in the mission control right now. Yeah, yeah. As on the screen, you can see that uh, this is Procryos 1. We are about to launch this on a space and put it in an orbital vehicle. We're going to describe what we have inside. So. This is Procryos 1, how it looks like. Inside this, first of all, we have a power connector. This is connected to orbital vehicle. And then we have main protein crystallization chamber. We have protein crystals inside here, we have created. And then we have nucleation chamber. Nucleation process will begin in this chamber. Also, we have process controller. This can control whole system in this Procryos one. We have, we have main pub. This controls whole the flow. And we also have crystal collection unit. We collect protein crystal inside this unit. This is what we have. This is what we are about to launch. Thank you very much for that introduction, Danish. Yep. Uh, so Let's proceed for the objectives. Indeed, yes. So it's a very ambitious mission. So we thought it would be a very good idea to define very clearly what we wanted to achieve. Uh, so in, in, inside the Procryos 1, as Danish has, has kindly said, there are two automatic protein crystallization systems which are going to be operating independently of each other. So that leads into our first objective. We want to validate the, 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 the system itself, ensure it works on orbit, uh, and then the mission two is essentially, uh, the, the mission objective two is, is essentially to uh, characterize and verify the actual production of crystals and their quality within this system. So obviously, in, in order to get into the microgravity environment, we need to go to space, and that means choosing a, a launch vehicle uh, for this. So here, uh, in this case, we've selected Nix, which will be launched aboard a, a Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, what do you reckon, Danish? Do we, do we choose correctly? Yeah, yeah, we choose correctly, absolutely. We choose this because we can put it to any other vehicle we want, and it is very useful, and it helped our you know, engineering de development. Absolutely, it was the right choice, I guess. I'm glad you feel so, yeah. It's, uh, for our team, it's been very useful because it affords us some flexibility in, yeah. in case things go wrong. We can swap out to a different vehicle at the last minute. Uh, and in this, in this case, uh, we'll get about three, three hours of microgravity in, in, 
in the demonstration mission, which is just enough time to achieve what we want. Yeah, quite fast, isn't it? Yeah, in yeah. three hours. Mm. Not too much time. So we'll just take a quick look at the, the overall uh, outline of the mission. Um, so obviously we start with the launch. Uh, so our rocket will take off uh, in the vertical configuration We'll bend over slightly, start to go in a horizontal direction. We'll have a, the first stage separate, which will be a very spectacular view. You yeah. must have seen the launches before. Amazing. It will be amazing. And uh, after, after the, it, it arrives on orbit, uh, we'll switch the payload on, and we'll initiate the crystallization system. Uh, and then after these uh, three hours of microgravity, we'll switch it off and prepare for re-entry. So in this case, um, Nix will remain attached to the Falcon 9 uh, booster stage, and that vehicle, that, the launch vehicle itself, will perform the re-entry burn to help bring us back to Earth. After this happens, Nix will separate, comes, uh, re-enters the atmosphere, we collect the crystals, and deliver them on to our customers. Yes, that's a whole mission outline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, let's move. The now. Let's move to the mission control to get an update on how the launch is progressing. Good afternoon, Mission Control, and welcome to the launch day of Procryos-1. We have been through a lot to get to this point, it has to be said. We've had several requirement changes and more design reviews than I dare to count, but I am so impressed with how this team have pulled through and we have got to launch day, and this is going to make a difference to millions on Earth. So show your signs, Mission Control, to the rest of the audience here, and please prepare for the go-no-go no go sequence for the launch of Procryos-1. Engineering. Engineering, go. Applications. Applications, go. Science. Science, go. Human performance. Human performance, go. Humanities. Humanities, go. Policy. Policy, no, go. Business. Business, go. We are for Christ One and we are ready for launch. Please join me in the countdown for launch in T minus five, four, four three, three, two, one. one. So how was the treatment today? Uh, not so good. I'm uncomfortable, I'm in pain. Oh, all your limbs seem, seem to be attached, so I guess you're fine. <laughs> well, let, let's so. get that off you now, I guess. All right, it's going to be a bit, of, bit of a tough one. <coughs> oh. Oh. There you yeah. are. Good as new. Yeah, I guess so. Oh. Go on then, let's, let's oh, get out of God. it. God, it all hurts. Oh, no. oh. My spleen. Oh. Here you go. Wow, so it's 
only one shot. Just one shot. That's all. That's all you need. This is gonna change my life. We want to say thank you so much for listening to us today. We are Procryus, but more importantly, we are Team Micro G! Congratulations and thank you very, very much. Um, in terms of our team, I mean, we've genuinely had the most incredible time working together and we've become really, really close throughout this. Uh, and as you've heard, we have a very genuine opportunity to turn uh, Procryus and this concept into a business um, thanks to the, the support of Portugal Space. So uh, this is something that we're all speaking together about to see uh, yeah, the feasibility of it. And uh, if any of you are also interested, we invite you to come and have a chat with us uh, to see yeah, whether we can turn this business into a reality. We also have an option uh, to launch it into Leo with a, a demo mission in 2024. So all of that is actually legit, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, thank you again to the team, thank you to our chairs, to Shrirup, uh for all of your support and yeah, just super proud of what we've achieved together. So uh, with that, we will head to the questions. So uh, yeah, Pascal as president, uh, do you have anything to kick us off? Hello. It's, it's, it's really uh, amazing, uh, uh, you know, how, how, how different everything. And I had also a very nice uh, uh, box and so far, <laughs> which <laughs> Veronica and me got. Well, I, I, have, to, I have to say, um, I found um, you did a great job because it was a very focused and realistic topic, which could really happen in a few years from now, as we know how this field uh, develops. And I want to congratulate all of you. You also look extremely harmonious, yeah? And it's, it's wonderful to have these different teams and having this uh, 
interactions and and um, now it's the end of the day it's getting uh, uh, really <laughs> uh, uh, nice and uh, we are going home with a lot of memories uh, tonight and you of course you can celebrate so congratulations uh, to the team uh, and to the chairs and, and everybody who uh, who helped you and the lecturers um, I uh, have done uh, experiments in the, on the International Space Station by myself, uh, 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 many of them. They have actually taken an enormous amount of time on preparation. For 10, 15 years, I had uh, one experiment with my students which exploded. Um, at launch, uh, it took five years or four years to, uh, for a reflight. Uh, and um, uh, I think it is wonderful to see how those business cases actually will accelerate, that you will have more possibilities. Uh, however, something uh, what was not, not, not so clear is uh, we have now the International Space Station, but in the future uh, we will have probably commercial space stations, and none of them is yet defined, uh, apart, of course, uh, from the uh, from the governmental space station of China, which we had before, but um, uh, we uh, there are a lot of concepts, and um, they are actually right now, as you know, um, uh, ICU is part of the university consortium, and the only European university uh, which is um, working together with Orbital Reef from Blue Origin, yeah? and we will also have a team project on that topic next year in during the master class 2023, and. Um, so it is uh, very helpful and I think uh, they will also look at your cases because what those space stations, they are not yet well defined. They are the beginning of defining what kind of stakeholders uh, 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 will be uh, 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 working on these uh, commercial space stations. Will it be businesses uh, with a market case like yours? Will it be um, uh, society at large and educational activities? Uh, will there be a lot of science experiments? And I think uh, these kind of um, uh, programs and, and, and this kind of uh, team projects, they really help you know, also to feed into these new um, uh, um, ideas how actually to build a commercial space station. None of them is so far that they could say, oh, we are already there and we don't know which one will actually be built, how many will be built, uh, and it will take about 10 years. So I think um, I, 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 I was wondering if you, if you know already, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I could not read your project because they were only available <laughs> recently and I'm on travel, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, and uh, what kind of opportunities did you have to do such experiments in a low Earth orbit in the very near future? This is just a question I have, uh, um, and 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 how will you actually? Um, how can we use your report in order, you know, to feed into the construction and into the plans uh, of construction of these new uh, space stations, where there are now four of them? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you very much, Pascal, for for your question and um, that that vision. So. In terms of the overall vision, what we uh, built out in our report was quite an iterative roadmap um, to look into the near-term options, medium-term options, and that longer-term vision. Uh, so what we did was we identified um, uh, two near-term options for this 2024 mission. Uh, so one is a European uh, company who we can launch with very tangibly, hopefully in 2024. Uh, and that will be uh, to do a proof of concept, uh, demonstrate a mission to prove um, the, the basics of our technologies from both an engineering and a scientific perspective. Uh, and then we also looked at a backup option as well uh, because that is a, is a startup. So we also needed to look at um, sort of having an option in terms of um, the risks associ associated with low TRL um, funding, things like that. So we also looked at having options um, with the International Space Station, but we also understand that there's a very long runway often to get experiments up there. Uh, so we looked into having the demonstrator mission as our first sort of proof of concept. 
Uh, and then we looked into, um, together with the business team, they identified a number of different platforms with whom we could um, integrate our technologies uh, in sort of the medium term. So we looked at uh, different types of space platforms, commercial space stations, Orbital Reef was one of them. Um, so I'll pass the microphone to Hannah uh, in a moment as well to, to speak through some of those options in a little bit more detail. Uh, and then eventually the, the bigger vision was from um, about 2035 to have our own uh, orbital pharmaceutical factory to complement um, the uh, sort of all of the other activities that we would be doing on other commercials, so free flying capsules and tapping into the commercial station. So whether it's you know Axiom at that point or um, Orbital Reef, whatever it may be, um, the idea is that we could potentially have market dominance by 2035 by complementing those existing platforms uh, with our own orbital factory. Uh, so. Uh, in terms of, we discussed as well from an engineering perspective, the feasibility of constructing our own factory versus leasing something. So for example, um, cooperating with uh, the commercial space stations to lease our facilities. And then we would be really looking at innovative modules. So uh, again, not just keeping it uh, around the protein base, but uh, protein based uh, pharmaceuticals, but also looking at, okay, what can we do around the 3D printing of uh, tissues and organoids and really expanding our business model um, to serve other diseases and human needs on Earth. Uh, so, so that was really the, the broader vision and we really tried to look at it from um, an iterative process which was also very um, ambitious and difficult for our business team to be able to tackle because not only did they have to do one business plan, they had to do multiple business plans and then also really forecast into the future into the commercial space stations which we really don't have a lot of data on at this stage so it was, um, they did a, a really good job at, at forecasting that. So Hannah, is there anything you want to add on, on the business side? I'll keep it short. Um, you were also talking about options in the near future. So uh, one of the other options that we were talking about um, is the option of uh, using private astronaut missions. So for example, recently with Rakia, Ethan Steva ran something like 44 scientific experiments, and there was the Inspiration4 mission recently with Dragon. So actually in the future, we may be able to utilize these private astronaut missions because they don't look like, oh, I'm a billionaire, so I went up into space. They're, oh, I'm doing something for humanity. And um, that's actually something that we could use. And we did also look at orbital reef, we looked at axiom space. Um, there are some things that are further away, like North of Grumman, but all of these options, while they look very uh, promising, was not something where we could actually sign up with them uh, for a specific mission. So the direction that we were thinking of was, uh, we should be looking at them in terms of signing MBAs, signing uh, memorandums of understanding, and look for multiple partnerships, but for the immediate future for 2024, we focused on the exploration company or the ISS. Um, other options, Space Rider, there are actually startups, there's a Japanese startup that's coming up with this concept of something that launches into space, stays there for a while, and lands again, and they're going to have a demonstrator mission. We even have connections to the, C to the CEO of this company. So we looked at the uh, various options. Yeah, Hi. Uh, congratulations, uh, first of all. It is true what they said, there's a letter of intent that uh, um, uh, it was uh, agreed uh, just moments before we started. They, they haven't pre prepared, um, I think it was last week, uh, but also we need to, to, to keep the pressure on their side. And, uh, and so the, the agreement was made uh, just minutes before getting to this room. Uh, so congratulations. And um, when we first wrote the, this, uh, this TP, uh, we were expecting that uh, when your result would be uh, a little bit broader than what it is. It, you came to a very specific and very concrete um, uh, business, which is very interesting. This is one of the beauties of, of the team projects, that y when you write it, when, when the people write it, they expect sometimes it would go in one way, uh, but uh, then the team with the advisors, with everyone providing uh, feedbacks and comments, drives the, the TP in a different way. Uh, but it, it's one of the greatest things of, these TP, of the TPs in general. So congratulations on, on your project and thank you very much to, to the chairs uh, for all the support and for all your work. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Awesome. Well, my name is Emily Wilson. I'm a CEO of Nanorex. You mentioned, someone mentioned Nanorex and support. And I, I, one of those interesting things I want to share is we are building a private space stations. And also we have um, a platform in the International Space Station as of today that can actually help some of those experiments. So I, first of all, let me commend the team. You guys have done an outstanding job. It was a, it was a great joy to read about the project you have undertaken, understanding it's a multicultural, multidisciplinary, uh, multinational. I mean, uh, I just, I'm just so delighted what you guys have done. Uh, uh, it's super exciting being a, a, a person who actually deals with the space on a daily basis. It's it's fantastic. Now, a question uh, to you guys is: uh, You are really undertaking cool stuff uh, from from every aspect, from a business aspect, but also from a helping a humanity uh, get on top of something that uh, we're all wondering: Could space actually help us to improve the life on Earth? My question is related to the treatment itself. The uh, mon monoclonal antibodies and the perfect structure that you are going forward uh, will definitely help in terms of size of a crystal, in terms of uh, structure of a crystal, and it will help uh, being administered uh, you know, subcutaneously versus uh, intravenously. However, has anyone in your studies, and you guys have come, I have seen your references and all that stuff, have you ever run across to see effectiveness of the cancer treatment um, with a perfect uh, monoclonal uh, uh, structure of the protein structure, uh, would, would the perfect structure actually improve the effectiveness of the medicine in addition to the administration? Because then you will get not just the simplicity of the use, that you will get entire industry behind scientific experiments if you can even improve the effectiveness of the treatment. So I, I know that it's more my wonder and my inquiry because what you are doing is awesome, but is there, have you, have you come across uh, any of that in your research? Hi, thank you very much for that question. Great question. I'm gonna pass this on to one of our science team who will give the best answer to this. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much for the question. It's really, really interesting and really to the point. Um, from all of the research that we've done, uh, there hasn't been a study conducted to see the effectiveness of the treatment with the crystal, crystals that are produced in orbit. So that's information that we don't have yet, but it could be a possibility. But from a, a clinical trial point of view, there hasn't been clinical trials trying uh, crystals that were grown in space for treatment. So effectiveness, it's something that is still undiscovered. But thank you so much for the question. Suyin. Thank you, Suyi. You gave me your time to answer questions. Oh, no problem. Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, so I'll go next. I know there's a couple of hands up still, but hello again, SSP. Um, so again, I'm Sue Yin Town, University of Waterloo, Canada, and ISU Global faculty member. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to really congratulate the TT on a very entertaining presentation, this very detailed and comprehensive final report as well. I just have a few questions or thoughts that I thought I would share and perhaps you can respond to. Um, and first of all, I'll say that as a space applications person, that um, I'll admit on the outset that I'm not very familiar with protein crystalline drugs. So I found this TP to be very interesting, a very new application and very novel. Um, I think that the report included quite a few business aspects uh, that have two main comments slash questions. One that was, is quite similar to Amela's. Um, first, uh, I noticed that there's a lack of risk assessment to human health um, in your report. And uh, as you're probably familiar, when it comes to human health, very similar to human space flight, the risk has to be very low or ideally close to zero. And I think the risk tolerance for new drugs is very low, and hence that's the, why there are so many uh, strict drug administration regulations. Um, so according to the FDA, um, so I, I just saw that there's a five-step process, which is discovery concept, which I think your TP has covered very, very well. Uh, Preclinical research, clinical research, FDA review, and post-market safety monitoring. 
Um, so you've kind of addressed the question that I had about clinical trials, because I was really wondering whether there are clinical trials that have been done on humans or animal subjects to really demonstrate these proven medical benefits that you've uh, stated in your report. Um, there will naturally be a, a huge public concern about whether these mass-produced protein crystalline products um, in microgravity environments will be safe for human beings. So I was wondering how you will approach these different phases of drug approval, how this might affect your timelines as well uh, for this company that you proposed. Uh, a second comment is uh, more related to accessibility and ethics. Um, as I was wondering how much will these uh, drugs uh, really cost, you know, with these uh, proteins and, uh, that have been uh, manufactured in space? And how will that be compared to the proteins and drugs that are manufactured on Earth? Will this only be available to the rich and wealthy, so to speak? Um, can you comment on the equity issues involved and how you can make these drugs accessible to those who are in most need? Uh, so I'd be very interested to hearing a bit more about the ethical implications of your TV. Thanks very much. Brilliant, thank you. Great question. I will take the first part of that question regarding the drugs itself and then we'll pass over to business um, and policy for the second part of the question. So um, in terms of have there been any tests, how are we going to deal with that and do crystals benefit uh, patients? As Leonor said, we haven't tested it with crystals that have been developed in space, but we have there is a benefit with uh, crystals produced on Earth. A prime example is insulin. So insulin is a protein drug that's used in the treatment of diabetes. And uh, it used to be sort of pure solution form and then went to a crystalline form, so a solution of small protein crystals. And that had um, a medical benefit for the patient. So keeping in line with that, that their mono monoclonal antibodies are, can be in line with that, but we would need to do extra clinical tests for the, those produced in space, um, so for the policies involved with that with the FDA. So um, we've got a baseline to think that it's definitely of interest, um, but more tests would, need to, would be needed to be done for the space uh, manufactured drugs. And I'll pass over to you. So, uh, hello, uh, I'm Natalia. So I looked, I was the policy and law uh, section of the TP, and um, bringing up the regulation is really important, especially because we found that uh, drug development is the main problem, actually, when it comes to regulation. It wasn't the space, it was the drug manufacturing bit. Uh, we incorporated uh, Procryos in the US for both simplicity's sake, but also for legal certainty, because the US uh, has some of the most advanced or the most written out laws, plus it's in English, so we could understand everything that we we're reading. Um, and the thing that we came across was uh, there are several, so first of all, it, it's very, very stringent. There's a lot of um, hoops that you have to jump through in order to manufacture your uh, anything biological. Um, the benefit, there, there is a benefit to everything, um, or like there is a, a shortcut, is that if something is produced once, then you get a, an easier license. So you, in order to manufacture something, you need to obtain a license. If you've manufactured or it's roughly in the same area, then you're able to manufacture it um, faster because you're, uh, well, the legislation says so. Um, but more often than not, it is going to be something that we're going to have to keep track of and it is going to require um, luckily, uh, another glance or another look through because uh, this is a very, very specialized area of law and we don't want to, and we want to make sure that we are adhering to everything, uh, but it should be noted that we are only the manufacturers. So the clients that come to us with their um, proteins that they would like to crystallize, they will have to get a lot of the approvals to do that. Uh, it's something similar that what we're launching with someone, it's the launch provider that will have to get all the licenses rather than us. Um, so. It is slightly easier for Procryos, but the FDA regulation, if we go that route, is definitely something that we'll have to uh, relook at with a fine tooth comb in order to make sure that it isn't, um, we aren't uh, well, <coughs> doing anything wrong. And as for the human aspect, and the, I think that from a regulatory perspective, it will, uh, I do not see how um, there is going to be any difference between it being like a normal medication coming to to general public use, so uh, there, from what we can see, this isn't a, it, it's just a novel way of producing something that is required, so it's not that out there from a legal perspective. Uh, but yes, we, thank you for your question. Um, in terms of price, it's a very good question, and it's a very 
sharing from Putin at one at this stage. Um, for details, I think it's best I would like to refer you to the to our report. We as a business team, we have done a quite an extensive analysis of what the current situation is. I'll try to summarize it briefly. Um, but also there is a, an extensive explanation of the logic behind how we got to this price. But to give you the conclusions out of it, in current treatments of monoclonal antibodies, they take different periods of time. And depending on how long they take, the treatment costs different amounts to the patient. On average, this comes out to, comes up to about $100,000. We assumed that out of this price, there is a portion that is pure profit and portion that is development. It's not public information what exact part of that, of that amount is development process. Therefore, we have to make assumptions. And our assumption was that if we sell our product to those pharmaceutical companies for half of that price, meaning $50,000 per full treatment, that means that they have still enough margin of 50% which they can probably drive even higher because of the benefit that our product does, or that's the, uh, the ease of pains that we deliver. So they still have 50%, $50,000 off um, that they can charge to meet the price that's available on earth. And it is our belief that they can drive up the cost due to the reduction of costs that the hospitals will come across, as well as the patients will see. So it will be a huge, huge, huge saving for them in terms of time, in terms of traveling costs, and it will be a, just a, a big, big increase of quality of life. And last point I'd like to make is that um, we will address a very small market share out of the full patients that do suffer from cancer, which we expect to come up to around 0.2% of the overall market in the first stages. What that means is that, that this treatment will be addressable to a portion of the patients, initially probably for those who can't afford it. Therefore, the assumption is that the pharmaceutical companies can probably drive up the, the price slightly higher than it's currently done, but we leave it for them to decide eventually and we'll look into it in the next phases for sure. Thank you. Alrighty, I can see that uh, Juan has a question, so over to you. Thank you. I think I will put on my CV that uh, today I shared a seat on the jury with the CEO of Nanorax. I think it's great to see uh, someone like uh, the CEO of Nanorax with us. And obviously, this must be thanks to uh, Veronica, your, uh, your very own uh, chair. Uh, my question has to do with uh, China. I have heard during your presentation that uh, Procryos aims at market dominance. And what I read in your final report is that the largest market is in a country uh, in the north of the Americas, uh, but that the second largest market for pharmaceuticals is in Asia, uh, namely China. So my question is, if you want to achieve market dominance, have you considered using the China Space Station? And if so, uh, how did you come to the conclusion of not mentioning the China Space Station in your report? Um, you had uh, companions through the last nine weeks working precisely on the use of the China Space Station. What were your conversations with them? Please uh, share your experience uh, with us. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I, I will start answering this question uh, purely from a policy perspective. So we've definitely spoken to our uh, teammates, <laughs> our course mates in the Chinese space station um, about implementing microgravity and uh, propriety uh, in the China space station, but we quickly realized that there is a very large um, policy problem. Uh, it is to nobody's surprise that um, China is uh, very uh, protective over all of their IP, etc. And uh, this is partly due to the historic um, rivalry between uh, or oppo 
opposing uh, political views of the two global superpowers as we currently have, the United States and China. Um, so we believe that at the beginning, we to avoid, in order to speed up the process because bureaucracy will take a very long time. Um, it is something that we, we will, it is for the later stages uh, to look at perhaps, but it is not the primary, especially because one of our main goals is to speed up the process rather than bog it down in, um, unfortunately, uh, politics or policy that we have no control over. Um, that was from a policy perspective. Perhaps there's something from a business as well. Hello, uh, one just to address uh, about the market share from the uh, market analysis perspective. Uh, it's true, the uh, China market is growing very fast and Ramon Rong now has become the second or the third one for uh, oncological uh, treatments. Still, the US is the first one, and it's uh, it's 50%, actually it's 49% of the actual market share nowadays. So, yes indeed, it is a trend, but worldwide the US represents 50% of this treatment, therefore it still makes sense for us to, to have this as a first option. Thank you very much. And can we take a question from the floor? I see a few hands going up. Yes, on there. Thank you. Uh, once more, this is Manuel from the Portuguese Space Agency. Um, I have two questions more relating to the business side of things. Um, one is, first of all, um, did you look at potential competitors? Um, both on Earth and potentially in space, and how that would uh, impact maybe your business case or you, how you deal with this. And then secondly, I'm you know space transportation guy, so I have to ask that: what about the launch price? Because this is still like big question marks how this will develop in the future. So how might that impact your business case? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a very open question. Your first question was about competition. And of course, we consider what our competition currently is and also what it might be in the near future. Currently, there is no manufacturing market yet in space for pharmaceuticals. There are, however, pharmaceutical companies taking their first steps in R&D. So they have sent their experiments. They are checking the opportunities there are out there. And therefore, we believe that they are interested in that in the future. However, there, uh, we should not forget that there are very strong barriers of entry for any industry that's operating on Earth wanting to get to space. Therefore, we believe that if we work fast and if we're efficient, we can develop our solution on time to provide the service for them before they develop their own full-scale uh, manufacturing capacity. Therefore, being their help, and not their competitor. So we will be an enabler for the pharmaceutical companies and not the competitor. And uh, your second question was on the launch cost. So um, we are operating, of course, on the knowledge that we have currently, uh, which is w we know that some of the launchers that we're currently considering are about $25,000 um, per kilogram carried into space. And that is the cost that we included in all of our cal calculations and financial projections all the way until 2036. So the assumption is quite conservative because we also know that those costs will quite drastically decrease in the next years. And what that means is that with our calculations, we're already quite profitable um, in, within the next years. But in reality, likely we will be even more if we consider those variables. Does that explain the question sufficiently? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I believe we're actually out of time for questions now. Um, so I just wanted to say a last congratulations to this team. We've done so well. So big round of applause, everyone. All right, great job, Cryos. And can I once again actually ask you to extend these claps for all the four teams that has presented today.
first, these uh, claps also goes to our chairs, um, associate chairs, and our TAs of the four teams. Cheer up, Camilo, Alej, Adolfo. Thank you very much also for your help. And finally, I would like to also once again acknowledge our uh, two sponsors of uh, several of the projects, Amazon Web Services and Chinese uh, Space, uh, uh, National Space Administration for their support to the four team projects. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, this actually brings us to the end of the last academic deliverable of the Space Studies Program 2022. So basically, you're done. Great job. <laughs> So, uh, this really actually brings us to the end of the journey of this nine weeks. Tomorrow, here on this stage, we will be closing this session. So, whoever is watching us online, tomorrow we will be back on live stream at 2.30 p.m. Portugal time here for the closing ceremony of the Space Studies Program 2022. Please tune in, join us online on the ISU YouTube channel again. With that, thank you very much for today, and see you tomorrow. Woo